All right. So let's get started for today. Uh, hopefully you can't tell I'm a little nervous, but that's that's all right. It's Friday morning. We've all had a great long week. So I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I'm Jesse Mesa. I go by he, him pronouns, and I'm a second year full-time student here at Anderson. So over the last two quarters, I've had the privilege of serving as our student government's VP of EDI and working with our EDI community to bring together Embrace and Diversity Week. Now, there's been a lot of emails, there's been a lot of conversations, and a lot of very stress-free days anticipating this morning. And I honestly can't believe we're finally here, and I can't believe the entire team is finally here today. This is uh, very monumentous for all of us. So when, when I first started at Anderson, I actually I knew I wanted to wind the doors for EDI to thrive at Anderson. I knew I wanted to become a better leader. I knew I wanted to find a way to make this institution even better. And EDW 2021 has allowed me to reach all of those goals. So I'm so excited to continue the conversations through this day, through tomorrow, and throughout the rest of this year. One of the biggest reasons that I decided to take on this role as VP of EDI for my class is because I've never actually been part of another institution who is willing to support EDI as much as Anderson has. Now, that doesn't mean it's perfect. It's, it's not perfect whatsoever. But when you have speakers like the ones we had this week and Joyce Trung and Veronica Basquez, Wanda Denson Lowe, this feels like the right environment for me. It feels like the right environment where I wanted to spend two years getting an MBA. But more than just that, what we've seen throughout the week is we've seen student leaders. We've seen clubs come to identity clubs come together. We've seen perspectives and alumni and so many giants in their own corporate industries. But what, what I really enjoy seeing so much is it's, it's not just the students that are moving this forward. I'm here because I'm introducing Dean Bernardo. I'm here because we don't just have one dean who cares a lot about EDI. We have deans, we have student faculty, we have student affairs. And that's why I decided to become the VP of EDI because this is an entire environment. This is a community that's moving this together. This is what embracing diversity looks like. So on behalf of Anderson's EDI committee, on behalf of ASA and the general stu student body, to all the perspectives on the line, to our alumni and our general EDI enthusiasts, Welcome to the first day of Embrace and Diversity Conference. And before I pass it over, just a quick logistical note. If you're not following UCLA Anderson on LinkedIn and Instagram already, please do so. Uh, particularly on Instagram, we are also doing a quick raffle. So if you're interested in really cool clothes, please, uh, please follow us on Instagram. So without further ado, I'll pass the mic over to the person we're all here to listen to and come here this morning. Dean Bernardo, it's all yours. Thanks, Jesse. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Embracing Diversity Conference and, and welcome virtually to UCLA Anderson. Um, we're, we're so glad you could join us. This conference is the culmination of Embracing Diversity Week at Anderson, an annual celebration to embrace our diversity as a community and, of course, to seek out and welcome more. Embracing Diversity uh, began uh, a number of years ago as a recruiting and admissions conference for prospective students. And we sought then, as we do now, to increase diversity of all kinds among our students, faculty, and staff. That admissions conference, which we're gathering for today, remains a key focus of embracing diversity. But it's, it's now part of a full week of special events at Anderson on a broad range of topics related to diversity. Because we found that two days really wasn't enough. Uh, participants and organizers wanted more time to see how different parts of the school and different constituencies we're engaging with these uh, important issues. So a few years ago in 2019, we expanded the conference to a full length embracing diversity week. And right away, we saw engagement from all across Anderson. Now we have student clubs and academic centers organizing the events of the week with great participation from students and alumni and uh, staff and faculty. Uh, each year, it's uh, a terrific kickoff to conversations that continue among us throughout the year. It's very important that you know, we, we, we uh, discuss and have conversations, not just this week, but really throughout the year. And this year's theme is leading across difference. And our speakers and panelists this week have been highlighting the challenges and the opportunities that leaders face when equity, diversity, and inclusion are in the foreground. I hope you've been able to join some of the conversation other, and other events uh, this week. I wanna congratulate our Assistant Dean, Heather Caruso, uh, and her staff, uh, all the dedicated student organizers, our talented alumni, and everyone else who worked to make this week meaningful and successful. The speakers, the range of topics uh, have all been excellent, thought-provoking, and inspiring. 
Uh, as, as we consider these topics at Anderson, one of the things I want to emphasize is that diversity and inclusion are essential goals for all of us here. We're, we're really committed to making UCLA Anderson the kind of place where everyone feels welcome and everyone can thrive, where all faculty and staff and, uh, and students are happy, uh, where all faculty and, and staff are happy and proud to work, and all students have a safe, welcoming, and positive place to learn. These are really fundamental uh, here at Anderson. We want everyone at Anderson to feel respected and appreciated, and we're working to make sure that's the case throughout our school and our community. We're, we're very fortunate to have an atmosphere and culture at Anderson that's widely viewed as inclusive, supportive, and collaborative. And um, that's not always the case at other business schools, as you may know. Uh, we often say that we share success here, and that's more than a slogan. Uh, it's really a pillar of our culture, a, a fundamental aspect of who we are. Sharing success means we support one another and celebrate the pro uh, progress and triumphs of each other. And you hear this often uh, when uh, students provide feedback of the school. You know, sharing success recognizes that in an MBA education, in your career, in your life, it's not in the words of economics, a zero sum game. We can all be better off if we work together. And I can tell you that this was a huge part of my early career in particular here at Anderson. I really benefited as a young scholar and teacher from a, co a collaboration uh, from collaboration and support from other students, faculty, and, and staff. It really allowed me to reach my fullest potential. And I can say as Dean, I believe it's my highest duty to create an environment where students, staff, and faculty can thrive and reach their fullest potential. Uh, the last year and a half have obviously been very challenging and it has taught us a lot as individuals, as a society, as, and, and as a school. We've been tested repeatedly by uh, the COVID pan pandemic. And we're likely to continue to be uh, tested for quite a while. I can tell you, I in my 28 years uh, here at Anderson, though, I've never been prouder of the community, the way we rallied, the way we uh, came together and supported uh, where we could the most vulnerable in our community. And uh, despite all the challenges, it's really been wonderful to see how um, we've rallied uh, to really make a positive impact in a very difficult time. The COVID pandemic has affected the way we work, the way we study, how we live, and those effects will continue uh, for years to come. The uh, past 18 months have also brought long overdue attention uh, to the issue of systemic racism in our society, the killing of George Floyd in 2020 and the deaths of other African-Americans at the hands of police and others shocked and, and horrified us. And like others at UCLA and well beyond, we, we've been moved by the national conversation that followed that event to examine our own history and behavior on the broad issues of equity, diversity, and inclusion, and to see where we are with those issues at Anderson and what steps we can make uh, to, uh, to uh, make uh, significant progress going forward. The bottom line for all of us is that we're investing in these areas in the only way that makes sense at the systemic level. We're embedding them throughout our strategic plan which will be the blueprint that will guide Anderson for years to come. Equity, diversity, and inclusion are essential goals for Anderson, and they are key priorities for me throughout my tenure as Dean. So here are a few specifics about where we are, and I'll tell you about a few things that are ongoing. I'm pleased to say that for our entering full-time MBA class this year, we've made progress toward gender parity. For this year's full-time MBA class, we have 42% women students, up from 33% two years ago. In this year's fully employed MBA class, women make up about 35% of the class. And we're relatively happy about those figures, but there's clearly more to be done. And our goal is and should be to have 50% uh, women to have parity in all our MBA classes. And that's a goal we're gonna work towards in the coming years. We're also working hard to improve our numbers uh, uh, of historically underrepresented students. In this year's full-time MBA class, URM students who include African-American, Latinx, Na uh, Native American, and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander students represent about 12% of the class, which is about the same as we had last year. Uh, and it's been a significant increase over years previous. And we've also seen in recent years, improvements in representation among previously uh, uh, underrepresented minority students in our FEMBA program. And again, while we're making progress, there's clearly much more that we have to do. And really what we want and what our goal uh, should be is to reflect to have the, our student population rep, re, uh, reflect uh, the communities uh, that we're part of and the communities that we serve. 
And as we know, LA is one of the most diverse cities in the country. So we have quite a ways to go to reach our, our goals. Um, more broadly, equity, diversity, and inclusion are not just a part of the uh, strategic plan that is being developed for Anderson. It's really embedded throughout it in, in all of the different activities uh, that, we are, um, that we are looking at. And given that the strategic plan is very comprehensive, deliberate effort that's yet uh, not yet complete, we have taken some steps um, to make more immediate action where we can. So let me just say a few things about those things, of, about those steps. One is around curriculum. We've made changes in our cur curriculum, including developing new cases, addressing issues of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and uh, improving the diversity of the guest speakers that we have in the classroom and in, in events. Uh, we're expanding the activities of our academic centers to foster equity, diversity, and inclusion through new events, professional development programs, and community engagement. We're developing new external partnerships and recruiting activities to increase diversity in our applicant pool. We're improving the way we do search and review processes to identify and eradicate structural barriers to hiring and promoting underrepresented faculty and staff. We're establishing a new year-round speaker series to inform and inspire conversations about race, racism, and other activities related to EDI and relevant to the EDI. And we're establishing clear metrics to allow uh, for better monitoring and transparency of uh, the equity, diversity, and inclusion in our student body, our staff, and our faculty. In addition, we've just launched a new pilot program, the Pathway Guidance Program, that we hope and expect will help us to bring additional underrepresented students into our pipeline and, uh, and um, create opportunities for them to pursue uh, graduate business education. Our goal is to advance toward a more equitable and diverse business world by building a more diverse applicant pool uh, cre and creating more opportunities for our, our, our students. We're very excited about it. And, uh, and it's very consonant with our mission uh, as uh, part of the number one public university in the country. Uh, we take this commitment very seriously. Uh, we uh, will respond with intention to the inequities that persist in our broader community. And uh, we're committed to uh, becoming a more equitable, diverse and inclusive, commun uh, inclusive community at Anderson. And of course, we hope that you'll choose to be part of that effort and of our community. Uh, you'll hear today from many others, uh, business leaders, alumni, faculty, and, and others with a variety of fascinating perspectives and experiences. I hope you enjoy the converse, uh, conversations in the conference, and we hope to see you at Anderson in the future. So thank you very much for joining us. I hope you enjoy the day. We have a fascinating day ahead, and I look forward to the uh, time when we can all uh, meet in person. Thank you. Great to see everybody. Thank you for joining. Uh, okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started because we have a lot of stuff that we can um, we can pack into this hour, I'm excited. I'm Heather Caruso. I'm the Assistant Dean for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion here at UCLA Anderson. Thank you all for joining us to kick off a fantastic full day of Embracing Diversity as the conference that, caps, that, that serves as the capstone to our entire Embracing Diversity Week. Joining our community of students, staff, and faculty, we are especially delighted to see prospective students here who are interested in our Master's of Business Administration programs, our Master's of Science and Business Analytics program, our Master's of Financial Engineering program. It's a real pleasure to be able to come together with all of you in appreciation of the many, many members of our community who have made this day possible, along with making the entire amazing week of programming that has preceded it possible. In particular, I wanna thank Dean Bernardo for his steadfast support as the head of our school, alongside the student body, Vice President of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, Jesse Meza, and our entire top-notch steering committee uh, of students and, um, and then all of the degree program uh, representatives who joined together to work with that committee in order to organize today's session. And say so sort of first and foremost, this week and this conference serve as a reflection of our community's shared commitment and dedication to equity, diversity, and inclusion, both at Anderson and beyond. And it's really been my honor to witness the dedication and the drive of so many across the school in bringing this event together. 
Our first session today is a particular treat for me, uh, as I get to moderate a, a conversation with two members of the Anderson community who have immersed themselves in their careers deeply in the EDI space. Barbara Furlow Smiles joined the Anderson Executive MBA community in 2019 while working as global diversity and inclusion engagement leader at Facebook. Uh, and she has just transitioned actually to a new role as director of global diversity and inclusion at Nike. So a lot of really interesting uh, experience there. Devin Dickow, a senior measure, uh, manager at Deloitte uh, and co-lead of their diversity, equity, and inclusion practice, is a double Bruin with a 2007 BA and a 2015 Anderson MBA, specializing in social impact and corporate strategy. Both Barbara and Devin spend their days on the front lines of advancement for equity, diversity, and inclusion at some of the largest, most central, most influential firms in the world, and I cannot wait to hear all of the tales that they can share with us from those adventures. Of course, we will also reserve time at the end to ensure that our audience members also get a chance to share their, their questions directly with Barbara and Devin. We'll do that um, uh, in the last third or so of the, of the session. Barbara and Devin, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, it's a delight to be here. Um, I'd love to, to kick off our conversation with just a little background on the sort of journey that you guys have both been on in terms of how you became uh, uh, EDI leaders. <laughs> I'll start with you first, Barbara. You've worked in the diversity and inclusion space for almost 15 years now across three different industries in uh, entertainment and tech and now retail. Um, and you've also worked for large corporations, including Viacom, Cox, uh, Facebook, and Nike. So I'd love to know what originally drew you to this space, this type of work, and how, if you could explain how your role in, in EDI has changed over the course of your career, it would be great. Yeah, well, thank you, Heather. Thank you, UCLA, for having me. It is a true joy and honor. For me, I share that diversity is my life's calling. So it dates back to middle school and high school where I didn't always feel great. I was deemed as an outsider. I went to predominantly white middle school and high school in Texas. And so it was rough for me where I experienced racism, discrimination on a daily um, and, you know, my mom was very instrumental in really helping me get out the, this depression of being a victim and just feeling like I was an outsider with no voice. And so I started the first ever Minority Heritage Club in high school that is still in existence to this day. And the whole purpose was to give voice to the voiceless. That's like my life's calling. And what I discovered through my own painful experience with being an outsider in many forms of being Black with race and then being a female with gender, I had the double whammy, right, is that, you know, in order to get out of it and in order to help spread love, that I had to be on the front lines and I had to design my life. And with building the uh, Minority Heritage Club, I found out there, there were others who felt the same way. So it wasn't just Black anymore, the kind of definition of exclusion expanded for me. It was people with disabilities. It was people with different sexual orientation. It was people in the different work classes. And so it just created a, a real curiosity. And so I ended up going to an HBCU, which is historically black college and university for undergrad Spelman College, because I didn't want to feel like an outsider anymore. I wanted to be in my bubble intentionally. And then ended up, as I went to Spelman College, ended up studying abroad in the University of Cape Town in South Africa. And that's what changed it for me. And I realized that no matter where you go, being an outsider, is something that was very real and personal. And so I wanted to be on the front lines. And the fun fact about me is my entire career has been in diversity. I have not had any other job. Um, and so that's where you get the 15 plus years. I know I look really young. Um, I literally had an internship in diversity at MTV Networks and I've just stayed in there. Yeah, that's a wonderful story. I, I particularly love, you know, in this space, uh, there's always this sort of search for what's universal and what's distinct um, to individuals and individual groups. And the idea that inclusion, the desire for inclusion is universal, that we can sort of tap into to connect across all those different groups. It's a really beautiful thought. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm going to go to Devin. You've been at Deloitte now for almost six years, right, as a, D, a, a DI thought leader, and you've served as a consultant for a wide variety of Fortune 500 organizations and nonprofits. You have a, a unique path, I think, that has led you to this type of work. Can you share a little bit about that educational and professional journey? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you again for, for having me for this conversation. I don't think, first of all, we can talk about being DEI leaders without first talking about our own identities. So I am many things, but that includes being a white cisgender man. I am gay and queer. I'm a parent to seven-month-old twins, a husband to an immigrant. I'm a Jew. I'm an ambivert. I'm able-bodied. And I'm originally from Southern California, from San Diego. But I've also lived in New York, Boston, and Tanzania, which is where I started my career after UCLA, actually. And I am an artist and an activist in every aspect of my personal and professional life and have brought these lenses of creative activism, creative social justice work to my career path. So I studied storytelling at UCLA in undergrad, film and literature. And I was really passionate about how we use stories to change the world. And as I did all the film industry things in college to try to break in there, I realized that I needed to do real on the ground social justice work first before I pivoted into Hollywood. So I took a job for an NGO doing HIV AIDS work in Tanzania and grappling with my identity of being gay in a country that didn't recognize that gay people even existed was a, the first light bulb moment I would say in terms of my path to doing DEI work professionally. I came back and I decided that I couldn't become an assistant in a mailroom in the entertainment industry and instead worked in education where I focused on supporting historically marginalized communities, first generation college students at UCLA, most notably, but also former foster youth, our homeless student population and others. And I loved building new initiatives, new programs. But I started to realize that I didn't necessarily love operating those programs. And so I got this consulting bug, I would say. I ended up going to grad school to study the intersection of education theory, social justice, and media to kind of start to bring my passions together. And my, my thesis at Harvard in the School of Education was similar to that storytelling passion I have, how do we use new emerging media and technology to create social change? And I was studying Facebook and YouTube and Twitter as these really new technologies in 2010 or so. So you can see how, how far back that was. These were new ways that we were changing the world. And these were new ways we were communicating and sparking social action. I interned at PBS while I was in grad school to kind of see if public television was for me. And it wasn't, but I got connected into the social impact consulting world back in LA, uh, specifically in the entertainment industry, and worked to consult with documentary filmmakers, with high profile individuals, celebrities, and nonprofits that wanted to use media to change the world. I basically got my dream job. This is exactly what I wanted to do. I met Oprah. I got to work with Lady Gaga and her team. Really cool movies that I worked on. But I was also making $40,000 a year with debt from two degrees. And I had this realization that no one that I worked with at this small boutique consulting firm had ever worked in the private sector. We were all very anti-capitalist and myself included very, very much so. I'm nearing 30 at this time and realizing that the missing tool in my tool belt is understanding corporations, why corporations do what they do. And I realized that my expanding theory of change had to include how corporations impact the world. That was the tool to make the world a better place at that macro level. So I decided to apply to business school to gain that toolkit for myself. I was really lucky to get to Anderson, come back to UCLA, become a double Bruin. And there I studied the intersection of social impact and corporate strategy. And I was that kid in every class who said, what about the triple bottom line? What about corporate social responsibility? What about equity and justice? I found my people and I found Deloitte. And I found Deloitte as a way of working for one of the world's biggest companies, serving the world's biggest companies, and I could infiltrate the corporate sector as that social justice kid and make a big impact. And I was just going to do it for two years. But I got to, long story short, I got to Deloitte. Tim Cook had come out as the first openly gay Fortune 500 CEO while I was at Anderson. And so I got this spark to do equity work. And I decided that that's the only thing I could do at Deloitte. That was not the career path that had been laid out for me. That was not the job I was hired for. But I decided that for me to feel fulfilled, that I had to do what we called then D&I work for our clients. And I was lucky enough to be able to do that. So my entire career at Deloitte 
has been focused on diversity, equity, inclusion work in some way, shape, or form. And I've gotten to serve almost 100 organizations in DEI. I do tend to focus in technology and media, hence kind of my passions, but also my location. So I, I feel so thankful that kind of everything has come together. I work in the corporate world influencing. I still feel like I've infiltrated. <laughs> I, I get to infiltrate the corporate world every day as a social justice warrior and use corporate efforts, corporate strategy for good, which is really amazing. That's incredible. And I, I like so many things about what you both have shared and, and the richness of your careers and the way that you have balanced kind of finding your people, finding space to be in your bubbles when you needed to, but also pushing your boundaries and, um, and, and sort of breaking out of those bubbles when you needed to, um, to expand and, and to highlight business school in particular as a, a place to go and expand again and, and add a, a particular toolkit. Um, that can be so valuable in this work. And I just wonder if, if you can add on to what you have shared, some thoughts on those different kinds of toolkits for you and, and, and thinking about a, an, an EDI leader as we talk about um, it here, what are the kinds of toolkits that you look for um, or that you want to be able to bring uh, to doing this kind of work in your organizations? I have to go, but before I say something, Devin, I am borrowing your social justice warrior. I put that down. <laughs> Um, brilliant. You know, Heather, that's a great question. And I think what's very interesting in the diversity space, unlike many other jobs, it's not like a particular skill set, right? So like you go to a job, it's like you have to have analytics training, you have to have X, Y, and Z. It's very clear, black and white. With diversity, it's, it's unique, right? I think one of the biggest things you must have is empathy. So, you know, Devin talked about the social justice warrior. Well, in order to be a warrior and really be on the front line, you have to have empathy. And what I mean by that is you have to be aware, not only of your bias, um, but also other biases out there, right? You cannot be someone who literally lives in la-la land and doesn't think anything is wrong or doesn't even see any wrong in you, right? And so what I loved about what Devin showed up as was all of his diversity. We all have diversity, but you gotta be aware of that. So with me, um, of my sexual orientation, I know I have privilege, right? Uh, my best friends who literally cannot be gay, right? In Singapore or Asia countries, they will be stoned to death, right? I have the privilege of kissing my husband in public and not worrying what people say, right? We all have privileges. I think the reality though, is the empathy and awareness. But for me, what I did and, and how I knew I needed to kind of cultivate that was to immerse myself in different countries and cultures and situations. And so I have this tagline that says, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And boy, do I live by that. And so I started my journey where I would sign up and, and raise my hand for those stretch assignments where I would either be in a different country. I've, I've traveled to over 15 plus countries. And it was really in an effort to understand intimately just culture and, and really get myself out of the way being an African-American and learn, right? Like, what was it like being raised in Brazil? What is it like in Vietnam? You know, what is it like in European countries? What do they value? And this appreciation of culture, because when you're in this space and you're doing diversity, it's not just about you. When we look at just the evolution of diversity, what a lot of people don't know, it really started off really in like the 1960s. And it was really more about like compliance. So that was the, the laws of the Equal Pay Act, the civil rights, et cetera. What you're seeing now is this evolution with social movements. So hashtag me too, hashtag stop Asian hate, hashtag Black Lives Matters. And if you are not aware of the different issues that are affecting different communities, you are not doing your true justice to other communities that you may not identify at. And so for me, it was signing up for um, different clubs and groups that I didn't identify with so that I can seek first to understand. That's one thing I tell everyone. Seek first to understand. I also immerse myself, like I said, in different jobs to really get to understand what it was like. Um, for me, I think about 
my first job in diversity at MTV Networks, I was over managing our employee network groups. So this was during the time where employee resource groups, network groups, different companies call it different things. It was not a thing. It was not hot. It was not something people talked about. It was diversity best practices booklet that I got. And my boss was like, figure it out. We need to get these groups are already informalized. You need to formalize it. Um, And that was way back in the early 2000s. And if you fast forward now, you see this explosion of employee network groups, movements, social movements. There's this one study that said literally that diversity jobs have increased by 123 percent. I mean, that's why I'm at my company. Right. There's so many. I don't know about you, Devin, but there's so many people who outreach to me on a daily so diversity jobs are hot. And it's it's finally we get our due respect because we've been in the trenches for so long. But I think what it shows you is the evolution of this world. I think it's the evolution of even social media, the global world that's bringing everyone together. And there's different channels to expose different things that have been happening for centuries. But now you just have the phone to record, right? And the, in the case of the unfortunate killing of George Floyd that I think sparked this collective outrage, no matter who and what you identified with. And so for me, the toolkit is putting yourself in position of difference, getting yourself uncomfortable with being comfortable, checking yourself and being aware of what are the things that you have stereotypes, upbringing, background. I come from an upper middle class background. And so I know I have privilege with resources. People don't talk about that, right? Yes, you see this Black girl, but I also had one where my parents were both college educated. My parents were entrepreneurs. I had a lot of money. And so I had to get myself understanding of what is it like to not have money, right? That was my bias and me not understanding the struggle of classism. And you see that when you go to different countries that have caste systems, Right. And so that's the breakdown that you have to be fully aware of, of understanding globally what does diversity means. You have to educate yourself um, and really be true to what it is that you need more understanding and um, I think awareness to educate. I couldn't agree more. In fact, all of our incoming students, when they come to Anderson, um, are introduced to a technique we call ECHO here. And it's really about first when you're in conversation with people, especially when you're in conversations with people in difference, to make your first priority hearing the other person the way they wish to be heard, really understanding the world from their perspective, really diving into lived experience. Because coming to Anderson is this incredible experience of of, of immersing yourself in a brand new diverse community. You wouldn't want to waste it. A couple of years is actually not a lot of time uh, to get to know so many people with such interesting histories. Devin, I wonder if you could speak to, in addition to empathy, um, other aspects of the of the kind of core toolkit, maybe those that that would come from complementing your own personal empathy with a business. Did Heather freeze? Oh, my back. Sorry. I, I think I caught the end of of your question, Heather. Uh, I mean, empathy is, I think, where I would start with an, my answer to this question as well. But maybe I would take it in a few other directions. I think. Doing DEI work requires unique self-reflection and self-awareness of our own identities and the emotional labor required to do this work is unique from almost any other type of work because I'm working on myself every day in the same way that I'm helping others work on themselves. This is a very human transformation that we're trying to create. Even at the macro societal systemic level, it's still driven by humans. And so I think some lessons that I took from my time at Anderson around personal leadership, authentic reflection are, have been really key to my success in the space. I think paired with that, uh, what I came into Anderson to learn about is why corporations do what they do. And I've definitely learned that from my classmates, from my coursework. And that was about empathy as well. I wanted to think, okay, why do, like, why do other people care about capitalism things? And of course, I realized that we live in a capitalist society. And so in order to do any type of good work, whatever, however we define that, however we define good, we need to work within the systems that exist today. And we can work to shift those systems, evolve those systems, of course, but 
I've even had team members, especially more junior people that say, we need to dismantle capitalism to really do DEI work. And sure, maybe yes, in an idealist world, that's what we need to do, but that's not happening in my lifetime. And so how do I work within the system that exists today? And that's that's what I learned at Anderson. How do I reconcile how corporations work, why they do what they do with my desire to move the world, move social justice forward. And I think this evolution has been happening organically and naturally as well. Fortunately, we are in a place in in time where businesses have started to recognize that they can and should be a force for good. And defining what that means to that specific organization is a journey they need to go on in that company specific definition really matters because if we don't link that to their business strategy at the end of the day, then the incentives and mechanisms for actually for accountability and making change happen won't be in place. And so I would say I learned that at Anderson as well. I think mixing the kind of innate social justice warrior that I am with this understanding of how corporations work within the broader ecosystems of the world in which we live has been critical to my success in instigating transformational change. And without both of those things simultaneously, when I talk to a C-level leader at one of my clients, most of whom are white people, most of whom are straight older white people, I need to be able to speak their language. And so I think it is all back to empathy, but it's from a different perspective of actually technical understanding of why corporations do what they do. And I don't think DEI professionals that don't at least constantly cultivate that knowledge as well are going to be successful in the long run. It takes both. That's a really great point, especially in, in the context of what you were saying about emotional labor and this work is just, it can be so draining and certainly taking on any part of capitalism, certainly for those people who want to look at like that's, there's a lot of labor that's involved in that. And I think you only want to put that out there if you know what you're taking on and you're sort of biting off something that you can choose. So if nothing else, to try to understand systems deeply so that you don't dive in to something that's going to be w- too overwhelming, that's really going to take more out of you um, than it will um, put back. Um, I think just knowing your um, your sort of landscape so that you can you can design your work effectively. I think that's a, a, an excellent point. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about what you have seen. You've mentioned a couple of the, the sort of elements of, of evolution in your own careers. If you could think a little bit about evolution in the space generally, what are some of the things that you have been most excited about seeing the things that you, you know, like are sort of surprised by things you never thought you would see 10, 15 years ago, um, and maybe some things that you can see coming down the pike that you're, uh, you're excited about seeing as well. Yeah, you know, that's such a great question, Heather, because we live in a world where there's so much in your face, right? I don't think any of us would have seen COVID happen or some of the things that, that are just like, like a water hose come into us. But one particular example I, I can share is, you know, I talked about the unfortunate killing of George Floyd. I think that's when, if I'm honest with you, the entire world had an aha moment of like, wow. So maybe what these folks have been saying for a long time does really happen, right? We never really had that in your face, right? It was always uh, a recount from people of the oppressed sharing why they were oppressed, but you couldn't really see it. And so you saw someone being killed for doing really nothing. And what that did to me and what I think it did to the world and corporations was sparked a conversation. And so the biggest thing with diversity in this work is you have resistance all the time, right? So Devin talked about the emotional labor. Well, you also have people who are anarchists, who are atheists, who just don't want to talk about diversity, who literally separate it. Like diversity is that thing over there and we have to work for the bottom line. And until you can get people to look at the business case for diversity and see the integration of diversity um, is when you'll have the aha moment. And I think, like I said, the social movements, that's what sparked it. I've seen a change in literally being a baby diversity is like no other. And I had an amazing opportunity to work on programming and it was for Juneteenth. Um, And for folks who don't know what Juneteenth is, it is a African-American, in particular American celebration where the last slaves, um, enslaved folks were told in Texas 
Everyone else was free. Everyone was free, but they were the last folks to know. And that's something that like, if you don't really know about it, you're not going to really know it. But we saw an explosion of people wanting to know deep history, real history. And so I had the ability to put on the programming for Facebook for over 50,000 plus employees. And I got a blank sheet of paper was like, make magic happen. Um, And so for me, it was really cool to see this company investing millions of dollars um, in an initiative, in a movement to capitalize, honestly, on a movement. Um, And I say that because what you then saw was companies either giving Juneteenth off companies investing in programming. Um, I, I You just see so many other things that happen. And then you have Stop Asian Hate, right? And then you had all these different things that started to come into light that people started to, I say, intentionally listening. So there was long gone the days of like, well, you had a Black president. And this is me being very truthful, right? There's no racism. What are you talking about? pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. We hear that all the time. To then it's like, oh, wow, there is systemic racism. Oh, wow, we do need to dismantle it. And so that's why I love working with communities because I say that it is usually from the bottoms up that creates change, right? Every organization that I've been a part of has been the communities that have collectively come together to start their own mini movement, whether it was internally or externally. And the powers that be had to listen because to Devin's point, right? It's the bottom line when you talk to CEOs. I call it the building the business case for diversity. But now you you can't shy and run from it. And so we're entering an age of where do we go from here? We're entering an age where we all collectively know that it exists and we have to coexist together. We have five generations in growing in the workforce. We have social media that is bringing to light so many of the injustices that we used to read in our textbooks, if you did get that textbook, and that's a whole different discussion, right? And so now there's this deep awareness globally, not only America, right? You now have a global awareness of what's happening. Where do you go from here? And this is a time like no other, which you can see I'm still excited at this my own job, but I'm so excited to be in this space Fast forward to 15 years, because this is the time to shine, right? This is a time where if you are interested in diversity, put your seatbelt on, because this is the time where you have people's attention. This is the time that you have people's dollars. People are investing in it. People have an awareness. People are at least being open with a willingness to understand. DEI education is exploding, because what I did for Juneteenth was I didn't want to just do a celebration of what it was. I wanted to get to the root of the lack of education because with this empathy and awareness, what you come to know is that in an organization at the time at Facebook of 50,000 plus employees, I knew that people were coming from different walks of life, whether it was globally, educationally, gender, race. And so I needed to lay the foundation. And so laying the foundation of the historical framing of diversity and inclusion and race. And why are we even coming to this moment about Juneteenth? And so being able to tap into external scholars to really get that deep education. Fast forward now, it's a um, program that was created, a racial social justice program at Facebook that was created as a result of Juneteenth that is still in existence. That's my legacy, right? I would have never thought 10 years ago that you would be talking about racial social justice or that it would be programs dedicated millions of dollars to dismantling what that means for employees. And so what I see is this intersection of life. Long gone are the days of separate, right? You don't come in separate. Everybody comes in with their identities and their issues and their challenges, et cetera. And I think right now corporations are really starting to to understand that. But then this business case for diversity, there are studies out there that say teams that are diverse have better productivity, have better bottom line, right? So you're seeing that not only is it good for business, it's really good for the, the, the purse book, right? And so we're just in this, to me, very unique time where if you were interested or if you were in this space, it's like the, the light is shining on us to really, truly make change. And I don't know when this window of opportunity, how long it's going to last or when it's going to come back. And so I have a sense of urgency 
to, to literally take all the tools and all the things that I've learned to really make positive change, no matter where I am. That's really, it's wonderful just to think about that shift in the, the shift in the conversation from, are we going to do this to like, we're doing this. And then, and then the question is now, how, how are we going to do it? Well, right. This is the, the people are here. Our diversity has always been here. The differences have always been part of us. It's really about creating spaces where people can let that diversity out and, um, and come together around that and be more intentional about that. And really to be, to be sort of, I think meaningfully, at least in some parts of the world, past the point where you could sort of think about putting it back in the box somehow, um, such that it really becomes imperative for some people to figure out how to do this well, because it's, it's here to stay. I think that's really exciting. Devin, what do you want to say about sort of the, the change you've seen over the past um, several years and then what you see coming down the pike? Yeah, I think to Barbara's last point, I, I believe there are some macro trends happening that will make it impossible for us to put it back in the box. And I think we have to tackle it correctly. And I have some thoughts on that as well, based on what I've been seeing. But these macro trends, there are a few things happening. There is a huge amount, tremendous amount of technological disruption. If we think, just think about Barbara's former employer and the metaverse, that is carving a direction that we're moving as a society that we'll never be able to go back on. So let's think about technological disruption. Let's think about increasing globalization and the hybrid work world that we live in now is contributed to that immensely. And then let's also think about, I, I referenced a little bit before this trend that I would say was really marked by a declaration that the business roundtable made a few years ago. And Heather, I think you've heard me talk about this before. Larry Fink and other big CEOs declared a few years ago that the role of the corporation has changed. And the role of the corporation is not just to drive shareholder value, but it is actually to generate social good. And in some cases, we may need to make decisions as corporations that create social value, not quote business value. And I think this marks a shift away from what we might have traditionally called the business case for diversity. I still believe that that's important. I've been calling it now more the case for change, though. The case for change encapsulates not only the business case, but the social case. There is an ethical, moral imperative to doing this work beyond just the business imperative. And that has to be okay. Sometimes there is not a financial benefit to doing some of this work, but the role of the corporation the role of a corporation that has benefited from and contributed to the inequities that are in our society today needs to be to dismantle those inequities. So there is an increasing acknowledgement of this evolving role of the corporation, and we're not going back on that, that, that we're on the right path there around corporate purpose and values and not just CSR anymore. It's this kind of big P purpose. What is the purpose of a corporation? And how is that driving all types of value that include business value, but also include social value? So I think because of that, we're on a path that we're never going to be able to go back on. But clearly, we haven't been doing DEI well enough. Cle clearly, something hasn't worked. We've been trying to do DEI programming, as we've often called it, for decades. To Barbara's point, from a history perspective, there have been people doing this work for a long time, but we're in you might argue in some ways a worse state that we were several decades ago. We have perpetuated those systems of oppression even more than we have as of a few decades ago. So we have to do some things differently. And I'm seeing three big ways that we need to do things differently. The first is taking a systemic perspective. So we're not necessarily just looking at these individual programmatic things that are happening across an organization. We're actually looking at a company as a system within a system of the world, but a, a business itself is a system. And more and more my clients are thinking that way. They're thinking of equity work as systemic. And if I pull this lever, it's going to impact this lever. And that means, secondly, it's, it's not just about HR, which DEI has historically lived in the human resources function. Along with this systemic perspective, number two is that DEI is no longer functional. It's cross-enterprise. So more and more of my clients are CEOs. My clients are C-suite leaders who own all priorities of their enterprise, and they're thinking about all the levers they can pull across an organization, the M&A decisions they make, 
procurement and the entire supply chain, how they innovate products and services, how they interact with their customers, the impact they have in their communities, in digital and physical workspaces that they have, manufacturing facilities, all of these things, in addition, of course, to workforce, workplace, DEI efforts, my employees, my workers are my biggest asset as a company. So of course I need to focus on that as well, but how do those things intersect with all of these other parts of my organization? And so we're helping our clients more and more think about all of those things. I'm not doing HR DEI work anymore. I am doing systemic business-wide DEI work and all of these things are interconnected. And I think that leads to the third shift I'm seeing, which is before George Floyd, my clients did not know what equity was. Some of them still don't. They weren't using the word, absolutely. The nonprofit and education sectors were definitely using words like oppression and privilege and equity, but corporations were not. I actually was told by leaders I was not allowed to use the word privilege with my clients um, prior to a few years ago. That has shifted a lot. So I can talk about privilege. I can talk about oppression. I can talk about equity in new ways and equity needs to include anti-oppression and that is a brand new thing for our companies to reconcile back to what i said a few minutes ago helping our clients realize that they have actually contributed to perpetuating the oppression that has gotten us to where we are today that's really hard that's a really hard conversation but if the leaders who are going to have a legacy around this are the ones who acknowledge their own personal stake and role in having perpetuated that oppression and their company's stake and role in perpetuating that oppression, and then therefore are shifting to dismantle those systems of oppression. So that that is happening. I'm, I am optimistic. It's a long journey. <laughs> this is not a two-year journey. This is a 200-year journey, but okay. we are on the right path. I am seeing that with my clients. That is the approach that Deloitte is taking with our clients. Like We are prioritizing systems work that's focused on equity transformation with the biggest and most influential companies in the world. And I never thought that would happen in my time at Deloitte. So that is, I could not be more excited about this direction. Yeah, I I'm going to add really real quick, Heather, with Devin, what he triggered and sparked is this crucial conversations I think you're hearing, right, across all industries. And just for folks who are interested in trying to figure out how to get in, start having crucial conversations with yourself. Because this is the reason why I personally think why it's taken so long. And, and Devin and I have said this, this is a human transformation, right? You have to figure out, especially the folks who are the power that be, admit to contributing to the oppression. Admit to your privileges. That's hard. And that is why I say self-reflection and awareness is key. And if you all don't get anything from me and Devin, leave with this. Start with self first. Have crucial conversation with self first. Get self-aware. Get that nasty, ugly cry out and realize where you've been ugly in different parts of your life. Realize where you live in a homogeneous situation, right? Are you always, right, not an outsider? When have you contributed to people being outsiders? And so I like to give action to folks who try to get in this space because you cannot get in this space without doing your work. It's like I tell folks in diversity, you need to have a journal and you have to write in your journal probably every other day because you are on this self-discovery of things that you were peeling back. It's like the onion and you're like, oh, I don't know, I believe that. Oh, and mom and dad said this. With George Floyd, when we had crucial conversations, we had people admit that, you know, when they would go on the holidays are coming around. They go to holidays around families and they would say stuff about different folks and they just, you know, were quiet and didn't say anything. Step up now. Have this crucial conversation. So when grandma and grandpa say something about someone or a group of people, check it. And so this is what we're talking about, right? Um, where it's everyone's job. It is not just a workplace. A lot of stuff bleeds into family and upbringing. And how do you dismantle that stuff in your own house? with your own family. This is tough work, but if we're gonna move the needle, we have to all be honest and figure out how we all contributed to this. I really, and your words earlier are coming back to me to sort of seek first to understand and, and paralleling our, our work on ECHO here and, and really understanding people the way they wanna be heard. It's not just about understanding other people. It's also about understanding ourselves, um, also about understanding our instincts and our reactions and, and it, is 
absolutely true. You know, especially as you start to think about holiday gatherings, the number of situations people will, will end up in where something is awkward, something is confusing, something is upsetting. And then the sort of instinct is just get through the situation. Just like, can we wait, get, get to peace, get to get, get through without conflict, uh, not to dig in um, and actually um, engage with what has happened to understand it. It's trying to get past it. And what I hear you saying is that, that there's a real call and an, an imperative for anybody who wants to be part of, uh, of progress in this space to stop yourself from running away or running through that situation, but really to dive in and engage. Am I getting that right? Oh, oh, spot on, spot on. You got to do your work first. I mean, work first. That, that's the biggest thing um, that you have to do in bravery, right? So I talked about empathy. I wanted to add one other, bravery. I don't know about Devin, but for me, this is a tough job, right? Like you are brave and bold every day, calling out things on people who have fancy titles, who also have the ability to hire, fire, promote you, right? So it's a it's a interesting dance of, of calling things out for yourself, but also for others who are bad actors, right? And so bravery, I think, is really big. I don't want, I didn't want to leave folks of this cookie cutter, like, oh, this is such an amazing role. Yeah, but you have to be brave and confident and deliver hard and crucial conversations in a way where people can listen and be open-minded. So do some testing, right? Try it out on your family members during the holiday. See what resonates, see what doesn't. See, I mean, my thing is you got to start learning anyway. So let's make this fun and let's see some of the reactions you get, right? This is what happens when you're in the workplace. And so there are ways that you can practice this out. There's a ways that you can have different, I call it different ears. When you know now, you can't go back. And so you have to be honest with yourself and be brave enough to even call out whether it's a best friend or your partner, your mom and dad, grandma, and grandpa. I'm still to this day doing this, right? Um, even within my own setting. But bravery is another, I think, skill set and, and tool that you have to develop really quick if you are going to be in this space. Excellent. I appreciate that. Devin, do you want to add anything before we turn to audience questions? The one thing I'll add is that not everyone on this call is going to become or wants to become a DEI practitioner in the official sense, but, and all of you can and will do DEI work in whatever path your career takes you. I feel so strongly that yes, I have chosen, Barbara has chosen, and Heather has chosen to make DEI a big part of our careers, but actually it is more important for all of you to go out into whatever fields and whatever roles and be DEI practitioners in your roles as well. You are the key to this future, this transformational journey that we're going on. I can help instigate the behavior change, but you will perpetuate that behavior change. And so that mindset shift, and when uh, to Barbara's point, when folks reach out to me and are interested in getting into the field, my first question to them is always some version of, well, how are you driving DEI in your work now, in your current role now? And when I talk to colleagues at Deloitte who want to do this work, I tell them that every single one of our 350,000 client service professionals are DEI, can be, should be DEI practitioners. All of us should be bringing an, a lens of equity first transformation into all of the work we do. And that's how we're going to get to the ideal outcome. It's a moving finish line, of course, but the outcome, the aspiration of equity will only happen if all of us do that together. So that's not to shirk accountability from those of us who are driving this work from the center, if you will, but to share that accountability, responsibility, opportunity for us to all drive equity in everything we do every day. Oh, I mean, I, I plus a thousand to that. I, I wanna underscore, in fact, I would argue that no one cannot affect uh, DI. Everyone, everyone is affecting it every day, no matter what you're doing, in part because an aspect of inclusion is just how you interact with other people and how they interact with you, how they um, address you, how they ask questions of you, how they engage in conflict or collaboration with you. If you are ever interacting with human beings, you are affecting the level of inclusion that they are experiencing. You are creating uh, a, a particular climate for yourself. If you're ever hiring anybody, ever um, encouraging someone to go to business school, giving people information about what their options are in the education space or in the career space, you are affecting equity. There, are, there, there is no way to avoid having an, an impact in the space. So you really want to think about how do you 
make yourself responsible for, for having the best possible impact, knowing that there, there really is no way to sort of stay out of the work. Um, okay, I want to open it up to the group for questions. Just raise your hand and then I can, uh, I can call on you to unmute and then uh, you can ask a question of any of our great panelists. Isabel, go for it. Hi, Devin. Hi, Barbara. Thank you guys for joining us today. Um, it's been very insightful. Um, I was curious if either of you could talk about one of uh, the biggest struggles that you've recently overcome in doing this work that you're doing. I think it's really helpful to hear about sort of like a really tough challenge um, that always really resonates with us and uh, the things that we're facing in our workplace. I'll, I'll take this one, Isabel. Um, I'll go first, Devin. A real one is just recently is burnout. So there was a study that talked about um, not only is this diversity profession exploding with opportunities, right? So I quoted 123% that was stated. There's also a study that shows the average tenure of a chief diversity officer is around two years. Why is that? Burnout. So the burnout comes from, Devin said it best, the emotional labor. And this is why I added bravery in there. You know, when you are every day fighting and trying to dismantle systemic racism, that is not easy. And this is why. Because systemic racism and discrimination always benefits certain groups. And so when you're on the receiving end of the benefits, there's resistance. You don't want that to end. Why would you want that to end? Because if it stopped benefiting me, I now have to work harder. So you're always up against this current of resistance, no matter what movement it is, no matter what is happening. Um, and so I think the burnout comes in and I'll just be personal. Uh, for me, I had burnout, like I've been in this 15 plus year. I had burnout last year and I took time off. And I think it was probably with COVID and I actually stepped away from UCLA getting my MBA because I had to watch my daughter. There was no daycare, right? So you think about COVID and then George Floyd and me being a mother. There's also a study that said women are exiting the workforce, the work, sorry, workforce so fast. And it's not even just, you know, diversity. It's what we have to overcome, um, what has been placed on us. And so when I say burnout, one of the things that I do to combat that is self-care. So I call myself the self-care queen. I know when I need to step away. I know when I'm not always going to be the diversity professional. That's another thing that you can get, like put in a box. Like, what do you think about this issue? I don't have feelings. I want to do a selfie on Instagram. I want to take a vacation with my family. I'm unapologetic with having um, different facets of me be seen and shown. And I think that's a struggle when you get into this space of being so defined on having a say um, or always being on the front lines. One of the things that I encourage my community groups is to get a life, get a life outside of some of these issues, turn off the news, go on vacation, take your PTO. And don't let it necessarily define you because you can get so engrossed in this where it literally starts to disrupt your life. And it started to do that for me. Um, and I took a step back and I was unapologetic with it. I think I took like two months off at the time and I dedicated my focus to my family. I took a break from UCLA. I said no to a lot of things and I was just I can't do it. Um, and so now I'm back stronger than ever, elevated role, new company, I'm on fire. Um, but that's really what happens is you have to be honest when this is getting too much and you need to take the step back and be unapologetic when you want to have fun and have self-care and be human um, for once. Thank you. That was very insightful. I appreciate it. Kevin, did you want to add anything to that question about challenges that you've overcome? I'm mindful we have other questions, so I'll, I'll be quick. I agree that th that core challenge or all the core challenges that we face as DEI practitioners are related to how hard this work is that can lead to burnout. One of the other reasons for burnout I've seen is it's really difficult to measure success in this work. So it's not one specific challenge I faced yesterday, but something I'm constantly facing for myself and for my clients is 
in the context of a probably multi-generational journey here, how do we define success in a way that allows us to feel like we've achieved something on a daily, weekly, monthly, annual basis? And that makes it really hard for DEI leaders to also get rewarded for progress that they've made within their organizations. It can be really hard to get continuous support, the continuous support they need for this work when it might actually take 10 years to realize a 5% increase in one certain demographic group at a company. Thing. Like that's not a normal business metric of it's going to take us decades to achieve something. So I think this constant challenge of how do we measure success in a way that feels tangible in small enough ways that are real and we can celebrate those things along the way is a, a challenge that we're constantly facing as a profession. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. We have about five minutes left before we're going to transition. Um, so we'll take, uh, we have three questions. Let's start with Brittany. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Barbara, Heather, and Devin. I really appreciate you taking my question. Um, just let me know if you can't hear me well. I'm at a cafe, so there might be some ambient sounds. Okay, great. Um, I was wondering, what are some publications that either of you have worked on relative to social change and measuring impact? I've been doing um, some preliminary research in that area, and I'm really interested to know what sort of metrics you two have found to be uh, viable candidates for measuring real-time change? Oh, this is challenging, Devin. I'm going to give this one to you. <laughs> Big question. Uh, yeah, as it relates to what I was saying before. Um, Measuring real-time change. So we, Deloitte published something earlier this year called the Equity Imperative that I worked on. And so check it out. It, it really documents Deloitte's systems lens on equity transformation work. And within that, we didn't get too deep into how do we measure success in specific areas, but we did explain this interconnectedness of all the levers that you can pull across an organization that I was articulating a little bit earlier. And so I think in any conversation around how do we measure change, it's important to look at that systems frame, because if we change this one thing over here, it's going to have intended and unintended impacts on other parts of the things that we do every day. And so I think applying that lens to that work uh, is really important. And then I think, again, really similar to what I just said a few minutes ago, I think thinking about change in terms of small, tangible steps, as opposed to big commitments that companies are making these days. Companies are making huge commitments. So by 2025 or by 2030, we're going to achieve this. And many of them, we, we just did some research on this. Many of them have literally done nothing to make movements on those commitments so far because they just don't know how to break it down in a way that's tactical and operational and drive accountability for those things. And so we're seeing, we're predicting that by 2025, like at least half of those companies will not have achieved what they've committed to. And so I think the key to the ones who are being successful and making progress, and I will say Facebook or Meta is one of them, they are taking it step by step. They are do doing it in pieces and dispersing the work across the organization. So I would think about defining change in that way. I see that. Thank you, Brittany. We're going to go ahead and take John B's question. John B, please let me know if I'm not getting that right. Your pronoun the pronunciation of your name. I'm sorry, it's 5 a.m. here in Australia, so ignore my, <laughs> yeah. So um, thank you, thank you. So Barbara, I've always uh, followed your work and I'm a fan, so very lucky to be part of this conversation. Uh, I wanted to ask both of you that now you're not in a position of power where you can actually make a difference, but what about the initial journey? How did you start? Because I'm sure you faced quite a lot of opposition or maybe you didn't get people to listen to you that often because especially you were just, beginning you didn't have you had a voice but definitely you wouldn't have had many people supporting you right away because I've faced that and I just want to know how your experience was and how you dealt with it and how you came across that such a great question John thanks for following me that's so awesome to hear and see um I'll say this my biggest success have been my mentors um, and I call them get your own board of directors. I would not be in this position if I didn't have amazing people that I, I sought out. So if you're in this profession or you're trying to be or you're doing this work, you cannot do it alone. You need to figure out folks that need to be in your corner 
when things get really, really hard. I have maybe five people on speed dial that I talk to probably every week. And I'm like, what do you think about this? What do I do this, right? And this is from all walks of life, right? There are folks that are based in London, which is a good mentor that I have. There are folks that are from my university. There are folks that are from my, my other jobs. I even met some folks where I am my current job at Nike that I'm building relationships with. I mean, so my biggest thing, um, advice that I can give is be very intentional in mindful and relationship building. And know when you need to bring people in your corner, know when you need to cultivate that relationship and be honest when you don't have the answer and you don't know where to go Um, and tap into people because people have a long history of doing this work. And and the last thing I say is I'm an avid reader. And so I'll be honest, when I went through burnout and when George Floyd happened, I started to um, read autobiographies of like John Lewis, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, a lot of the, the freedom fighters. And one of the things I wanted to do was draw inspiration from them because, I mean, think about what they had to do, right? Like way worse than what we're going through right now. And I wanted to figure out what got them through. Um, Nelson Mandela is one I, I did research in Cape Town and reading his journey in jail, the hope and inspiration he had to then become the president of South Africa, that did it for me. And so I, I often draw inspiration for people who've been before me. Um, and, and tap into that. And so whatever you have that you need to draw inspiration from, do that regularly and make sure that it is a part of your toolkit. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much. I, I want to acknowledge that we're at time. So anyone who has to drop, obviously, um, we understand. And we'll see you at the next session on imposter syndrome. Um, and Devin and Barbara, I also want to respect your time. We do have one more question. Would it be okay to take it? Thank you. Thank I you. appreciate it. Rosette, go for it. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you, Barbara and Devin. It's been such a pleasure hearing you guys talk about this. Um, Both of you guys talked about confronting our own privileges. And I was just wondering if you have like a method for doing that or any successful strategies that you guys have been able to implement. I think it's a continuous journey to confront our own privilege. And part of it is starting, we've been talking a lot about self-reflection and uh, so understanding your own role in relationship to others. I think part of our, there's an academic and intellectual side to understanding our own privilege. And then there's the emotional side of it and kind of grappling with, I may have achieved certain things in my life because of things that are outside of my control. That's really hard to reconcile. It's really hard to reconcile that part of the reason that I might've gotten into UCLA is because I'm white actually. And because I benefited from all these systems that preferred white people over people who aren't white. And so I think uh, time, giving yourself and others time, having conversations, reading, I think, it's a, it's a process. Like I would say when it comes to privilege, don't ever assume in yourself and others that there's going to be this moment that's going to take you from not getting it to getting it. It's a, it's a continuous journey. And I think, um, part of that journey is understanding how we use that privilege to help others. And that's what allyship is at the end of the day. So it's something we haven't talked a lot about today, but I think if you put it in the context of I have privilege and then how do I use that privilege for good to help people, it makes it a little bit easier to swallow. It's not just that I'm privileged, but it's that I can use that privilege for other people. And it's a good point. One thing I only think I'll add in and this is how you can YouTube the power of technology. Um, YouTube privilege walk. So there's these exercises that people do in university called the privilege walk. And what it does, and I think it's so helpful when folks are just trying to understand what is privilege, right? If you are not from this life or upbringing, you probably don't even know what type of privilege you have. In the privilege walk, it goes through different privileges that you wouldn't even think of as a privilege. And it's an exercise where people like take a step um, if you have two parents in the household, take a step if you didn't have to worry about eating today, take a step. And then after this walk is done, you see all the people who are behind you. And when you see all the people behind you, you start to see where the inequity lies. And it really breaks it down, I think, in a very visual, succinct way, if you want to understand what privilege is. Do some homework and research. Start researching what are what is privilege, right? Um, and you get to then understand 
other, I think, um, communities, I would say what I said in the beginning, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Examine your life. Do, does everyone look like you? Are you in organizations or clubs that you don't really know anything about these groups of people, but you want to know? Become an outsider yourself, right? And so this is why I say you have to examine yourself, your circle of friends, your circle of board of directors, uh, directors where you go, where you congregate. How do you spend your time? And are you just living in this comfortable life floating while other people are struggling, right? And so it's going to take some discomfort, but you got to be comfortable with that and know that this is a journey to what Devin said. Um, but do some research in YouTube and books. There's a lot out there if you want to really start dismantling and examining your life and where your privilege comes from. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the great question, Brissette, and for all of the other questions and your participation, everyone who's still with us. Thank you so much, Devin and Barbara. The, the insights that you shared have been wonderful, honest, engaging, inspiring to many I know, uh, and we couldn't be more grateful that you took the time to share them with us. Thank you. Uh, my name is Roy Quinto. I'm one of the associate directors of admission for the fully employed MBA program here at UCLA Anderson. It's a, my great pleasure uh, to have you here this morning uh, talking about imposter syndrome. So let me first say, all of you belong here. Don't feel like you, you don't because this is the space to talk about a very important topic. And part of that is understanding that, especially for our fully employed um, prospects, there is no typical path to Anderson. I was a school teacher before I got my MBA here. So this is not about uh, fitting in. This is about showing up and showing your unique uh, qualities that make you a great candidate. And for our current students, I hope you enjoy this presentation with your fellow classmates. We have three of them here, uh, Shauna, Obed, and Carol Ann. I'm going to make sure that they be the ones that introduce themselves because I feel like, uh, as I was mentioning to our group earlier, imposter syndrome probably should start by making sure we all have a voice in the room. So with that said, I'm going to invite Carol Ann to introduce herself. And, and Carol Ann, if you could let us know a little bit about your career and your path to Anderson, and maybe uh, an experience of imposter syndrome that you've encountered and overcome. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Roy. Good morning, everyone. So my name is Carol Ann Link. I am a FEMBA class of 2023. I am also the VP of EDI for FEMBA Council. Um, I always struggle to figure out where to start my story. I'm always scared about sharing too much or sharing too little and making sure that I make an impact. But that's the whole point of this panel is the idea of feeling comfortable with sharing and feeling comfortable in this space together. So I will do my best. I may stumble along the way but I, um, I'm really excited to get this opportunity to share with you all. So for me personally, I was born with cerebral palsy, which is a mobility disability. I spent much of my life semi-ambulatory, so walking for the most part. And it wasn't until I actually came to UCLA as an undergrad where my health became to deteriorate and I transitioned to life in a wheelchair. And on both of those, experiences, both as a semi-ambulatory disabled person and as a wheelchair user, there was a lot of imposter syndrome. Um, when you're semi-ambulatory, you can't keep up with able-bodied people and you don't necessarily fit in with the persons with other types of disabilities that may be more severe. And then when I became a wheelchair user, I had the other situation where I did not know where I fit in anymore. I had lost my sense of self in even my own disability. So I went through that transition while at undergrad here, and I was really lucky to find communities to help support me in that journey. So when I graduated from undergrad, I actually just decided to stay here at UCLA, and I joined the Disabilities and Computing Program, which is the IT department on this campus that specializes in what we call digital accessibility, making sure that our online resources are accessible to all sorts of people with disabilities. It's often something that goes overlooked, um, the question I get most often asked is, how does a blind person use the internet? How does someone without hands use a mouse? And all of these interesting questions that I hope you all may explore with me at some point. 
But the point being here is that I finally felt comfortable accepting disability as not just something that I should hide or pretend about, but I could embrace it, advocate for it, and feel comfortable in that space in my personal life and in my professional life. So what brought me here to Anderson specifically is that I realized that I really wanted to be a leader in this space, and I wasn't really sure how. And a lot of that was this insecurity of not knowing my own value, not being able to say, hey, my voice matters, because I was always worried I was speaking just for me, that I was generalizing too much, that as a minority and representing several minorities, also being mixed race and a woman and working in STEM, I was worried that I'd be overlooked, shoved aside, or dismissed. And that was always a difficult thing to feel as I tried to make a space in this area for people like me and others with various and diverse backgrounds and intersectionalities. So again, that brought me to Anderson where I've been exploring how to be that leader I wanna be. And it's been amazing to find all of these other people who are trying to do that in their own spaces, in their own niches. And that was something that shocked and thrilled me because when you think about business school, at least when I used to, it was the idea of people in suits very uptight, doing businessy looking things, finance, all these fun things that I don't totally have a grasp on. But I didn't think that that was the space for me because this was the stereotype that came to me in my head. And so I love the fact that that's been broken down so much for me and that I can talk to so many of my classmates and learn about how they are being leaders in their space and how that informs myself. And as far as an imposter syndrome story that I've dealt with, um, here at Anderson is honestly that being in this VP of EDI role right now, every day I'm so worried that my vision's too narrow or too biased from my own experiences or that I'm focusing too much on things like disability and accessibility because that's where my identities lie. So I'm constantly thinking about that, constantly feeling that pressure of, hey, are you the best person for this job? Are you equipped for this? And I have to constantly tell myself, yes, remind myself. And I'm so thankful that I have wonderful people around me and wonderful teammates. I had other per people on the FEMBA Council eboard say, bring up accessibility every time we meet. We want to hear it. They reassure me that that is a valuable perspective and that the only way to make change is by to continually speak out. So I'll wrap it up there and give time to my other panelists. Thank you so much, Caroline, for that story. I, I feel like um, the key word I got uh, in the last um, panel was this idea of empathy. And I think being so empathetic about other people's concerns puts us somehow in a position where we feel like we, you know, uh, are not prepared to support others as well as we want to be. So showing up and, and knowing your value is so important. And I like the word businessy. I, I feel like that's going to be the word I'm going to be walking away with as well. So thank you so much, Caroline. I'm going to invite Obed to go ahead and introduce himself. Uh, thank you, Roy. Hey, everyone. My name is Obed Guzman. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit of my story, some background, some professional career, and it's all part of who I am. Uh, like Caroline, um, I'm a second year fully employed MBA student here at Anderson. Uh, I am also part of the FEMBA uh, e, uh, D and, D, e, and I uh, Council. I'm part of the committee working with, uh, under Caroline, and, and I've loved the experience thus far. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, I was born and raised in LA, particularly in a small little town here called Inglewood. And I mean by small little town is because I'm trying to segregate a huge city. Uh, home to the ranch now, by the way. Um, I'm a first-generation Mexican-American. Fun fact, I'm actually the first in my family in the US and in Mexico to graduate uh, from high school. And so breaking that barrier was a huge uh, milestone for my family and myself. Uh, and to be quite frank with you, I didn't know what college was until probably my junior year or senior year uh, of high school. Uh, because to me, growing up in the neighborhood I grew up in uh, from an privileged background, going to college was research for those with money or with resources you know, things that I didn't have, right? Uh, and it wasn't until I developed mentors and great teachers that helped me along the way 
who said, hey, Obed, you need to get out of here. There's more to life than, you know, this neighborhood that you live in. And so thankfully, I attended uh, the University of California, Riverside, as per my undergrad. And right off the bat, I experienced imposter syndrome, uh, where I don't belong here, right? I have no friends, don't know what to do. I don't even know what classes, what classes to take, what major to choose, right? Uh, it was an interesting journey. Again, I leveraged a lot of my resources, a lot of the mentors, a lot of my network to help me along the way. Uh, and then I've been in corporate finance roles over the past few years. And the idea of business school was also never in my mind. Same reasons. Oh, I don't belong in business school. It's for a certain type of people with resources, right? But then I told myself, I'm going to shut that little voice up a little bit because I want to chase what I think is not, well, it's impossible. And, you know, the reason I picked Anderson, funny story, at one of my previous jobs, there was actually a FEMBA. Uh, she was my coworker and she was part of the FEMBA. She told me all, she spoke highly of the FEMBA program at Anderson and said, I want to check it out for myself. I connected with some of the staff, some of the students. And I, the idea that I got, the one main concept, and you're probably going to hear it throughout, was we all share success. And when I heard that, when I actually saw that, I said, this is where I want to be. This is my dream school today. Uh, fast forward a couple of years, I'm in my second year. And yes, I also did experience a little bit of imposter syndrome right off the bat. But again, I said to myself, everyone's here for one goal. We're all working. We're all working very hard in school. Um, and we're all, you know, a united cohort together. And again, it's a very inclusive environment that I'm actually very proud of. So I'm, I'm very proud to be a Bruin, especially a UCLA Anderson student. Um, and yeah, that's a little bit about myself and my story. Um, I think I have to share a story about an experience when I experienced an imposter syndrome. I think I already mentioned this, but yes, as soon as I hit undergrad or even business school, I did experience it. But thankfully, I always have to push forward. Um, don't pay attention to those negative thoughts and just say, I do belong because I'm special, right? And everyone's unique in their own way. Absolutely, Obed. Thank you so much again for, for joining us. And, and I wanted to make sure I heard you right. You were first generation high school. Like this is, wow. And, yeah. and so, okay. So I, I'm gonna love to hear a little bit more about the resources and mentors that you leaned on because that's tremendous to get to this point. And I appreciate you being here so much. Thank you so much, Obed. Um, Shauna, it's your turn now. I mean, how do you follow those? Um... I have my whole life, I have worked as far as I can remember um, in either one of the family businesses or my mother worked in nonprofit. So it was volunteering my summers, in filing whatever uh, nonprofit she was in at the time. Um, and then once I got my permit, uh, started working, worked all through college. Um, I am a first generation college graduate from my family. Um, and talk about imposter syndrome. So I went to San Diego State for my first year and was asked to leave my major. Um, so if you ever want to feel like a failure, that is a really solid moment. Um, so uh, San Diego State is renowned for their biology program. Um, and I was not doing well. And my professor pulled me aside and said, I will pass you in this class if you change to anything else. And I went, deal. Um, so that was not my first run-in, but a pretty strong one. Um, ended up graduating from Cal State Fullerton with a degree in psychology and worked in for-profit for a, a hot second before running back into what I knew from my whole life, which is nonprofit work. Um, bouncing from nonprofit to nonprofit um, and building, you know, a litany of causes that I still will support at the drop of a hat. Um, I really have a passion for uh, community work and community organizing. Um, and as I was looking at nonprofits, I noticed that if I really wanted to get into leadership, I was probably going to need an advanced degree. But how is poor little me going to get an advanced degree when? I worked in nonprofit and that's not who goes to places like UCLA. Um, I had only led very small teams. I had no finance background. I had no economics background. I did not know what the stock market really did. 
as a function, right? It just looked like gambling, which I maintain to this day is what it is. Um, so when I looked at UCLA and I had decided that that was where I, if I was going to get in somewhere that that's where I wanted to go, I was convinced that I was not going to get in. Um, but luckily, uh, decided, okay, I'm just going to go for this one coffee chat with this one admissions person. And when she tells me not to apply, I'll go, I don't know, become a chaplain. That literally was my fallback. Um, and she said, yes, you should absolutely apply. And I was like, you're funny. So I applied, uh, for like late round admission for the executive MBA program. And they let me in, which, and so I was looking at like actually signing the paperwork to actually accept admission. And I was looking at how much it was going to cost. And I was terrified because how am I going to pay for this working on a nonprofit salary, right? Um, I saw that they had given me a, a fellowship and it was modest. It was very small. But the fact that they were going to invest in me uh, was really the catalyst for me to really start believing in myself and what I could give back um, to not only the program, but to to my colleagues, really, is, is why I ended up getting this degree. So that's that's kind of the short form. Um, so, yeah, I think I think I covered a short story on imposter syndrome. Um, but more recently, I mean, it comes up all the time. It comes up in meetings where I'm talking. So right now I run the um, digital strategy for the fundraising portion of Cedar sinai which is a nonprofit community hospital. Um, and I, I end up in disagreements with everybody all the time because I'm, I'm these days mostly self-assured. And we were in one and I just, I had a moment where, where she had a really good point and I had a really good point. I was, okay, I've been doing this for 15 years. What is the right decision here? Like, am I supposed to be here? Um, should I be making these calls? It was just this weird little spiral of, of, do I know what I'm talking about? Um, and took a beat and looked at the stats and came back at it. But sometimes it's just taking that breath and reassuring yourself that your gut comes from something, you know, you've got this experience. You're not just pulling opinions out of nowhere at this point in your career. Um, you are, you are a person and you're an intelligent person. What would you tell your best friend? You are an intelligent person. You know what you're talking about. You have the experience, go do the thing. So that's kind of where I am. You are your own best friend in the end, right? Yeah. I agree with that, Shana. And I love this idea of spiral. Like, I, I feel like a lot of us know that feeling of just thought upon thought upon thought, and then you kind of get into this space where you can't get out. So I'm going to ask, you know, the panel, starting with Carol Ann, this spiral, this thinking, this overthinking, what have you done to, you know, overcome those feelings? Uh, have you leaned on people, resources, uh, a method of thinking to kind of overcome that, that sensation? Um, yeah, to begin, um, I definitely have leaned on people in my life. I really appreciate Shauna's point about the best friend moment, because I, I definitely relate to that, the idea of you, a lot of us in here, of course, will always be the first person to tell someone else that they're amazing, that they're doing a great job, but we're so much harsher on ourselves by default, and we often don't always call ourselves out on that. So that I love that model of thinking of not only do I turn to other people when I'm feeling especially down on myself to hear it from someone else, but to remind myself to tell myself those things that I would tell somebody else. And I think for me, the real backbone of what I tell myself is about my own value. I think a lot of where I struggle the most personally is reminding myself of my own validity of my own value add, of that uniqueness, and the fact that everyone has that, and that it's worth sharing. And I try and emphasize that to everyone I meet, the idea that I always want to hear about their lives. Tell me about your dog. Tell me about your worst fears. I want to get to know you as a whole human. 
Um, I even do this with my students at work where I tell them I want us all to be friends, as ridiculous as that sounds. Um, because I think treating each other as holistic whole people instead of just one facet of it, I think is the healthiest way for me personally to get over that. The idea that they don't want me to just be a student. They don't want me to just be a manager. They care about me as a whole person. And reassuring myself of that and making sure that I do that in return has been really key for me. I appreciate that point, Caroline. I'm going to extend this question to all of you, but I also want to ask all of you too, aside from, you know, working against the spiral, working against that feeling of inadequacy, how do, do you catch it quickly enough? Like, is that something that you can catch or do you kind of let it go a little too long before you realize it's happened? I, I, again, open it to, to the panel. Yeah, Mom, I can take this one. Uh, so yeah, uh, maybe I'll answer your second question first and that's okay. Uh, thank you, Roy, and thank you, Kellen, for sharing that experience. Um, sometimes, I'll be completely honest with you, in the past, younger version of me used to just let a spiral and I used to go down this rabbit hole. Uh, but I've learned that it isn't both relatively healthy for me mentally and physically to kind of think less of myself, right? Or compare myself or, you know, not think highly of myself really. Uh, so what I've learned lately as of late and I, and a lot of the resources that Anderson have really helped me. So for example, there's a program called leadership at Anderson where, where they put you with a coach uh, to work on your leadership skills uh, and they you know they listen to you and and they listen to your thoughts and i think it was really my first year at, as a femba student where i really learned to overcome that and kind of hop over those thoughts right before they they went you know they took me down that rabbit hole uh, it's just a matter of leveraging uh people and mentors that i've that i've accumulated throughout my career and, and my in my student life so this is almost answering also uh, the first question, Roy, right, where, you know, throughout my, you know, like I said, I, I, I am a first gen high school graduate. So none of my siblings did it. No one in my family had ever done it from both Mexico and here in the U.S. And every mentor has been different for me. In high school, I had mentors who helped me, you know, reach the next milestone in my career, which was going to, into college, pursue a degree. And then in college, I had different mentors as well, which were professors and then just honestly, mostly students. Uh, and then in my career, I've had de uh, various managers, executive level of management who have really taken care, not only of my career, who have helped me, but also cared about me as a person. What am I doing with my life, right? How am I, how's my family doing? Uh, and then lastly, to be completely honest with you, I leverage a lot of my family. Uh, I always look, they always think highly of me, right? Because, hey, you know, Obed's doing this. And, but that also leads to chip on my shoulder. Uh, and this chip that I've always carried, it's almost like a fire that, you know, everyone is motivated by certain ways, right? We all have that motivation. For me, is leaving a legacy, right? Uh, what are my kids going to think of me? What, are, what, are, what is my community going to think of me when it's all said and done? What did I do, not only for my professional career in life, but for my community? That's, that's really what carries me and drives me. Because I think, hey, there's going to be various Obeds out there, right, who in, in similar shoes to me. And that's why I want to share success and be that person to help them through mentorship or just leading by example that you can do it if you put your mindset and develop that network around you as well. What do you think, Shauna? Are you, uh, are you agreeing with Obed and Carol Ann? Absolutely. Um, and I do, I want to build on that and say that I have found that mentoring others and, and sharing that success has really been the balm for, for a lot of my imposter syndrome. I was feeling really down last week. Um, and so I made a list of all of the people that, that I was grateful for. And then I just started writing notes. Thank you notes. Thank you for being a part of my life. Thank you for being a rock star. Thank you for being amazing. Thank you just you know, things that, that I, that we feel about the people in our lives that we don't say often enough. And I felt so much better even after writing two of those. And so now that's my, my new goal every week is I write two thank you notes to people that are in my life for no reason, just, Hey, thanks. Um, because one of the things that I have done in my career 
is I have saved all of the stupid little notes people write me. Uh, it's sticky notes, it's napkins, it's actual thank you notes, it's emails that I printed out and cut up um, in a box. And when I'm feeling especially down and especially useless, I will flip through. And one of my coworkers is on here. She has seen me flip through that box on a bad day and look for, you know, the the validation that that I have done good, that I have left some kind of a legacy in somebody's life. I touched somebody in some way that drove them to do a thing. So um, please, please keep those pieces because you never know when that day is going to come up. And Shana, what was the signal? What When do you realize you need to open that box up? Is there like a clue? Like, a, have you figured that out yet? <laughs> uh, not reliably, no. I mean, I'm... Uh, I, I think I'm hitting it more closely to the beginning of, of my spiral than I used to. Um, but I also have some really, really amazing coworkers that will call me on it now. Um, and a really amazing partner that calls me on it now. And I am training my little nine-year-old to call herself on it and call me on it too. And like, you know, you're better than this. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, 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 mean, I think, Shauna, the, the idea like uh, Carol Ann brought up of, of making relationships count yeah. and creating those relationships and workspaces so they can call you out and remind you to open that box, I think is, is, is a great kind of thought to, to bring up. So appreciate that, Sharon, Shauna. Um, I, I want to go back in time a little bit uh, for our panel. I, I, I'm, I am a little curious, when did you first experience imposter syndrome? Like you noticed that that had happened. Um, and, and what was your first reaction? What was your initial reaction? How did you address that, that very first time? And uh, Carol Ann, because I know we may have to uh, have you leave in a moment. I'd love for you to start that, that conversation. Absolutely. Um, I don't have anything too specific that comes to mind, but I've got to definitely say that it has definitely been a lifelong experience. Um, I think that just stems from being different than the norm in whatever way you define that. And so even early on, I can think of one particular instance where I was asked to do something in PE and physically could not do it. I couldn't conceptualize why I couldn't do it. I didn't know why I was getting laughed at and made fun of. And I didn't realize why I wasn't accepted. And I think that's the first one of the first times that I truly felt outcast and not misunderstood and that idea of not being accepted and, and included was definitely, I think one of the things that stems into my imposter syndrome as I get older, because when you have that feeling of exclusion wrapped around people telling you that sometimes your successes aren't your own, that they're because uh, someone wants to check a diversity checkbox or because you're some specific way and trying to disassociate you from your successes in addition to excluding you. I think that is the combination that gets you into that headspace. And it's a really painful headspace, but I think one thing that I've really gained from it and growing up with it is I think I've become very sensitive to it and being empathetic about it with other people and wanting to celebrate other people more. And uh, Shauna brought up the thank you notes and then something that I love to do as well because it reminds you of the impact you can make regardless of who you are, but that every step is an impactful one. Every moment is an impactful one. And that we should also be reassuring not just people in business school, but also little kids who are feeling this way as well. Uh, Carol Ann, I, I, I don't know if you're allowed to say where you're going after this, but I feel like it's so appropriate bringing up PE. Um, where, why are you leaving us this morning? Uh, my, my other commitment this morning is a, a work meeting. As I said, I work for the Displays and PE program but we are working with UCLA Campus Life and the LA 2028 Paralympic movement to try and make UCLA more accessible for the Paralympic athletes for 2028. So I think uh, your, your PE experience has now come full circle. So I would I love to believe that, that yes. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Caroline, for so doing much. that.
appreciate it. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Um, Obed, Shana, I'd love to hear where you first experienced or maybe noticed imposter syndrome and, and your response to that. I can take that then. Um, always. Uh, I mean, like Carolyn was saying, it's kind of an always thing, right? Um, I always felt like I was faking it in, in classes. I was having to work so much harder than kids outside of class to keep up. Um, as it turns out, I have kind of a, a low level um, dyslexia. So it, it made some things very hard for me, um, which I've mostly overcome at this point in my career, which is nice. Um, but yeah, and then as long as I can remember in professional state situations, but I first became aware of the name imposter syndrome. Um, I was in therapy because my boss had stopped talking to me for three months. Um, and I was, I was in therapy and, uh, she was like, this sound, you know, you, you sound like you got a lot of imposter syndrome that you're dealing with. And I was like, that's a, that's a thing. That's a, that like other people feel this thing where they don't belong in spaces. Um, and so that's, that's kind of where I started not only working on it in myself, but trying to create spaces for other people, um, that were, that were feeling that as well. Thank you so much, Shana. Uh, Obed? Yeah, um, falling on the theme of what Shada mentioned, Carolyn, it's, it's always, right? There's always these thoughts that come into mind, especially when you enter a new environment. That, and personally, that's been my experience. So um, it, it almost started when, like I mentioned earlier, going into my undergrad. And, and I'll tell you why, be more specific. Um, so I kind of realized that I was a little behind in terms of math and science uh, learning or skills. Uh, part of that is because I realized that some of the classes that some of my peers in my undergrad school, you know, they weren't offered in my, in my high school or middle school. They just, you know, like I mentioned, in a privileged neighborhood, there's a lack of resources. So I constantly felt in a position like, I don't belong here. And to be honest with you, I almost dropped out my first year of college. Um, I communicated that to my parents. And, you know, my parents, they didn't know, right? They didn't really know what how to help me or what to do. Um, they did the best they could. So I'm really grateful for them. Uh, but at the same time, it was this constant battle of like, should I continue or should I not? Because I'm behind. Uh, long story short, I catched up to everyone. I proved to myself that I could do it, that I was at the same level with everyone. And once I got to that point, I, I started thinking more or less um, of tackling the impossible always pursuing what I think is impossible. So for example, pursuing business school, right? An MBA was impossible back in my day, at least in my thoughts. And I said, hey, I wanna pursue it because it's impossible. It seems impossible, but I wanna do it. And it's always this, like I mentioned earlier, this chip, this sense that I wanna accomplish things that, that you know I've never done before. Uh, and, and I think it, it's, uh, I think you go back to your earlier point, there are other obits in, in the world and, and making that uh, confident step in that space certainly does um, communicate very clearly that there is a, pay, a, a space, there's a path for everyone. Um, so uh, before I move into an open conversation with the rest of our audience, um, I wanna make sure that I give both of you as much airtime as I can about other strategies. I know Shana, you brought up a few other strategies that you think have helped you um, uh, get past uh, imposter syndrome? Um, I love, Obed, the idea of, of leaning on mentors and family. Are there other things that we can, we can draw on from your, both of your experiences to help us through this? Either one of you. Yeah, sure. Um, I think... And, and I mentioned this earlier, it's like there's there's definitely a component of imposter syndrome that comes from the people around you, both positively and negatively, right? So educating yourself and, and being aware of some microaggressions that might be happening around you that are feeding into your imposter syndrome, I think is has been really key for, for me in the past couple of years and helping not only myself, but a lot of my um 
the people around me. I don't want to call them mentees because they're mostly just friends. Um, but knowing when, you know, you're being called out for, you know, well, they've got kids, so we can't promote them. And, you know, it's not, you know, or they don't have kids so they can take on this extra project or they've got a spouse or don't have a spouse or she's, she's a woman, so she can plan the thing or, or, or he can, can step into this leadership role that without any extra pay or like whatever extra thing that you're being asked to do or role that you're being forced to fit in might not be about you. It might be about the people around you. So just being aware of that in your life, I think, um, helps to separate the internal imposter syndrome from the external people around you so that you can kind of own where you are. Um, The other thing is, you know, I am very open with my team about my mental health issues uh, that I have anxiety and this is how I treat my anxiety. And these are the things I'm feeling very anxious today. So I'm going to be off camera today and making that more open for the people around me so that they can also feel free when they're having a bad day, say I'm having a bad day. You know, I'm having, uh, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to take today in bed and I'm going to work, but I'm, I'm going to be in bed and you know what? We're remote. You have fun lay in bed if that's if that's going to bring you joy but don't do it tomorrow because I know that for me like that would become an everyday thing um so like giving people space to have life happen um and for you to also have life happen to you because goodness knows it's been a pandemic <laughs> I, you know Shauna this this idea of of naming things I've heard this now twice right when you're with your therapist and you heard imposter syndrome for the first time, you're calling things out as microaggressions. It sounds like that's a really important aspect of your kind of uh, addressing imposter syndrome. And I appreciate you sharing that. And, and I think this transparency piece, right? Modeling the type of communication you want from your team members so that they function at their highest, most authentic level. So uh, thank you so much, Shana, for sharing all of that. Um, Obey, what are your thoughts? Yeah, um, simple answer here. I ain't going more in depth, but embrace your story. Other than leaning on people, embrace your story. I've learned that the hard way. Uh, early on in my career, I was really shy uh, of being an open book. You know, being just cookie cutter is, and pardon if that's a, the wrong term here, but um, that's just how I, I perceived, you know, hey, in corporate America, that's how I have to be. It wasn't until I started embracing my story and who I am, not, not shying away from it, recognizing that that makes me unique and different you know, than everyone else because we all have a story. And it wasn't until I realized that my story, the people who came before me, all led to where I am now. It wasn't until that point in time where I realized, hey, I can definitely overcome imposter syndrome. Yes, the thoughts are there, right? A lot of the times. However, when you think back of everything you had to overcome to get to where you are now, it seems like a piece of cake, right? Because there's a lot of life problems, so many things that happen along the way that you had to overcome to, to get where you are today. And, and that's just how I think, right? Embrace my story. Don't shy away from it. I bet I, I feel like when you embrace your story, you find really authentic people out there that embrace your story too. And they end up becoming your supporters. They end up becoming your chosen family that helps you through all the other stuff. So I I think it's a brilliant point, embracing your story, being authentic. And I think that's the whole purpose, right, of EDI is to be yourself, to be the most authentic version of yourself in all spaces that you inhabit. And and I appreciate both of you for sharing both of your stories. Um, Tremendous work to get to this point Um, but it's work that's well-received and appreciated by this audience. So this is the moment, audience, friends, if you have questions for our panelists, feel free to raise your hand. I will call on you. You can unmute yourself and and ask your question to either Shana or Obed. And I I will wait patiently for that question. And we got, okay, Lee, go for it. Hey, Obed, um, you talked earlier, Erne Roy mentioned wanting to ask you about mentors you've had in your life who helped you get to the place you are now. Can you talk a little bit about that? 
Yeah. Um, so just just to clarify the, or read back your question, uh, just about mentors, right? How they help me along the way. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, and especially like mentors who you know can have been supportive and you know helped you overcome imposter syndrome too. Yeah, um, if I can describe these mentors, right? And they they vary. I don't have that many, but I kind of prefer uh, quality over quantity, right? And so if I can classify them or say one word about them is I think of empathy, right? And I think that's a common theme here, but it's very true. Uh, it's people who really cared for my well-being, right? Um, it, it's, it's almost as if they want to see you succeed. And it's, it was always these things like, well, why do you want to see me succeed, right? Like, why? Uh, and, and But it goes deeper than that. It, it's, it's a point of making a better world, right? Change, and, you know, you can't really, I've heard this, you can't change the world, but if you can change one person or help one person, that's going towards the right step. So it's, you know, whether it's a high school teacher, which I still stay in touch with, they've helped me get to where I am today. Uh, whether it's management uh, at, at my, my workplace or some of my peers, they've all helped me and taken time out of their busy schedules, right, with their families, traveling and whatnot, uh, to really sit down and say, hey, Obed, what are your goals, right? What can we do to help you get there in five, 10 years? This, these are the steps that I've seen that have helped me and have helped others be successful in your professional career. And also to be honest uh, in life, right? Um, before I had, so I have a one-year-old son and before I had a one-year-old son, it was very like nerve wracking because my wife and I, we had a puppy and this puppy, we were like, oh yeah, he trained us, you know, to be parents. Of course, as if you guys are parents, that's totally wrong. <laughs> it's, it's way different to have a puppy than, than a child, obviously. And, and the way, you know, the amount of work that goes into it. But again, I leveraged a lot of my mentors who had kids already, tell them, hey, how is it? So, hey, hey, read this book. I read that book. And so now, you know, the books that I read that have helped me be a dad for one year uh, and will help me, then I'm going to share that success or those stories, right, to kind of just share back my experience. Hopefully that answers your question. That totally does. Thank you. And I, I loved the initial reaction over there that you shared where you're saying, uh, why do these folks want to help me? And I, and I feel like, oh, that just sounds like imposter syndrome again, right? It's like this idea that I'm unworthy uh, of, of support and help. And, I, and I'm so happy for all of my mentors, right? And folks who reached out and supported me, uh, knowing that I'm a person of value, you know? And, and, I, and I think that, that that's sometimes one of the hardest things to do is accept help um, and accept um, advice and accept support, just because you feel like you're the only source of support and help for others. Um, so I appreciate that point. Um, are there any other questions from, from our audience? And, and you know, Shauna, I'd love to also just kind of ask you too, in terms of mentors and support, uh, have you had that experience as well? Yeah, it helps to click the unmute button. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I've, I've been very blessed to just kind of run across people that may not have called themselves mentors, but just were that kind of guiding force or that person that was that I could go to with questions um, and, and making sure that I try to stay in touch with as many of them as possible in case, you know, something comes up. Um, UCLA was actually a really key, key thing for me in that because I... I didn't have a very diverse pool of people that I could go to with questions. And now I very much do. Um, I can, you know, at the drop of a hat now I've got, you know, a lawyer or a real estate agent or um, anybody that I can go to. And, and for some reason, <laughs> back to the investors, and for some reason they want to help me. Um, but it's, you know, that that's part of being a friend and they can come to me for things too. Um, and, and, and I have to remind myself that I have value to others um, and that they can come to me just as easily as I can go to them. So you also have value. It's not a one-way street to be a mentor or a mentee. It is yeah. definitely a two-way street. As a former teacher, I can agree. I, I receive as much as I give. Brizette, I'd love to, to love to hear your question. Yeah, so um, just hearing you guys talk about um, being worthy made me reflect a little bit. Um, and I think 
I noticed in the past, and this is something that I'm working on now, is like being able to express my needs to my employer and not feeling like I'm not worthy of doing so. And so I would just love to hear if you guys have any tips on how to get comfortable with that. And it's for either one of you. Yeah, I, I can start this off. Thank you for your question, you said. Um, so your, your question is around, you know, how to get comfortable with speaking up um, and requesting something from your employer, right? Um, and trust me, this is something that I had to learn, right? Because young in my career, I feel like, oh, no, like I'm not worthy of this, you know, like imposter syndrome at its finest. Um, little did I come to know as I, you know, obviously through different networks and, and relationships that I've had, um, you know, you are valuable, right? And so and, until you realize that point of what you can contribute to the table, and it's almost as if you can't shy away from it, right? So for what, what's helped me when I have to request something like, hey, I, I'm taking a month off because of personal reasons, right? And I don't know how it's going to be perceived, but this is who I am, right? This is what I need. Uh, and I actually requested that uh, a couple of years ago. And really what I brought up, I said, hey, this is my value that I add. And this is why, you know, I should be allowed this request. Uh, but I think what's really helped me is especially developing a good relationship with your managers or executive level management and then transparency as well. If you're transparent, communicate openly. I think we're all human and hopefully we all have empathy, right? And then they could they could understand as well. And I've had both. And I'm just like you have, I've had both positive and negative experiences with trying to bring stuff to management. Um, and, and in addition to what Opa is saying, it's absolutely the transparency, the honesty, the, the, the just putting it out there, but then not taking it personally, how they react, which is the hardest part of that, that if they're going to fly off the handle, like that's not, that's not you. That's not how you presented it. There's nothing that you could have done to keep them from doing that because you have a right to advocate for yourself and and no reaction of theirs should discourage you from doing that um all it should do is inform you that you're not in the right space for your growth right that's that's it um so at that point go to your mentor go to your friends go to your whoever so that you can get built back up again from whatever their reaction is but you absolutely have a right to advocate for yourself and have that conversation with them. Thank you so much, Brissette, for that question. And I, and I think, Shauna, uh, this idea that this is not the right space for you, we have a question in chat from R. Sanchez. What do you folks do when you are in a place where you feel like you don't belong? And, and I'm going to leave you to interpret what you don't belong means, because that, that seems a little loaded. You know, there are places, I feel like we belong in all places, but maybe there is a space that's just totally not designed for us or intended for us. How do you enter those spaces? Um, humbly, um, usually. Uh, I will usually for myself, I'll ask, you know, if it's a place that I've been invited into, why was I invited here? What can I share? What What is my authentic self in this space? Um, is it just to listen? Is it just to learn? Is it to speak to my experience? Is it to be a subject matter expert? Um, and then sometimes you're not in a place where you belong. You know, I've been in jobs where that I was not the best person for that job. Uh, they needed a completely different person. And having that moment of clarity that it wasn't a failure of mine. It wasn't a failure of theirs. It's like leaving a relationship. Sometimes it's not going to work out. And it's nobody's nobody's fault it's just not the right fit um and knowing yourself enough to not get down on yourself and just make the shift that you need to make for your your best purpose yeah I, I think the idea that I heard in the last session being comfortable with the uncomfortable right like there there has to be someone that might be the pioneer or the someone that's stretching and if you're that person, you know, you know, lean into your stretch a little bit more. You'll be okay. Um, Obed, do you have any other thoughts to our Sanchez's question? Yeah, just uh, following up with what Shana said, 
you know, there are certain situations where, you know, it's just not going to work out. Right. And it's not your fault or anyone's fault. It's just, there's a better place for you. Uh, but one of the strategies that I've used that have helped me when I have that feeling of, yeah, I don't belong here. Um, it's just truthfully being yourself, be yourself. Uh, that's what help, has helped me. And then um, find something in common. You know, I love to cook. And so hopefully most people have encountered, you know, we all love food. Uh, so that's kind of my entryway, talking about something that makes me comfortable or makes me feel at home, right? Then from there, you can, you will be, trust me, you'll be able to find so many common grounds and you're going to, you're going to feel like you do belong. And then you're going to add your value. But again, don't be afraid to walk away when you know things are not going to work out. Ultimately, what matters is your happiness and your mental health, quite frankly. And, and so I think you, you definitely need to know when to walk away and, and know when to go full strength. I'm loving this combination of just being open to the space, how it's being presented, finding this, the, the connections, the natural human connections you can make, and then, you know, stepping back a little bit and just saying, this is the space I'm in. Let me understand it a little bit better and, and move with it as best I can. And if it doesn't, you know, it doesn't speak to me, if it, I, I really find that I can't be my authentic person in this space, that there are other spaces for me. You know, and I and I and I, I love that response, Deborah. We we have our last question from the audience before I ask my um, two panelists to make a final comment. So before I ask Deborah to say her question, I'm going to ask Shauna and Obed to think about your most empowering moment when you overcame imposter syndrome to the point where you want to make everyone in this room know how powerful it is, how proud you are to have overcome a particular instance. So while that's simmering in your head, Deborah, what's your question? First and foremost, thank you guys so much. I'm sorry my camera's not on. I just prefer the internet connection to be stable rather than my face to show. Uh, but Roy, you actually asked the question. I, you actually alluded to what I was going to say. Um, because, I, I mean, there's so many different topics that I feel come to mind when, when we think about imposter syndrome. The first, I guess, part of the question I was going to ask was like, you know, what are best practices, right? When things don't work out, when our worst fears come to, to fruition, right? And, and we're not accepted and, and we feel like no matter what the work that we're doing, I mean, there could be multiple factors why something went wrong or went awry, but I think traditionally we internalize, right? And we're like, this is exactly why I shouldn't have gone for this. And this is exactly why blah, blah, blah. So really I wanted to know like, what do those moments really feel like? Because I feel like there's this arbitrary idea that there's going to be a Mecca, right? Like I'm going to get to this point in my career where I'm going to feel X, Y, Z, right? But it seems like it's an ongoing situation and maybe we're bypassing what those moments really are, like what those empowering situations are, because they're so minuscule compared to what we have in our mind. Um, because we tend to inflate things that go wrong and deflate our accomplishments, you know? Um, so I don't know if there's a question in that, but like basically Roy asked, <laughs> what has those moments felt for you, um, big or small? And how do you cultivate them even when, you know, things go wrong? Um, I, I, I hope that you guys talk a little bit more about like self-care in this component, because I, I'm horrible at self-care, even when I accomplish what I set myself out to do. Um, so yeah, it, getting some info from you guys would be amazing. Thank you. Amber, I think there was like 10 questions in that. <laughs> yeah, sorry. sorry. <laughs> no, no, this is, this is why we allotted the time. Shauna, Obed, these are your final thoughts now. I think Deborah just laid the groundwork perfectly for both of us. Uh, let's talk about self-care. Let's talk about what are those important and power, you know, powerful moments and how to seize on them and kind of allow the not so great moments, you know, deprioritize themselves. How do we, how do we do this? It fits and starts. Um, so self-care is very important to me, but also I don't do it consistently because sometimes I don't feel worthy of it. Sometimes I don't have time for it. Sometimes I can't. millions of things, right? Um, one of the things that is consistent in my life is that I have, I have a 
what I call a bullet journal, but isn't like a traditional bullet journal. Um, it's my planner that I get to spend 20 minutes doing art in every week if I choose. Um, and, and I'll put goals in and, and, and that will drive me to actually do the things like exercising every day that I know helps me be not only a better human inside of my body, but also helps me to be nicer to the people outside of my body, uh, all of the personalities around me and all of the personalities in me. Um, so yeah, I mean, be, being kind to yourself isn't always getting your nails done. Sometimes being kind to yourself is, is not working out today. Sometimes, you know, it's, it's having that moment with yourself to say, what is the kinder thing for me right now? Um, and I think that's true in, in dealing with imposter syndrome too, is what does success look like here? You know, if, if I'm, if I'm looking at, you know, doing a panel, not just this one, but any, any panel, what's the kinder thing for me? Do I have time for this? Is it going to fill my cup to talk about this thing? Is it, is it going to bring me too much anxiety to prepare for it versus not? Um, and, and just accepting whatever that answer is as a non-judgmental moment, right? It's not, it's not good or bad. It's just a decision. Um, one of the um, people that I follow that I highly recommend if you also struggle with anxiety is uh, Struggle Care. I think she's on um, TikTok and on Instagram and she's got a book out now. Um, but it, it helps kind of take the judgment out of self-care, um, which is really nice. Um, and then, yeah, success, like sometimes it looks like getting invited to a meeting. I got invited to a really cool meeting where everybody else on the call was, you know, executive directors and above. And I'm, my title here, it doesn't make any sense, but I'm a lowly specialist, right? So having a moment where it's people three levels above me inviting me into a space and caring what I think um, and not blinking at that, that yes, I'm the person that needs to be in that meeting to tell these people what to do. Um, that, that's huge. Um, but it's also, you know, two days later when I'm still thinking about, okay, did I work that right? Um, that's, that's where the imposter syndrome kind of sneaks back in sometimes. So yeah, it's, it's a moment by moment and yes, it is ongoing and yes, it gets better. And yes, it, it's like raising a kid. It doesn't get better or worse. It just gets different. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where I'm going to end it, which doesn't sound super empowering. I'm sorry, but also as you build your community, as you build your mentors and your mentees and your friends and your relationships, that's where it gets better because you're not alone in it. That's my empowerment moment, I guess. <laughs> uh, Shauna, I think that that was a, a brilliant answer. And I, I, I feel like, no, you, you have definitely filled my cup. I'm gonna use that, that term that you, with your response. So thank you so much. Obed, you have a, our closing thought. What do you think? Yeah. Uh, well, just uh, thank you everyone for, you know, the opportunity to be here. And I think that it was a loaded question, right? What does success look like and how do I manage self-care? Just off the bat, self-care, uh, I've learned to love my perfections, or what I think is perfect, and then love my flaws as well. Just embrace your yourself and know that everyone's unique, don't compare yourself to others, right? That's that's one of my biggest things. Always compare it to yourself to the version that you were yesterday and then every day just strive to be a better version of yourself. That's that's my motto now. Uh, and then what does success look like? Uh, a lot of things. It could be, you know, presenting to the, the VP of a Fortune 100 company and, and getting props for doing such a great job and great recommendation. But more in depth, I think what success looks like to me is actually accomplishing everything that I set my goals to. Uh, and then if I fail, picking myself back up and going a different path, but ultimately getting there at the end of the day. Thank you so much, Obed. I, I feel like what does success look like? It's having a panel of amazing folks like yourselves in a space dedicated to talking about a very important topic that I think all of us have experienced on some level. So I appreciate, again, the time that both of you have taken. Our, our best thoughts to Carol Ann as, as uh, she works on 
creating an amazing space for our uh, para athletes in a, you know, in a few years. And uh, thank you again, Heather and the EDI team for giving us this opportunity to present this. Again, my name is Roy Quinto. I'm part of the Fully Employed MBA program. And uh, I'd love to talk to any of you who are curious about FEMBA or any of the other programs like EMBA, Shauna's representing in the full-time program. Um, Elgar, I know you have a question. I'm gonna let the audience go. And if you'd like to stick around, I know our panelists have offered to spend a couple of hours in this Zoom room answering any additional questions. So, you know, you can ask away. Everyone else, I hope you have a great rest of your, your session. Jesse, I know you have some parting thoughts for our audience members before Elgar's question. Oh, thank you. Amazing. Uh, for those of you who are about to jump off the session, just a quick reminder, we'll be having a minority perspective starting and advancing a career in analytics at noon. The link is back in Engages, so I hope to see you there soon. If you'd like to continue these discussions, you can do so on the discussions board on Engages. And of course, we would love to have you follow us on LinkedIn and Instagram at UCLA Anderson. See you soon. Thanks, Jesse. And for all of you who want to stay on, Elgar, what's your question for our panelists? So, uh, I, you know, it actually kind of partially slipped my mind at this point. But it was I, when, as I'm listening to everyone speak about imposter syndrome, I kind of realize how large of a concept this is, right? Like it's not just feeling like you're not enough. Um, maybe it's just feeling like you don't fit in, right? There's an intersection between feeling like you don't fit in and not feeling like you're enough. And they kind of middle someplace. And so as I'm listening to everyone's story, I'm really present to the kind of the necessity and the importance of um, being able to kind of articulate distinctions so that you can take actions to kind of mediate the experience and the effect of the imposter syndrome itself. I've heard that in everyone's story to some extent. And so that's my walk away from this is like just being able to make a distinction personally about where the imposter syndrome is coming from instead of just being inundated with this generalized anxiety and feeling of not being good enough or not fitting in or not feeling like I'm a part of something bigger. So that was it. Thank you guys. Thank you so much, Elgar. Thank you everyone. Um, I appreciate all of you. Um, Elgar, we're gonna have you on your, our next panel. <laughs> it sounds like you have, you have, you have good thoughts too. Um, have a good rest of your morning, everyone. Hey, hey everyone. Um, thank you for joining for our first official installment of Embracing Diversity Week. So I'm Zoe. I am graduating in about three weeks, which is crazy to believe. And I'm the current um, EDI rep for our program. But since you didn't come here to hear about me, let's focus on our panelists today. And our session is called um, Starting and Advancing a Career in Analytics. And so our amazing, five amazing panelists will be joining us for the next hour to share insights into how they got where they are today and where they see analytics going. And I'm sure you all read their bios before, but I still think it would be nice to hear a quick intro from everyone. Um, maybe start with your name, where you work, and a fun fact. Actually, instead of a fun fact, let's do your favorite Thanksgiving dish, since that's coming up next week. Who wants to start? Yeah, I guess I can, uh, I can kick it off, and you, you can hear me okay, right? Yep. Um, so, Phil Irvine. Uh, Vice President of Audience Intelligence at RPA, which is a full service uh, independent media and advertising agency based out of here in uh, Santa Monica. So we're, we're basically on point for all uh, audience research and audience development activities for all uh, digital media and offline media for uh, clients that we support. And my favorite Thanksgiving dish, I, I love just about everything, but my mother made the greatest macro, layered macaroni and cheese probably ever. So it's, uh, it's something I actually still have her ship out to me whenever, whenever I can, even though we're, we're apart now. But uh, yeah. I probably shouldn't have asked that because it's lunchtime and I feel like we'll all be hungry. Um, Angela, do you want to go next? 
Sure. So, um, hi, my name is Angela Baltes. I work for um, APEI, which is American Public Education Incorporated. Uh, we are the business unit of uh, three colleges, Rasmussen, Alejandro's College, and American Military University. And so I am the senior research analyst in strategic analytics, and we're going through a lot of great changes. We're looking to expand our analytics. We're going to be that we're going to, we're establishing an analytics center. So we build a lot of great Tableau dashboards. We, um, we're working on machine learning models to really predict um, uh, student retention. Um, we're looking at some maybe marketing focuses and things that other departments can use, uh, things geared towards students and faculty engagement and really um, how to improve our, uh, our services as a university system. And as far as uh, Thanksgiving, I love stuffing. I can eat so much stuffing. It can be good stuff or it could be the stuff that comes in the box. You just add water. So uh, yeah, all the carbs. <laughs> I love carbs. I second that. Carbs for me too. Um, next on my screen, I see JJ. Hey, hey Zoe, hey everyone. Thank you for having us. My name is JJ Espinoza. Um, I work at Amazon Web Services as a um, senior architect, cloud architect, uh, focusing on artificial intelligence and machine learning. I've, uh, you know, through, through my career, I've mainly been in media and entertainment, uh, working on machine learning, data, data analytics. Um, I've also been a you know, leader of data science teams and worked at several media entertainment companies. So, um, yeah, I really love AI, cloud-based uh, machine learning stuff. It's it's uh, it's fun, and uh, but Thanksgiving. Okay, so I I have a lot of favorite dishes, like like people said. But my my top one, my top one, is something called naca tamales, and uh, in Central America, uh, we make some tamales, and they are not like the regular tamales you've probably had. Like they have everything. They have meat, rice, potatoes green pepper. I mean, they're giant. So those things are a full meal in and of them themselves. Uh, so, oh yeah, someone's saying they love naca tamales. Yeah. If, if you guys ever get a chance, like it blows all other tamales out of the water, like hands down. So that's my favorite dish. Awesome. I'm going to look that up. I'm sure there's somewhere in LA that makes it. There has to be. Yeah. Okay. So Danielle, oh yeah, I see Danielle. Do you want to go? Sure. Hi, my name is Danielle Robbins, and I lead the digital analytics team at Capital Group, an asset management company. Uh, there, my team is responsible for typical product analytics as well as enablement. So we get to house ourselves in between working a lot with uh, our IT partners, as well as doing traditional product analytics analysis. And I've been there for a little over two years. Uh, everyone has said something that I really enjoy to eat because I just like eating all of the food for Thanksgiving. But uh I will say that uh, I am missing my grandmother's uh, sweet potatoes or yams, depending on what she uses. So I'm looking forward to having that again in the future. Awesome. And last but not least, Leandra. Hey, I am Leandra Gonzalez, um, based in LA. I work at an advertising agency called W Promote, Nell Segundo. I'm the director of data analysis. And our team oversees all of our marketing science initiatives for our client portfolio. Um, and it's weird to announce that I'm still at that company because I'm actually having another job next month. I'm gonna be at Microsoft next month on their analytics, advertising and insights group. Um, but if anyone's interested in, in, interested in W Promote, I still highly recommend because they are an amazing company. Um, in terms of my Huh. In terms of my favorite Thanksgiving food, I, I, think, I think Angela stole mine. I really like stuffing. Um, but, you know, I'm a basic Midwestern girl and I actually really love deviled eggs. Um, it's a basic dish, but it's so good. So I'll say that. I'm surprised we didn't get any dessert answers. I guess I'm the only sweet tooth in here. Um, so awesome. And so basically how we'll do this is I will ask a question and then everyone can answer or one person can answer or just a couple people. Uh, if you don't have an answer, you can definitely pass. And 
Yeah, I think actually how we should do it, let's break it up into two parts. So the first half, we'll just talk about more like where you are today and how you got there. And then the second half, we'll focus more on like where things are going and what you see the future of analytics be. Does that sound good? Okay, so first question. So does anyone have a less traditional path to analytics? Maybe you didn't even study it in school and then you ended up there. Angela, do you wanna share? So my bachelor's degree is in criminology. Um, looking back, it was data-driven, but in 2008, when I graduated um, with my bachelor's, there was no such thing as, I never heard of data science, data analytics, that wasn't a, a buzz at the time. So um, I got my degree in criminology and then I pursued public administration um, and really fell into data analytics in 2012. Um, just because I saw a job and it sounded interesting. Never studied it in, in specifically, so uh, very non-traditional. Um, and then I got a degree in information technology around 2014. That's when I started working in the field. So I was not a CS student, not a statistics student. I found this by accident. I have a similar um, sort of origin story. My undergrad, undergraduate was in music and business. So um, I thought I was going to be a performer, a violin player for my life. And then I realized that um, that's not easy for one. And then for two, um, my business courses, I really took a liking to. And the interesting thing was when I was deciding on my major, it was between actuarial science and music because I was always a huge math fan. So although my undergraduate wasn't technical, um, I did do an internship with the Ohio Department of Insurance as an actuarial science intern. Um, and that was sort of my introduction to more technical stuff with statistics and um, programming. And then it was later on when I went to graduate school where I was exposed to even more technical stuff. Um, and I just found that the jobs that honestly used me more were the ones where they needed someone with quantitative skill. Um, even when I tried to go into the creative route, I was usually the one they were asking for, you know, an analysis type work. So I just kind of embraced it and fell into it by accident as well. Yeah, I, I was going to say, um, I'll, I'll piggyback on the, the last point she just mentioned. Um, so I'm a, I'm a full-time uh, Anderson grad from 2009. And I, you know, I think what was interesting is I always had a vision that I wanted to be a, a, in some type of general manager type capacity. And um, when marketing concepts and marketing kind of careers were presented to us, it was the perception that I had was that it was purely a creative field. And what I found over the last nine years, um, I've basically carved out a path working in uh, different facets of marketing with a focus on direct to consumer um, type marketing. And kind of the way that I fell into analytics in my role right now is I found that, you know, with each step, data is such an integral part with the development of whether it's uh, a campaign, a commercial, a creative spot. It's, it's interesting because my perception completely flipped from it being purely, you know, a creative field where people just have that natural ability where uh, now data and research is so much a, an integral part of the conceptualization of, you know, ads in the way that you message to consumers to drive revenue. And uh, that's really what, what has piqued my interest and led me toward uh, the path that I'm on uh, right now, so. Awesome. Yeah, I, go ahead, JJ. Oh, ladies first, you go ahead. Oh, I appreciate that. Um, I would say, I guess my path is technically non-traditional because I am a biomathematician by training, uh, but I work in digital and lead very technical teams and do a lot of analytics. Uh, uh, in my path, I thought I was going to be a professor and did a postdoc, did all of those things and was really into building models on data that you have to build yourself. But I, under, I understood the importance of data and how it can, if you understand data and 
understanding trends, you could tell a lot of different stories. And so I, by happenstance, ended up in marketing analytics and went through a, was taught a lot in my first two years about the importance of kind of feel what you're saying, the importance of how marketing is not this, just this creative space anymore. It's a very, it can be a very technical space too. And it really opened my eyes to, oh, I could have studied some different things in college beyond just math. I could have done a lot of uh, a lot of other different courses. So while I have the math and stats background, I was definitely not applying it in the way that I do now and I have for almost the last 10 years. So I, I will say that there are multiple ways, as you can see from all of us who've spoken just now, and I'm sure JJ is going to share a really interesting view too, to get to uh, the space of analytics uh, in different in different fields within within corporate. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think like, uh, I mean, when I was just starting to, when I was just in college, I had a professor kind of tell me, hey, if you, you know, study computers and math um, and you like that, you're going to have a pretty interesting job probably for the rest of your life. Uh, whether it was like you were, you know, sending people to the moon in the 60s or like all the stuff that we're doing now. So for me, I, um, I really like the business part of it. I, I studied at UCLA, uh, double major in math and economics. And the reason I got the math degree was really because I thought, um, at least at the time, it was a really good path to a PhD program. I loved all the modeling, all the public policy, like how, you know, what are the best laws to, you know, kind of pass to help poverty and, and all these great things. And, um, and, but then I also, you know, wanted to make, you know, some money. So I took a bunch of banking classes and finance classes and right in 2007, 2008, you know, the campus was full of like all the consulting companies, all the investment banks, people were getting offers. I think Phil's nodding his head, right? So, and I was like, oh, this is going to be sweet. I'm going to be an economist. I'm going to like work in like, I don't know, investment banking or something. And then 2009, no one was recruiting at all. And I remember sending out like, you know, hundred resumes or something. And cause I was like, oh, I'm in, you know, cause, cause of what I studied, but none of, none of the stuff, I not none of the stuff, but met most of the classes and the way I was tailoring my resume, no one was hiring in banking at all. There was like a huge uh, financial collapse, but I had this math degree and uh, they hired me to do some programming initially at a, at a startup. And I really just kept applying my statistical knowledge wherever I went. I went into grad school uh, still with the idea of, hey, I'm going to be an economist one day. Um, but, you know, I always focused on the, the numbers portion of, of solving business problems. And uh, I, honestly, uh, programming, I had to take one programming class at, uh, for my math degree. Uh, I couldn't stand it. Uh, it. It was literally like my lowest grade. And uh, in the whole, my whole, my whole, my whole, I do it for like a living now. I just, did, just didn't think I had the right, um, it was during summer school. It was like, it was just tough. Everyone had taken programming classes before me. So like the teacher was like, oh, everyone's taking programming. I'll just skip all the introductory stuff. And of course I fell behind. I didn't like it. Turns out like I've taught myself five or six different programming languages over time, really used my math skills and took an, taken advantage. And I've still used a lot of my economic and financial skills that I learned to put all of those kind of analysis, not just as something cool to do or something fun to do, but hey, how does this translate to like an outcome or a business outcome? That's really helped me in my career. So yeah, just piecing all these things together, learned along the way and, you know, enhanced what I've had and uh, I've had fun with it. So I think I think you all are in a great spot with the degree you're getting there, UCLA Analytics. You're, you're going to, things may change in five or 10 years, you're still going to be using a lot of the stuff. That, that That's the way I see it, that you learned there. That's awesome. So like, despite everyone's different backgrounds, it sounds like what you had in common is kind of a quantitative base. Um, so what skills would you say that you need to have like when you're starting versus what skills can you learn as you go? How specific, how, uh, I guess I could, I be back, sorry, since I just finished talking, let me kind of jump in. So initially, right, when you're starting out, you're probably going to be an analyst somewhere or, you know, senior analyst somewhere if you have a master's degree, right? In, in that situation, um, there's some key fundamental things you probably, if you're going to work with data, you probably should know. You should probably either know like SQL, right? Like to just pull data from databases, Python. Those are like really tactical things, right? You just got to be able to do that. Like it's come almost like table stakes when you're coming in, like know how to pull data, know how to graph it, know how to chart it, analyze it. Um, those are things you're definitely going to have to do. I think part of the things you, that you'll learn uh, that's very hard to teach uh, in school is just how to apply those to whatever industry you're in. 
There's a lot of knowledge from senior executives, a lot of problems that have been solved before. Uh, and you may only have a glimpse of them in school, and that that's normal, right? Uh, they, they can't prepare you for every single nuance of every single industry. So that's something that I would say, you know, as you get in and you're, you know, writing code and pulling data and doing analyses, you know, truly, really, really try to learn and and about the industry, even you know, looking at the financials of the industry. How does your company organization make money? Where its cost, basic stuff like that, can go a long way for, you know, as you as you grow in your career. I think it'll be very helpful. Yeah, and I would add to um, along with the basic coding and um, learning the business when you're there. Being curious, I think, is something that always makes a really good analyst. Um, asking questions, I, I, I'm always I, I co-run an early career program training program for analysts for an, a data analysts at our company now. And one of my favorite things is that they ask questions and they ask they're asking all the things that you might have forgotten to ask because you've been working someplace for so long. And I, I just think that curiosity is so, uh, it, as a, to be a good data analyst, it's something you need because you'll, you'll keep asking the next question to go deeper, to really pull out that insight that could make the difference in the business. And if you pair that with learning the business while having your key coding skills, uh, your key kind of, you know, you take all of the academic courses that you're taking, it really can make for a really cool career in analytics. Yeah, I think um, uh, the curiosity point is a, is a is a really really important one. I think you know, with my team that I manage, and with um, so in our structure, I manage our audience team. We also have a team called Research Analytics and Insights. And you know, the thing that I that I see that separates people is is that curiosity, but also um, the notion if 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 you have a hypothesis and the data doesn't support what your initial hypothesis or story that you're going for says, you know, how do you go about pivoting what your narrative is or how you communicate what the data is showing? Because my philosophy is, is regardless of what the data is showing, there's always a story or some type of takeaway. And I think a lot of, you know, people when they're early in their careers, they just get stuck if the data doesn't support where their, their head goes. And so the ability to be flexible and the ability to, to pivot and change your narratives or what the you know the objectives are of what you're what you're working on. I think is a it's a huge thing that I that I perceive that's been a differentiator for people, especially when you're first starting out in your careers too. Yeah, yeah I would say to add to what Phil and Danielle and JJ said earlier, um, comfort with ambiguity is something that I think you're just going to learn. Um, I'm not sure if if I don't think you can really learn that in school just because um, obviously to learn the fundamentals, you have to have some guardrails, but in the business world, um, things aren't always, you know, sliced and diced so pretty. The data is not always very clean. Um, the business challenge that you're trying to solve might have various requirements and the assumptions of a model that you're using might not necessarily jive with those those requirements. And so just being comfortable with not knowing something initially, I think is very important. Um, but you will learn that over time with experience. I would like to uh, also add, so with the ambiguity is something I found is that um, a lot of the times leaders are looking for you to answer questions for them. So they, they'll sometimes to say, just go find answers. And so that ambiguity and being curious um, and also being really uh, self-motivated will take you pretty far in this field. And you'll, as you um, progress in your field, you'll build upon that, you'll get better at it. And you'll just, you'll have these questions that once you look at a data set that you'll want to start to uh, answer yourself and you'll bring to leaders, have you considered this? And they'll go, oh, that's interesting. So uh, yeah, being comfortable with that ambiguity, being comfortable with being self-motivated and really being curious is, uh, is what this field's about really. Those are all good points. Like despite the MSBA being a technical program, it's still in the business school. So it's definitely important to have both, you know, the coding skills plus like the business acumen. Um, do you, so I know there are like two different paths with, analytics. Some could go and stay down the technical 
route and be like a data scientist. Can you talk about what roles are more on the business side where you're working more on strategy um, versus like the technical ones where you're in SQL or Python all day? I mean, I, I guess when you get more like at the managerial level and director level, of course, you're in, you're dealing more with strategy, you're, you're a partner with your stakeholders and helping them make uh, decisions. But I always stay in SQL <laughs> and the ability to, to code here and there. I mean, it's one of the ways that I help train my associates. And also, I'm curious and I want to know what's going on in the data as well. Um, but I do think as you... Um, kind of move into those spaces, or if you go into like the data governance route, um, those become places that uh, you're working closely with the business and still uh, in helping and helping make decisions. But I think in the data science ecosystem, you'll still always have a technical component because even if you're not programming day to day, you'll wanna know the latest technologies, you'll wanna know the latest approaches to how to solve a problem so that you recognize, okay, this is a good algorithm to use, or no, this is a good technology to bring on to, uh, to the company to use. So uh, I think it's, I think it's definitely relative. Um, so I don't think there's like a one size fits all answer. Yeah, I was gonna say, you know, I I know one thing, um, Zoe. I know we wanted to touch on was kind of what's what's what are the trends like? Where is analytics going in the future? And I, I guess you know, an observation that I've seen is. When I, find of, when I first graduated, a lot of kind of analytics departments seemed like they uh, kind of operated in a silo and they would maybe support a finance department, a marketing department, a sales department, and they would just kind of get pulled in, you know, after the fact in like planning sessions for those departments or maybe to measure uh, uh, campaigns or activities from a, from a post kind of campaign perspective. I think what What's happening now and, you know, not to plug RPA here, but, you know, the way that our group sits is we sit right in between our strategic planning uh, teams and our investment team. So uh, strategic planning is basically all of the activities with figuring out like what types of creative spots do we want to put together to promote a product, a car or, or, you know, or whatever. And then investment is the actual media buying activities. So the people that are uh, you know, buying the programmatic media or paid search or social and whatnot. And we sit right in between that whole process. And I, I just, you know, not just at RPA, but what I've seen at other agencies and other brands, um, you know, that that core skill set of data science and analytics, it's being asked to be a part of a lot of these upfront, you know, strategic and planning types of activities. And that's why I'm a big fan of this, you know, this career path. And I see where there's going to be more and more opportunities to leverage that, you know, those, these, these core skill sets in to have a greater impact on how a company evolves from a, a strategic perspective. So, Yeah, agreed. I think like, I think it wasn't like that, you know, 10, 12 years ago, it's definitely accelerating. I can, I can tell, um, I think if if you're if you like the technical path, but let's say your passion isn't uh, like what I, I do a bunch of technical things every day, but I also work with folks. I mean, I, it was the same when I was at Facebook, which um, are kind of selling the services that Amazon is selling, right? Or, or or trying to get other companies to utilize some cloud technology, artificial intelligence technology. So a lot of them are business focused and they're kind of on the front line explaining this to senior executives. And then what ends up happening, it was, it was the same at Facebook. Um, they may need help. They may say, hey, I want to implement this for our company or I want to build a multi-touch attribution model on AWS or some sort of marketing ad tech stuff. Um, can you guys help us? That's what our team does. So then our team will jump in there. But many times, especially as you start getting more experience, um, they may bring me in early in the conversation because although the, the folks uh, that a lot of them are business and engineering skills that are like the, on the account teams and their goal is, you know, a little bit different than mine, but their goal is to, you know, drive adoption of our services. There may be some, uh, you know, a Danielle and Angela, Leonardo, Phil on the call, and they're going to be a leader of, in data science. And they're going to ask maybe some tougher technical questions so then they may have me on, on, on the call, right? So I feel like I'm in a spot where I can kind of go to more of the leadership portion or more of the, or stay on the technical track. 
but there's definitely a lot of roles for people if you don't, you know, want to, you know, code in Linux all day. There, it's and it's expanding a lot more, right? If we were having this conversation way back, like like I mentioned, like in the fifties, when people like te- people like us were probably working like in NASA or something, you know, we'd probably be in a back room doing some engineering in a corner somewhere, important work, but uh, we wouldn't be like at the table where things are happening. But that's that's changed. That's which is great. And this is actually a great segue into a question I received in the chat. By the way, if anyone has any questions, feel free to just drop them in the chat and Freeney's monitor, monitoring them. So someone asked, so not everyone wants to go into analytics, obviously, but for those who um, want to work with data scientists and analysts, how best can they communicate with you and collaborate and you know, ask for their needs. Um, Cause I know sometimes like the communication can be a challenge cross functionally. I, 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 can, I, I could probably jump in on this one too. Um, so um, I think there's different ways and different types of, of, of trainings you can do to help. Commun- I took Toastmasters classes, right? When I was an analyst, I can get additional public speaking skills because it goes both ways, right? It's it's the business communicating with the technical and the technical communicating with the business. It has to kind of go both ways. But I'll say if, if you're looking to talk to engineers and, you know, really learn uh, some of the ways they that they work, some of them are like called Scrum or Agile. You know, you may want to look into like product management courses. There's like a product school that'll teach you how to like wireframe ideas, which is like create websites, uh, yeah, like fake websites that you may want them to build. Um, you know, there's ways to, they work, tend to work in sprints. They tend to have this very structured way of working to deliver products. So just kind of understand first, like the way that they work, how they do their day-to-day job. And uh, I think that that can go a long way. Also, I think if you just frame it in your, like the business problem you're trying to solve, you know, what data you have, you know, um, that, that can go, it all starts and ends with the data most of the time. So what data you have, what variables you have, I would start with that and then tell them, I want to improve this metric. And then I think everyone will be speaking the same language and then kind of let them worry about, you know, the algorithms or whatever that is. You, you don't have to go too deep into that because that's their job. But if you give them the data and here's the objective, I think, uh, I think that, that that'll go a long way, you know, for you in communicating with uh, technical folks. Yeah, I, I mean, I think uh, I think JJ summed, summed that up perfectly. I I guess you know back to the curiosity theme that we were speaking out before. Um, you know, one thing that I've found that's helped me to be successful with you know building relationships with with team members and other functions at companies I've been at is is taking an interest in their world and what they're working on, and then why you know they're they're prioritizing certain activities or pursuing certain things. Like I. I found when you when you kind of can, you know, it, you want to make it authentic, but if you show that you have a legitimate interest in kind of their world and why they're doing what they do, um, they'll be more likely to reciprocate, you know, whatever needs you have or projects that you're trying to, you know, get off the ground or to complete it. You know, this kind of delves into just, you know, how to how to form good cross functional relationships, but. That's that's definitely kind of a tactic that that I've used with the multiple roles that I've had, where I've had to work, you know, with all types of cross-functional teams in the past. So, awesome. I so we just passed the halfway mark, so I just want to ask one more question in this half, Um, and that is, what is the biggest challenge that you had to face, either in your role or in your career progression? Um, that you feel comfortable sharing with us? I can share, um, actually. Uh, So something I have experienced in pretty much every company I've ever worked in has been when leadership does not necessarily align with what we're doing in analytics. Uh, Sometimes uh, leaders have been brought in that have very little experience with analytics or have a completely different objective. And uh, so we'll we don't align. So we're, we still need to do the work, but they have their own thing that they're trying to do. So that's been very challenging. And that has come up essentially everywhere. 
So um, having a champion on your team that's still pushing your work forward uh, is really, really helpful. And it's challenging when your leader on top is wanting to do things that are different, that adds more work to your, uh, your agenda that doesn't really help the company. I would agree wholeheartedly to that. Um, every place that I have done analytics, you, you definitely face that. So it definitely, you have to learn and build your skills of influence and, and hitting all of the different people who will help make that decision. And sometimes it takes two, two years to get something across the finish line that uh, is pretty, to, to folks like us who are analytics people who are reading the numbers, it, it's pretty straightforward. But I think that um, to Angela's point, that comes with the territory. I, I think most of us have faced it at multiple companies and it's not losing your resilience and, and, to, keep, and to keep pushing. And then understanding, making the decision of like, when it's worth it to keep pushing versus when it's worth it to just kind of, you've played it all out on the line, uh, put all of the information out there and to just let it go. That can be really, really difficult when you know something is definitely the right answer. Uh, it's an approach that would help move things forward, but being okay with having to just let it be placed to the side for, for a bit, because sometimes, uh, most times it does come back and, uh, and you're able to move forward with the project. But uh, I think at, at points in time, due to the leadership, it can just be business at that, at that point in time and one person's vision for, versus another person's. Yeah, that's right. And yeah, I, me I remember presenting uh, a project at a, at a company I was at, and it was kind of like, no, we don't no, we don't think that's the right answer or the right way to go. And then um, I wound up leaving because uh, I had another opportunity. And then someone else came and found that work in some deck somewhere. I was like, who did this? Who did this work? This is like, we should have done this. I'll bring that person. They're like, oh, he's gone. And then I got a phone call later, like, hey, you want to come back for like a manager position here? And, and I did, right? So, wow. you know, there's don't give up on ideas that go far. Um, you know, or, but uh, one, one thing I need to do. Sorry, was there like an idea? Oh, you're muted, JJ. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, so one thing that's a challenge in my world is really like um, there's a lot of uh, data and analytics. Um, there's a lot of value there, right? And uh, because my title is, is focusing mainly on artificial intelligence, I'm like on a subset of that and on a specific area. And there's a lot of hype around, you know, this area. And uh, I think a, a lot of times my job as uh, someone who's like really kind of understands the technology to do this is uh, when you should not use uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning and just, you know, maybe you get a lot of value from doing a query or, uh, you know, just doing a, the, doing a, a table account, a summary, right? Uh, if then statements, uh, logic, right? Uh, so uh, that's one of my challenges where I need to kind of, uh, I, I, many times people will come with problems that are like, well, AI can solve all of this for us. And uh, I always ask, you know, are, is, your, is your data set up? Or is your data pipeline set up automatically? Or, you know, are you, you know, do you have analysts who are running SQL and doing these other fundamental things, right? You need all of those things set up. So sometimes that sets up uh, some leaders for uh, maybe some um, disappointment sometimes, but uh, it is the right thing to do, right? You want to get the fundamentals down of data analysis before you go beyond. So a lot of times in my job, uh, when they call like Amazon or like we need an AI ML expert, it's probably someone that has some some insane idea, uh, for lack of a better words, that uh, that is a good idea. But maybe, you know, um, we can make it happen. And sometimes sometimes we can't. And sometimes, you know, there's better ways to do it than AI ML. So. I would echo what pretty much everyone else just said, having that buy in from leadership. Um, my current job at W Promote honestly was probably the first company where I didn't experience that so much anymore. Um, but I think it is very prevalent in, you know, several industries that are trying to adopt um, quote unquote AI or more advanced solutions. Um, but I would also add that for me personally, something that was very 
challenging for me more so earlier than is now, but it's still there is just general imposter syndrome. Um, I do still have a bit of that, but I think it's something you get kind of comfortable with and know that there is a bit of normalcy around it. Um, and to add on to that, something that I struggled with earlier on was being afraid to look like I didn't know anything by asking questions. Um, and then I learned very quickly that asking questions is like the best thing ever because people have answers sometimes, which is awesome. And um, if they don't, you learn that you're not the only one. So it's it's nice to ask questions. And um, I would say that if you do feel imposter syndrome, you will get used to it. It's almost like riding a bike or something like that. Um, we have a question from Kim really quickly. If you want to answer for those who are encoding heavy roles, you tend to have a long working hours due to running different scripts and encountering issues. And we're just curious about the work-life balance and data analytics. I can absolutely start that, answer that for you. So um, I, it really depends on the company's culture. There are some companies in which it is expected that you are working 6, 7 p.m. And the company I work for at 4.30, 5 p.m., you better log off and go enjoy your, your evening or your weekend. We don't work weekends. We don't take work home. But other companies I've worked at, that was absolutely the expectation. Um, I think that you can gauge that type of thing in the interview. Um, ask what's ex expected of you. Um, and I've been able to avoid some companies in which that was the culture by you know, gauging uh, respectfully that type of thing in the, my interview. And if you are expected to work long hours, it does not get better. So uh, if that's not something you want, you may want to avoid a company like that early. Yeah, I agree, especially for something like coding. You, you, you can effectively code. I mean, you, you probably think you can 60, 70 hours. It, 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 you, it, you're, you're not productive in the last 10, 15 hours. Something so intellectual, you need those breaks. So um, definitely I work, at a, I, I, I work at a company that's known to be super fast moving, right? And there's a ton of work in where we do. So one of the things is, uh, you know, see in the interview, you know, how you can um, influence timelines, um, how involved you'll be in the decision-making and timing of work that, that, that needs to be done, right? So that people are not laying, uh, you know, any, any uh, deadlines uh, on you that may not be reasonable. Another thing I posted in, in the chat was, um, especially if you're doing a lot of coding, um, you know, try to start building a library for yourself. If that's a, if that's a, a place you want to go and stay in, build functions, build libraries, build cheat sheets. Uh, there's a bunch of them online. I have a bunch of things in a GitHub repo. And many times when I'm faced with the same problem multiple, multiple times over and over, I just use that same code. I've used certain pieces of code at like four or five different entertainment companies and people loved it. It's standard code that I've used and uh, solves like marketing problems or other kinds of problems. And, uh, you know, I tweak it a little bit for my use case and it goes a long way. So if you see that you're being asked to do the same kind of thing, uh, generalize it, you know, use your coding skills to abstract it, make functions, you know, make tools out of it for yourself. Uh, that will help uh, go a long way. Uh, I automated most of my coding job when I was doing my master's degree and I bought a ton of time. And then I went back to my employer and I was like, I bought all of this time. Can I show can, you guys want to hire other people to run these tools I built for you. And uh, I reduced my time greatly at that, at that company by, by doing that. So you have the tools for automation and coding. So use them for yourself too, not, not just for the company. And I would say set your boundaries early so that um, you can maintain that work-life balance. Don't get caught in uh, just the constant coding, uh, the constant coding and the constant work because your name is not on the building. Uh, so you should have some balance. And, and JJ, I, I wish I, there were times that I ended up in, I, in a deja vu in coding because like, I knew I did this. 
someplace else. Why did I not save it? And so that's the best advice. I wanted some of the best advice in coding uh, that I, I hope that you guys take him up on that because there have been many a times where like, I know I wrote that function at this company and I wish I would have brought it with me. And I of course can recreate it, but look at all the time you spend recreating the work that you've already done. So uh, I think everyone thus far has said, all the things that you can do to make your, your career in analytics even more successful by figuring out the company that works best for your work-life balance, setting boundaries, and using your own work to continue to drive your, to drive your own agenda uh, wherever you choose it, wherever you end up at. Okay, speaking of coding, another good question popped up in the chat. And so that is, do you think analytics is an inclusive field? And can you and people from all identity groups show up as your authentic selves or is there code switching um, or any other ways that you're expected to change to like fit into what already exists? I, I've experienced that before where I felt like I had to be a little, you know, maybe not be my authentic self. Uh, but over time, I've just gotten more comfortable in, in my own skin and in kind of the value that I bring. And, you know, I, 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 I'd i say that what really helped, too, was um, some of my time at Facebook. Facebook is a very, like, bring your authentic self to work company. And um, that really helped shape some of my thinking. And I, I do the same at Amazon. I mean, I just try to be myself because it's it's way less tiring to be you know, one way at work, speak one way at work, act one way at work, and then be a different way at home. I just try to try to be myself. And the way I see it is, you know, if, if, if that's not, you know, good enough for the department or the company, then, you know, it's probably not, not for me, you know, not, not for me to be there. Uh, you know, if I can't talk about my nakatamales or, you know, random, <laughs> random Dia de los Muertos stuff that I'm doing with my family, if that, that doesn't get any responses or the people look at me weird, then, then that, that's probably not the place I'll be. But I'll say in the beginning, coming from, you know, like inner city, Los Angeles, and not, not really seeing people like myself, I, I did feel like I kind of had to try to fit in. But, you know, I would say, try, try to be yourself, because if the people are not there to accept you for, for who you are and what you're doing, it's, it's not it's not the spot for you. Yeah, I mean, uh, in my experience, I, you know, I haven't seen, um, you know, differences in the reception for inclusivity based off of just like the analytics function. You know, I think you, you see it, you know, company to company, they have different emphasis on diversity and inclusion. I, I've seen it more through that perspective versus just analytics specifically. But I think, you know, to big piggyback off of what JJ was saying, I, as I've worked at, you know, like eight plus companies in my career, Definitely the ones where I've been able to be myself and, uh, you know, inter and had better interactions and better team dynamics with, you know, the immediate teams I either was working with or managing, uh, the happier I was and the better my performance was at those companies as well. And so I guess, you know, the biggest thing I just want to implore is, you know, as you're going through this journey as part of your, your vetting process, you know, you know, Angela touched on you want to try to get ahead of the, the expectations from a workload perspective. I think another huge piece is, is getting a feel from a culture perspective with these companies that you're going to. Just because a company has a huge name and a huge brand presence doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be happy and you're going to thrive there. I think really you know, getting to know the people, not just the work, but on a, on a personal level to some extent, is, is almost just as important as you navigate through your career path and make different decisions to figure out, you know, where you want to go with your career site. I, I think this is something that's it's extremely important and is, and is a key determinant with, you know, not just how happy you are, but also your, your performance as well, too. Yeah. yeah, I think those points are great. But I will say, though, um, there is still like uh, not a lot of people who look like me in, in certain roles. And uh, so sometimes that can make it difficult to, to want to bring your complete self to work. But as JJ says, as you get close, as you are in your career longer, you feel more comfortable, you know that you're brought into a role because people know that you have the skills to do the job. 
And while there might be a little bit more questioning uh, in some of your results from the start, as you continue to prove uh, your value, um, you become the, the go-to person. I, I will say like some of that uh, is also down to, we have to build better pipelines to ensure that that diversity and that inclusion um, and, and be intentional about it. And it also goes back to the previous question about, are you gonna be coding all night? This is what Phil said about culture. With the company, when you're interviewing, asking specific questions about things that are important to you, looking at the looking at the values of the company, um, what are they putting out there uh, about if DEI is something that is you know to your core, looking and seeing what is their company policy on this, and asking them how to how are they going about meeting their goals. Uh, I do will say that senior leadership across most corporations is still a still a problem to, of for diversity and having senior leaders who are making those decisions on, on the board. So that's, I, I think that's industry agnostic, but I, I do believe like you see all of us here on this call. I mean, I think we're moving in the right direction, but there's still, there's still opportunity. There's always opportunity uh, is how I, how I feel. But I, I think there is a place of where I definitely feel more comfortable uh, being exactly who I am uh, and sharing my my vision for how I see analytics, but also how I see diversity playing in analytics at, at my current company. But that was a part of their culture. And I knew that from the start. Yeah, I want to add to some things that Danielle said. So in my experience um, at my current company, I'm the only like ethnically diverse executive in tech. Um, which is, I don't think is unusual, um, but that's still a problem. And before I was hired, I think I was the only like black woman in the tech group period um, until we recruited some more folks. So um, I would definitely say that inclusion is something that many industries are, are still working in, but especially within tech. Um, in terms of having to like code switch or anything like that, I don't think I have that, like, I don't feel like I have that necessity, but there are other things that I am very cognizant of. I'm very hyper cognizant of my hair and how it was presented. I'm very hyper cognizant of the fact that, you know, I lead a team and as a black woman, I wonder if things that I say are received as aggressive or if things that I say are received as um, incorrect or less correct than being given the, the benefit of the doubt if I weren't a black woman. So as Daniel mentioned, I think there is sort of like, at first there's like a little hump where you have to almost overprove yourself because you're not given that benefit of the doubt up front. But once you've proven that, it, it's fine, but the fact that you have to is also a little troublesome. But I don't say that to like discourage anyone because um, as JJ mentioned, you do kind of find your, your place and you get comfortable in your own skin and you're not really concerned what people think. But the fact that it's an extra layer is to me unacceptable. This is a great segue to the last part of our panel, and that is like the future of analytics. I have a lot of questions, but I want to be respectful of your time, so I'll try to keep it to just one or two more. And that is, so you mentioned a pipeline. I mean, what can we do to encourage more people to pursue um, a career in analytics? How can we build that pipeline? I mean, I think it starts in elementary school. I have a four-year-old. Um, I'm always talking to him about coding. He asked me about my job. He's like, mommy, you code? I'm like, yes. I, I might not be able to teach you how to do anything with in the kitchen, like cooking. I'm not a good cook, but I can teach you how to code. And I think that's, we have to start with the kids and getting them interested and not scared of math. I, I remember as a kid, when someone's like, oh, you're good at math. Oh, wow. Oh, you know, you hear people say so they talk about math. They talk about all the technical stuff and they get scared. Take away that fear. Like, and you start now and you go into all communities and you take away the fear of thinking analytically, thinking in a, in a different way. And I think that's where it starts. You build those, build those connections 
at a very young age and continue to build it out, have go back to high schools, sponsor programs, partner, partner with groups like Nesby, uh, who has Nesby Junior and has competitions. We have to encourage those type of things so that we have a pipeline of folks going into the, the analytics. Uh, now that we have analytics degrees, we didn't have them when I was an undergrad, but uh, pushing them, to, pushing people into this, into this field because you need diversity of thought, right? And diversity of thought comes in so many ways. Of course, it comes through ethnicity. Because of course, it comes through race, but it comes through different locations and different perspectives of growing up in the Midwest versus growing up in the East Coast. So like that is, I'm very passionate about this, as you can see, but uh, like that is my thing. You start young, I feel like, and give opportunity to everyone. Yeah, that, I mean, that is so, so what's, super, what's super interesting about what you just said is, uh, I'm leading a subcommittee at RPA right now to improve our diversity recruiting. And we're exploring all of the things you just touched on. And I think the bit, you know, one of the biggest things you said is, is, is exposing, uh, you know, kids early to this field, because I think classically, you know, our, our organization, we've had diversity recruiting efforts, but we've tried to, you know, uh, uh, catch people once they're graduating undergrad. And I think with this field, because there's still not complete clarity, I think, to younger people about the impact that analytics has to a business, um, you know, exposing them to that earlier, you know, maybe even early in high school. So we're exploring a lot of these things like partnerships with some of the local schools, um, conferences, organizations, and things like that. I think the, you know, the other piece that I'm, I'm also passionate about is, you know, once you bring in diverse, you know, candidates and talent, like how can you uh, provide uh, mentorship and coaching to elevate them to these executive and officer level type roles. I think that's that's another piece, you know, just from my experience, I've seen efforts along those lines. I haven't seen a lot of success with companies that can follow through on that successfully. And um, that's another thing we're also exploring, like how, you know, how do you bridge that gap from, you know, the people, you know, people that are very talented, but then elevating them so that they can be in leadership positions. Because one thing that I, you know, I try to preach is, you know, once you have somebody like us that's leading a team, you know, you just have a different mindset and you're more open to bringing in inclusive environments and because of your experience. So um, yeah, that's just another component. I think that's just extremely important too. I would love to add that uh, given that I come from a non-traditional background, I think we need to move beyond looking for computer science and statistics majors or as being the only ones that will be successful in this field. On my team, I've, I work with history graduates, the best coders ever. I've worked with psychology graduates, excellent coders, excellent logic, great work. Um, I found that you can have, uh, you can be good at this and have studied things that people don't consider data science. So um, we should be looking for really helping students to build those skills um, that are, that's beyond just those few majors. Okay, I wanna hand it off to Freeney to close us out, but before we end, with 10 seconds each. So from the outside looking in, it looks like you guys have everything figured out, but I'm sure you still have goals and ambitions. So what's next for you? I, I want to buy some real estate and get some passive income and use my analytic skills to do that. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the honest answer, right? Because ultimately the, these jobs, uh, they're exciting. You know, there's a lot of great work, but there's also a lot to do outside of, outside of work. So I'm really big into like financial independence and try to build, you know, generational wealth for myself with the good position that, that I've had. That's really, really important to me. So as I, I Although I'm very committed to my job, I would say I'm not, you know, doing the hundred hours like I was when I barely started to feel like I had to prove myself. Now I'm going to take some of those rewards and really, you know, put them into some passive income. Oh uh, yeah, Jay Zillow needs some help with that. Yeah, P ping me on LinkedIn. I, I got, I got, I got a, I got a patent actually for some real estate technology I'm working on. So working on some some side hustles on the side because you can't work forever. <laughs> That's really my next thing. Uh, well, my next thing, I, I agree with JJ. I am 
building out my portfolio, definitely. Um, but I really am interested in trying to train the next generation. Currently at my job, the rotational program that I co-manage, I'm doing that part-time with my actual full-time job. And so I'm trying in, in the process of trying to make that a full-time rotational program at my company, as well as building out different community opportunities to learn more about data science, to learn more about coding, to bring it to, there are a lot, lots of great groups already, but there's still lots of communities that are under, underserved and I wanna serve them. I can go next. Um, but I do wanna caveat, I do not have everything figured out and that is completely okay. <laughs> Um, and I'm, I'm feeling a little bit more comfortable with that actually, rather than try to strictly plan everything, um, like have a plan, but have some flexibility in there. Um, for me, obviously starting a new job next month. Um, I just got married a couple months ago. So my husband and I are trying to plan out what our future might look like with maybe children or something. And so, um, that more than likely means leaving LA um, for us because it's expensive here. And um, I'm, like I said, I'm from the Midwest. I'm basic. I don't need a lot. I just need a home that I like. So um, buying a home, uh, maybe having a kid and honestly relaxing a little bit. I've hustled a lot in my twenties um, to get to where I am. And now I, I don't want to like be lazy, but I do want to enjoy life too. So um, maybe doing some traveling and uh, just relaxing. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'll disclose, I just had a baby, so I'm a brand new mom. And for me, I just, I'm really starting to enjoy life. Uh, I've been focused so much on career. I'm still going to work, still going to be in analytics, but now I'm starting to focus on what's life like after 5 p.m. and uh, hiking and doing playing board games with my husband and the baby well when she understands that so I'm trying to live and I don't have it figured out yet I guess I'll uh, I'll bring us home here um, <laughs> I also I definitely don't have everything figured out um, I guess what's next for me you know I uh, I'm in a really interesting spot in my agency. I'm helping to grow a practice, but um, uh, I, I've i always had, you know, side creative entertainment interests. And this is going to be a shameless plug, but I just launched a podcast for our agency called Clear the Air. And I'm excited about it. It's focused on highlighting uh, leaders and marketing and advertising, but we also are going to be touching on a lot of topics like this, like diversity and inclusion in not just the advertising space, but just in general for a corporation. So um, I'm hoping that can serve as a mechanism to have more of these types of conversations and, you know, inspire, you know, more of the younger people to pursue fields like this and, and others in, in advertising. So that's a, a big thing that I'm excited about. And hopefully you all can subscribe to, to boost our numbers a little bit and make me look good too. <laughs> Great, great. Well, thank you, everyone. And I want to give a round of applause to our panelists and our moderators, Zoe. Thank you all did great. Um, any questions that you may all have um, reflected about the program, please feel free to reach out to us, you know, in terms of what we learned today. There's so much content in terms of ambitions or mantras and where you guys are going. You guys are just amazing in terms of what you're doing. And hopefully we connect again. And thank you all for joining us. Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today for our fireside chat on the topic of inclusion is the key to future growth with our esteemed MFE board member, Gina Sanchez. By way of introduction, I am Dr. Lisa Turkowitz, the executive director of the MFE program at UCLA Anderson. I'm proud to share that ever since I joined the program about a year ago, there have been quite a few new initiatives underway to help diversify our student population. It is no secret that there's a dearth of students in finance and then even less within the quant space with a diverse background. Our MFE program is committed to doing whatever we can to help support moving the needle in the right direction. We are honored to participate today as part of Embracing Diversity Week, 
with today being the culmination of a week's worth of impressive programming to support diversity, inclusion, and equity across Anderson. I am incredibly grateful to offer today's session in collaboration with the Fink Center for Finance with Professor Laura Santikian at the helm. Dr. Santikian is a professor of finance and strategy at UCLA Anderson and the faculty director of the UCLA Fink Center for Finance. She holds a BA in economics and applied mathematics from UC Berkeley and a PhD in economics from Harvard University. Prior to joining Anderson, she was on the faculty at the USC Marshall School of Business. At Anderson, Lori has won the Citibank Teaching Award as well as the MBA Teaching Excellence Award and the FEMBA Teaching Excellence Award. She teaches core business strategy and electives in valuation and data analysis. She also teaches corporate finance at UCLA School of Law. Um, before I pass this along to Professor Santikian, I wanted to make a housekeeping note. So uh, we're gonna have a moderated session. And at the end, if you have any uh, questions, we'd like to address them. If you can just send your questions directly to myself or Professor Santikian in the chat, we're happy to read those on your behalf and share them with the group. Uh, so at this point, I'd like to pass it along to Professor Santikian so she can share more about our true guest of honor today, Gina Sanchez. Thank you, thank you, Alyssa. And welcome everybody to this really exciting day um, celebrating leadership and diversity. Diversity in finance in particular is an issue that is near and dear to many of us. And we're just so incredibly fortunate to have a conversation today with a trailblazer in this field. Gina Sanchez is the CEO of Chantico Global, which is a consulting firm based here in Los Angeles that specializes in customized asset allocation solutions for a diverse set of clients. Chantico Global was spun out of Rubini Global Economics in 2013, and previously Gina was the Director of Equity and Asset Allocation for Rubini Global, Global Economics. Prior to joining Rubini, Gina spent four years as an institutional asset manager, serving at the California Endowment, which is a $3 billion Los Angeles-based foundation, and she served there as its Managing Director of Public Investments. She was also at the Ford Foundation, a $10 billion New York-based foundation, where Gina served as the Director of Public Investments as well. In both roles, she was responsible for making asset allocation and manager selection recommendations for all external public managers, including both total return and absolute return strategies. Gina has spent over 11, uh, 11 years on the asset management and banking side prior to that. She was a portfolio manager and strategist for eight years at American Century Investment Management in Mountain View, California, where she ran over $6.5 billion in assets under management. She also worked in emerging markets research at J.P. Morgan in New York. Uh, you might see Gina as a familiar face because she's a contributor for CNBC. Uh, she was also a recipient of Institutional Investors 2009 Foundations and Endowments Rising Stars Award. She also serves as trustee of the Los Angeles County Employee Retirement Association and as an advisory board member to our very own UCLA Master of Financial Engineering program. Gina holds a bachelor's degree in economics from Harvard University and a master's in international policy studies from Stanford University. Wow, right? Gina, thank you so much for, for joining us. And you know that's quite an impressive background. Could you walk us through it um, in a little more detail? We'd love to hear your story just from the beginning, where it all started. Okay. Well, thank you. Whenever I hear it, even I'm like, wow, who is that? That's amazing. But um, <laughs> you forget very easily sort of the path we take. Um, and so it's always nice to reflect uh, on it. You know, I, I am, I'm from South Texas. My parents were teachers. My family was in China, Nuevo León, and I was going to and from Mexico uh, to McAllen, Texas, across the border where I was going to school. And, you know, it was, I was a child of two worlds. Um, and also, I think, you know, one that South Texas is a very poor area. And so I didn't really know how poor I was, <laughs> if that makes any sense. I, I uh, when I went from South Texas to Harvard, 
it was an adjustment um, on many levels. The, the first was that I realized sort of where I landed in the spectrum of wealth, and it was a uh, you know a bit shocking just how many layers there were above me. Um, and I didn't feel particularly poor, so I was, I was fine with it. Uh, but you know, I didn't feel deprived. Let's put it that way. And um, but the the other was that I came from an area that was primarily Hispanic, actually primarily Mexican American, not even just broad Hispanics, just really just Mexicans, and. You know, I went from there to a fairly diverse group of, of people who came from very different backgrounds and very different perspectives. Um, you know, but the other thing that I very quickly figured out was that I also came from kind of a different uh, a different education system. <laughs> and so the first year, I think, at Harvard was really kind of spent playing catch up. I, I probably... Uh, went to as many tutors as one person is allowed to hog up in terms of resources <laughs> at Harvard in my first year to sort of catch up to where I needed to be. And by the end of my freshman year, um, made Dean's List. But it was a little overwhelming that first year, just sort of figuring out, you know, my path to success, let, let's call it. Um, and just the fact that everybody just looked and act, acted so different from what I was used to, that was a little challenging as well, sort of learning how to conduct myself. Um, that sort of social capital was probably the thing that I would say was the most awkward for me. You know, catching up intellectually was just a matter of persistence and effort, but, you know, figuring out how to act was a whole different ball game. Um, and so that was, I think, maybe the most, the, the biggest challenge for figuring out where I was gonna go in my career, because I didn't even know how to act in an office. So that was all new. You're on mute. I am on mute. You would think two years almost into this, we, we would have that down. Um, so you mentioned sort of um, you, you were catching up in a lot of ways, but your inherent skills were so strong that, that you could have succeeded really in any field. So what, what drew you to finance? Why specifically did you choose to pursue a career in finance? Well, I mean, I think, honestly, I made a fairly pragmatic decision. You know, I, I had a lot of interests, as many, you know, young students did at that time. And, um, but I sort of felt like I was, you know, on a trapeze without a net, which is to say that I couldn't really afford to, to fall. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I looked at my skill set, right, the things I feel like I was going to be good at. And I looked at sort of the skill sets of things that, that you got paid for. <laughs> and I looked for the intersection of those that gave me the best opportunity. And, and while that may seem fairly, um, uh, fairly shallow, the reality was, was that if I had some kind of a career crisis doing something in the nonprofit world, for example, which I think I would have enjoyed, I didn't have the luxury of having anyone to be able to bail me out. And so the difference between sort of me and real poverty felt very close. And so, you know, you make decisions based on that. Uh, and that's what I did. I, I made that decision. But one thing I never did was I never let it define me. Um, and so even though I became a portfolio manager at 28 years old, I became a VP at 31, you know, I'm, I've launched my own company. Um, you know, I've done a lot of other things as well. <laughs> so, you know, I serve on nonprofit boards, um, Save the Children. Uh, I'm going onto the board of Cedar sinai um, Education, healthcare, child welfare, are all things that are very important to me. And so I find ways to give back um, and do that. I have financed and produced films and documentaries. And so, you know, I feel like you do what you have to do to survive, but it doesn't define you. And so, and so when you think about diversity in finance, and this is something that, that you've, of course, felt as you have advanced through the industry, but maybe even more so um, after you launch your own firm, you know, I think one of the things that, that we don't discuss enough is the business case for diversity, sort of why, you know, what, what are the, the clearest benefits of, of workforce diversity for the performance of financial firms? Why don't we start with that? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I lived the experience um, and then later on did the academic research to sort of, you know, understand. But uh, intuitively, um, I I understood this, you know, the one of the greatest challenges that we as human beings will fall into is groupthink, right? So you hire people who are fairly similar to yourself, who think like yourself. And I think um, there's a great quote that says, when two people always agree in business, one of them is unnecessary. Mm-hmm. And, and the reality is, is that, you know, it's in places of discomfort where we grow the most, but learning how to create an environment that is collaborative, but also puts us in, into moments of discomfort for the purpose of growth. Mm-hmm. It's challenging as a leader, as, as a as a business business leader, as a team leader, as a manager, to be able to manage that because it means that you're going to have someone who plays devil's advocate um, in, 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 in the process to sort of poke holes in your thinking. And you have to be open to that. Um, and, you know, I think the, 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 the value of diversity is exactly the experience that I went from South Texas, where everyone was Mexican American, everyone had a fairly similar background in terms of, you know, who their families were, where they came from, what their jobs were. And then I went into this whole new group of people who came from a lot of different places. I learned a lot of things very quickly. And I also realized how much I didn't know. And that piece maybe was even more valuable. Um, learning what you don't know is going to be anyone's greatest strength um, because that tends to be where your weaknesses are. And so figuring out what you don't know about a problem, putting together a business plan, you know, if you're a budding entrepreneur, having somebody poke holes in your business plan and say, did you think about this? What about that? Um, all of those things, as uncomfortable it is in the moment, and it feels like they're attacking your plan, they're valuable. And sometimes they aren't, there's no merit there (laughs) and you can, but, but there's value in hearing it, absorbing it and coming to that conclusion because you actually gain even greater kind of confidence in your own perspective by opening yourself up to other perspectives. And, you know, the, the case for diversity has been shown at the board level, it's been shown at management levels, and it's been shown across across sort of the corporate culture um, that that higher levels of diversity result in better operating uh, um, uh, better operating companies, higher profit margins, and so we've seen it in t- you know empirically. But I'm kind of speaking to the human case as to why that is. Um, it's because we just, if, if we're not careful, we get lazy as human beings and we begin to, to get comfortable um, with ourselves, our perspective and our background and how we got there. We forget that there are a lot of other, other perspectives. And if you're in the business of trying to solve a world problem, you have to be open to a lot of perspectives. <laughs> right. So sort of the, the importance of diversity of thought, which comes from various sources, but very importantly, diversity of backgrounds, because otherwise you end up missing things, right? If you only see yeah. things the way that everybody um, sort of, if everybody in the group only sees things in the same way, they, they might have very important blind spots that that um, could lead to a competitive disadvantage. And you Absolutely. mentioned that- and I'm gonna add to that if you, if I could just um, interrupt your, 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 your flow there for a minute. I would also say d- diversity of experience. I think one of the biggest challenges we have, and one of the reasons that I, that, that we, whether we want to or not, end up continuing to kind of create further inequality is that we continue to build products that only service people like us. And when you don't have a diverse experience in terms of someone who actually understands what it's like to um, be under be non-banked, someone who understands what it's like to not be able to own a cell phone and be able to get along in today's economy, um, someone who gets out of jail, who understands how hard it is to get a job and set up your life, all of those perspectives are those are entire groups of unmet needs that represent entire economies that are not being serviced because the problem solvers are solving their own problems and they're not taking into account all of the unsolved problems that still remain out there. 
Right. They're just unaware of them. Right. Right. Um, and so you also pointed out helpfully that that there there is a lot of data that that does show that um, performance is not sacrificed. And in, in some some cases, performance is actually better when you have diverse teams. Would you say that these benefits are recognized widely um, across firm leaders within asset management? Well, it's funny you say that. Um, even the way we talk about this subject has always kind of been an annoyance to me. <laughs> the notion that we have to prove that diverse management results in outperformance pre-assumes that white management by definition is better. Mm -hmm. I have never seen, by the way, a study that shows that white people outperform. I have never seen that study, but it is a broad assumption we make. And the point that I've always made is that most of those decisions about diversity are not questions about somebody like me. I graduated from Harvard. I graduated from Stanford. You know, I became a portfolio manager at 28 years old by virtue of, you know, pedigree, persistence, et cetera. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a problem. The problem lies in all of those sort of non-thinking decisions that we make, who we decide to sort of make a leadership, you know, give, give a leadership role on a project or who we give, you know, uh, an extra bit of work that becomes more visible um, within a company. Those decisions tend to not be made with a lot of real big thought that goes behind it. They tend to be sort of these natural decisions that you kind of come to. And more often than not, those decisions are biased. And the thing is, is that you will end up taking a flyer on some of these people because, you know, they're young. Who knows who's going to be the better project manager? The point that I'm making is that, you know, we should have the same opportunity to fail as we have to succeed, right? Mm -hmm. that, 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 that sort of the opportunity set should be equally distributed at all levels. Um, because when that happens, people rise up that you never expect. Uh, and, and that, I think, is is the importance of the conversation that we have here. It isn't that we have to prove that we're better, it's that we have the right to fail. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and by doing so, failure leads to success. You know, everyone who has ever succeeded in a really meaningful way has done so by taking a tremendous amount of risk and by failing at moments in their career. And it is not a sign of, of, of success. If you're not falling down, you're not, you know, becoming better. That's the reality of, of, of risk taking, right? It's very easy to take a low risk perspective. But the problem with poverty mindset is that we're designed to take that low risk perspective. We're designed to sort of not take chances. Um, the, the biggest thing for me was to actually take all of the money that I had made in my career and risk it into another entity. Mm -hmm. Psychologically, that was the hardest thing for me to do mm -hmm. um, because I know what poverty is like. So <laughs> I fear it a little more because it actually is something that's very, that's very specific. I'm sorry, my motion sensor doesn't seem to think I'm here. Um, so, um, you know, so, so that's, that's, I think, you know, the, the, the biggest challenge that we have, especially, you know, young um, folks who come from a minority background that become successful early in their career is, is being willing to risk that. In, in many ways, we're not designed to do that. Um, and in many ways, the sort of uh, establishment still looks for proof that you will be successful. Mm -hmm. And I still think we're having that conversation with the wrong tone and at the wrong kind of level. <laughs> That's a great point. And so, and I kind of wonder, um, so we often think about coming from these underrepresented backgrounds as possibly being something to overcome, right? Um, but when we think about strategy, including just business strategy for firms, it's really all about harnessing uniqueness, right? Something that is different about you. Um, about your firm and what you do or how you do it. And that's your competitive advantage. So if we look at personal strategy um, through that lens, do you think it's possible for diversity itself to, to become a unique competitive advantage? Kind of that, that source of differentiation that can help an individual um, leverage sort of differences into advancements in their career. And what, what might that look like? Well, and yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the reality is, is that we are looking at um, a demographic kind of situation that is ticking like a time bomb. You know, by, by 2045, we'll, we will be a, we are expected to be a majority minority nation. There will be no more majority 
uh, racial makeup in the United States. Um, and that is to say that, that, you know, parts of the population, particularly the Hispanic part of the population is growing very fast. And, you know, anybody who understands marketing and understands populations understands that that perspective is becoming more and more valuable. Um, you know, but I, I, I do also think that, um, we need to harness that uh, in terms of the power that we have as a population. And I don't think we do enough of that. Uh, I'd say that there's so much more room to sort of exercise, you know, the, the, the strength of, of the numbers um, that, that come with us. Um, as part of LA County Employee Retirement Association, I particip- you know, we participate in a number of collaborative um, efforts. Um, and one of them was following the passage of SBA 26, which required um, women to be added to California-based corporate boards. And what we found in 2020, it was passed in 2019, what we found was that in 2020, uh, 113, I believe the number was 113 women um, were a- awarded new board seats. Um, and out of those 113 women, 100 were white, eight were African American, two were Asian, and one was Hispanic in California, right? And so it just tells me that that there still is not an acceptance that this population, which remains largely underserved and underspoken to, is still out there, and we're not figuring out how to have that conversation at leadership levels. Um, and, you know, I think that the, that moment will likely come very quickly and suddenly rather than as it should, which is <laughs> slowly over time. Um, but I do think that it, that that reckoning will come. Um, and I think that it's just incumbent, incumbent upon all of us to be ready um, to have product and business and, and, you know, meet the opportunity. Mm-hmm. And so and so it's a great point. And even before um, um uh, our, our students get there. So if we think about young talent just getting started, what do you see as the as the biggest hurdles or barriers that underrepresented groups face today in pursuing successful careers in, in finance? And ha- have those hurdles changed over time? Do you, is it different now than than when you first started? Um, well, I'm going to go back to the original question, which I I don't think I answered. The original question you asked and talk about it in the scope of this question, which is how is diversity an actual positive? One of the things that I have found um, is not only the the demographic movement, but also more often than not, um, and this isn't the case as much today, I would say this is probably more the case when I was young, um, more people from diverse backgrounds also tended to come from impoverished backgrounds. So that actually isn't the case today. We actually have made an, uh, a number of strides in terms of, of increasing the socioeconomic diversity within minority populations. But the point that I was going to make there is that when you come from a challenged background, you are by definition gritty. You are forced to be persistent in terms of what you do. And I think that that, that's probably what defines most of the success in my career is just persistence and grit. Um, And that is always welcome. That kind of hunger um, is always welcome. I think the challenges um, that exist today are the same challenges we had before. And it's one that I faced head on, which was that kind of component of social capital figuring out how to gain that social capital um, ahead of time. You know, we've seen, I I sit on the uh, board, on an advisory board for the Hispanic Scholarship Foundation. And what we find is that we can take equally uh, matched candidates, but a candidate of color versus a a candidate who who is Caucasian, they may be equally matched. Um, The Caucasian will often get the job in an interview by virtue of, of presentation and how they fit Um, into the culture of the organization. And so that sort of aspect of of kind of figuring out um, uh, that 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 social capital is important. But in doing so, it's also really you have to be careful not to lose yourself. Right. In trying so hard to fit in that you sort of lose everything that 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 makes you who you are. Right. Mm -hmm. And and that is the worst version um, that I've seen happen, which is that that somebody completely loses their culture. You know, in a lot of ways, I still don't quite fit in. I still am sort of a little quirky in the boardroom. And um, 
one of my fellow board members just sent me a gift. It was a T-shirt that said no filter. And, um, and at the end of the day, he said, you know, Gina, I've just decided to accept you for who you are. And, you know, you can get away with it when you're an outperformer, but you can't always get away with that. And I think we all have to figure out how to be our genuine self, but also figure out what are the components of that social capital that you really need so that you can get the job or so that you can have the opportunity. Um, and I think that that hasn't changed. I think that was always a big challenge to most you know, kids who were coming out of South Texas or who were coming from Arizona, who just didn't have the same background. And they're being interviewed by people who have a certain expectation of how, you know, achie high achieving students act and present. And, you know, that bias is really fixed sometimes. And we have to fight against that. Right. Um, that's a great point. You know, social capital is really one of the key barriers really in all fields for advancement. And, and we often see women and underrepresented groups right now sort of having more opportunities to enter the industry um, because there, there is a greater awareness of the sort of benefits of diversity, but many of them um, don't end up staying. Right. And, and it's harder for them to we, we just see fewer cases where they they advance through through the ladder. So it seems like social capital or something about the support system might be lacking um, for. Yeah, the, yeah, it's mentorship and sponsorship. And there's a difference between those two. Mentors are people who give you advice. Sponsors are people who will extend their capital to you. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think more often than not, and a, a lot of my career was actually made with the benefit of sponsors, people who said, I think, you know, you need to be a portfolio manager and I'm going to help you get there versus people who are like, well, if you want to be a portfolio manager, you should work harder. Right. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, you know, <laughs> so I, I, I feel like. Um, like what we all kind of have to figure out is um, where and who would be our natural sponsors. And, and we have to take a light touch with those. Right. We have to sort of not overutilize those because I think one of the other things that comes when you, when you come from sort of a background where you don't have a lot and someone offers to help you, I think it's also, you have an inclination to, to, to kind of overly use that as well. And I think there's, you, you, the value of that diminishes over time. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it's figuring out a sponsor and then figuring out how to recognize the opportunity for, for when to ask for, the, for, for that help. So that, that's an excellent point, distinguishing between mentorship and sponsorship. And even mentors are, are very hard to find, right? Sort of um, initiating an effective mentor relationship is a challenge. Initiating an effective sponsor relationship where someone is putting themselves, you know, more on the line for you, that, that seems even harder. Can you offer any um, practical kind of uh, uh, pieces of guidance for how to achieve that? How do you, how do you, do you just wait for someone to approach you that probably isn't going to succeed, right? So how do you proactively um, and delicately try to initiate those types of relationships? So, you know, it's funny, I'll, I'll be honest, at the beginning of my career, I didn't necessarily, I wasn't as aware of that. Um, but what I found was, you know, I'll tell you a little story. It's a story at the very beginning of my career. When I first got to J.P. Morgan from, from uh, Harvard, um, you know, I went through the training program and then I was assigned my first seat uh, on the Emerging Markets uh, Local Currency Debt Desk. And I was covering Mexican local currency, December 1st, 1994. And December 19th, 1994, the peso was devalued. And on December 20th, it went to free float. And they announced that I didn't get to go home for Christmas that year. So, um, but, you know, I had what I would consider a really, really low level job. Money markets were considered, you know, a, something that you give to a junior analyst because what can go wrong in money markets, right? <laughs> well, well, let me tell you. And, um, and, and, the thing about my job is that although I had like literally the lowest job in the totem pole, I actually had this belief that my job was important and that if I didn't do my job, someone would miss it. Someone would need that information. And I went to work with that same kind of belief every single day that my, my little cog 
in this giant machine was super important. And if my little cog screwed up, the whole machine would break down. That wasn't the case, but it was honestly what I really believed at that time about the value of my work. And I, I was incredibly efficient with it. I automated all of the spreadsheets. I, you know, I interacted with the programming team and like literally like over the course of a year, you know, became like, like the queen of money markets. And when the crisis happened, the, instead of bringing a mid-level, a mid-career and sitting them on top of me and letting them manage the crisis, they actually let me run with the crisis as a very, very young person. Mm-hmm. Not because I had tons of experience, but because I proved to them that I cared very much about this job and I was willing to do it at a very high level, even probably higher than it was probably worth. Um, and I was assigned higher and higher positions. And I think I gained my mentorship and sponsorship just by virtue of, of really believing that what I was doing was very important and taking that work, work ethic to, to work with me every day. And I found that when I have tended to approach people to offer my sponsorship and mentorship, it has tended to be people who, you know, I had this one, um, this one analyst I hired right after the great financial crisis. And he had been working at, um, IndyMac, which, you know, was just a mess after the great financial crisis. And, you know, we had this conversation about, you know, him, his background, et cetera. He was Korean, parents owned a donut shop. Like you, you really couldn't have written the script better. And, um, but he came to work every day with a smile and we had some real shit days um, in, in 2009 and 2010, but he came to work and did his job. And I can't tell you how much I appreciated that, that even when times were tough, he was like, how can I help you? <laughs> and you as a manager want to help people like that. Um, you know, it, it, you just naturally, it becomes part of, you know, just your empathy. Um, and, and I just tend to find that, that um, um, rarely have I been approached to say, hey, will you be my mentor? And has that resulted in a long-term successful relationship? But more often than not, um, I have met people who have managed to demonstrate just this incredible empathy, this incredible work ethic, or um, they're just good. They're good people. I find that ultimately at the end of the day, you know, when you're a good person that comes back to you, it may not come back to you immediately, but it does come back to you. Mm-hmm. Um, so step number one is do your job very well, take it very seriously and um, mm-hmm. perform Don't be a-, a jerk. Right. Exactly. <laughs> be, be someone that, that, that people want to help. Right. Um, so if, if we think about sort of um, sponsorship, mentorship and, and, and also allyship, right. Do you have any advice for, for how to cultivate those relationships? So, you know, how to strengthen mentorship or sponsorship relationships with members of the overrepresented group? Um, so men mentoring women and, and acting as allies and, and, and advocates. Um, is there, does that look any different in terms of how to achieve yeah. that? I will I, I mean, in some ways, no, but the point of allyship, I think is a really good one that you're making because one of the things that I've always striven to do when and where I can is to try to help and advocate for people. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, Sometimes there's more often than not, there's no immediate benefit to me. But what I have found is that over time, that value can be very valuable down the line when your careers have gone in opposite directions and you are looking for that first investor and somebody basically writes a check for your company. I mean, I literally have that story. Um, My old boss actually is an investor in my company. And, you know, that those kinds of relationships um, are valuable, but, you know, when, when we parted ways and, you know, he needed a recommendation into his PhD program and I was happy to write it, or, you know, you need a phone call to someone because you're trying to get a client or you, somebody's, you know, just gotten laid off at their company and they're looking for another job. You will always have opportunities to help people. And I say, always, always, always take an opportunity to help someone because you just never know 
when that becomes you you build really strong relationships when you can do that um, mm-hmm. um and you know it's this very easy thing to do um more often than not um that i think more people should take advantage of of you know those opportunities they look us in the face every single day mm-hmm. um and i see so many people who walk by those opportunities Um, and you, you lose an opportunity to grow your network, to deepen your relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so, you know, I have certainly tried to do my part with many people, people I know, um, that I have worked with, that I have worked for, um, that I have hired over the years. Um, and, you know, I think that, that building allies is really about looking for opportunities to be helpful to each other. And I think if everybody did that, the world would be a better place. Right, right. And it's 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 so true. You know, it, it's 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 easy to think about helping those who are ahead of you, um, and it's easy to overlook kind of helping those who are coming after you. And it's it's so important to be doing both. So it's an excellent point. So you know, on the so you, you mentioned that sort of your your choice to enter finance was um, both the the intersection of what your interest what you were interested in and what was practical. Um, this many years into your career, um, and given the, the the heights that you've reached, uh, what makes you passionate about finance now? So you know there there are still hurdles, right, for for underrepresented groups and women um, to enter and, and to especially succeed within finance. But even in spite of the, these hurdles, why are you optimistic on the industry, and why is it worth the the uphill climb to to play a role in finance? No, the the thing about you get to a point in in your career where you have the opportunity to observe problems and attempt to solve them. And there is something, I think, just incredibly. That to me is why I keep doing this Mm -hmm. uh, every day, is that I still think that there are problems left to solve. I mean, I'm in the process of of actually spinning out and launching my second company um, with, by the way, a PE check that is coming from one of my interns Mm -hmm. (laughs) that I hired many years ago, (laughs) who is actually writing a check into my new company. Just on your point of you never know who's going to be helping you in the future. Um, And and. The opportunity to build that company is serving a need that I think that I believe I have identified and I believe I've identified a solution to in the in in the industry. And there is something incredibly it's very empowering to feel like you've solved a problem and that when you present that solution to people, they're like, oh, that's a good solution. You know, I could have used that, (laughs) you know, last year. And, you know, I I think that that. the business itself has taken a significant shift. And I can't say that it's because of the pandemic or not, but there certainly is um, right now is probably the best time I would say to be a female Latina founder of anything um, Mm -hmm. at the moment. Uh, I actually attempted to bring this company, uh, um, spin this company out in 2015 and it just basically landed flat. I had the worst, you know, VC rounds, you know, people. I walked into the conversations and I had been discounted from the minute I sat down. Um, whereas I'm walking into conversations today and people are interested in what I have to say. And it changes the tone of the entire conversation entirely from the very beginning. Um, and it gives you a greater opportunity to succeed. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the the I think the the reason that I'm optimistic is that I actually think that there's been a sea change in terms of a the notion that that investing with emerging managers, diverse managers, is something that you do, and that it causes you some kind of you know uh, a sub subpar return. That notion is being dispelled, mm-hmm. um, and the notion that investing in diverse kind of a, a diverse workforce, um, that, that 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 notion is valuable, is being embraced by more and more and larger and larger institutional shareholders. 
and they have an impact over time. I would say that the next 10 years are going to look very different from the last 10 years in terms of, you know, how we move that needle because we've got meat and that needle still has to be moved. You still have less than 3% of assets uh, being run by minority man by minority owned managers as a, you know, a statistic, one of those terrible statistics. Um, and, and that I think is probably has the best chance of changing um, over the next 10 and 20 and 30 years um, resulting from the impacts that we're seeing now. Mm-hmm. And I can tell you personally that I feel them. I feel them in the way that I'm able to fund this company that I wasn't able to, to do so mm-hmm. four years ago, five years ago. Right. Well, thank you for, for, for sharing that story as well, because, you know, it is when, when, and you also made this point, but when, when we see someone so successful, um, we, we often overlook that they, they probably had sort of trials and tribulations getting to that point. Um, and so can sort of having, having more of a struggle with fundraising a few years ago, uh, was, was probably a challenging point. And I sort of wonder, you know, did, did that, did those challenges, uh, impact you in, in any way? Did they change how you do things? things? Or um, did, did you feel that uh, sort of the market isn't seeing what you see? Did it have an impact? Um, you know, I think that it, it was frustrating at the time because I don't actually think the need has changed. <laughs> I don't think anything's changed. I just think that the willingness to listen to me as a person, pitch an idea is different. Right. Um, and and so but what that experience, you know, sort of taught me was really that I just had to be as prepared as possible. You know, I mean, I, I think that that you you go into these situations, sometimes they're a David and Goliath situation. And, um, you know, I'll tell you one thing I did learn is I went into that experience with no anchor investor. Whereas I basically, instead, this time around, um, socialized the idea, and then I got an anchor investor. And then walking in basically saying, I already have money. Do you want to participate? It's a different conversation. Right. Um, and, and so, you know, th- there was an element of that as well, it, which was just learning how to tap the network. Yeah, that's a great point. We, we, we have a couple of questions from the um, from our participants, uh, two anonymous questions. So one, um, what have you found to be the most effective way to speak with people who have the mentality of things have worked this way for a long time? Why why change them? Well, yeah. <laughs> um, so it's interesting uh, because I do quite a bit of consulting to a whole span of viewpoints. I sometimes have those conversations pretty regularly. And, you know, what I find works more often than not, um, you know, with somebody who's entrenched in an idea, it doesn't matter whether you're trying to get them to change a policy or to change, you know, an approach um, is, you know, that, that you have to kind of help them understand their own perspective first, right? Mm -hmm. Because, if you're entrenched in an idea, you assume there are no flaws in it. Um, and so you have to work from, from something within that idea that opens up a path uh, to, to a change that doesn't feel revolutionary. It can feel evolutionary. I find that then when people get entrenched, the route you have to take is evolutionary. You have to figure out how to evolve your way to where you're going rather than saying, and next, you know, next week, we're all going to dress in white instead of black. And, you know, no one's going to want to do that. You know, I, I find that that consensus building sometimes takes time and kind of getting someone out of an entrenched position sometimes takes time, you know, and I mean, that's just the best way that I can describe how I have worked with, with entrenched positions. And, and the other way is, you know, to sort of think about, how to present the same information from a different perspective. You can't always do that. These are really specific things that I'm describing, but sometimes you have an opportunity um, to sort of get through to someone by stating the exact same thing that they said from a different perspective. Sometimes that can help as well. 
That's a great point. Um, another question, a similar in vain. So someone in our audience says that they come from a similar background uh, and they're wondering, how would you advise trying to go against people's implicit bias when you're starting out in your career? So oftentimes um, uh, there may be one or two people from an underrepresented group on a team and it almost feels as if you are under a microscope, they say. What would be, what would be your advice to them? Well, you know, that is a challenge that I think I certainly felt that at times in my life uh, and at moments in my career where I sort of felt like I didn't have the opportunity. Like if I failed, it would have been seen as worse than if my colleague failed. <laughs> and, and, you know, you, you definitely um, it, it is it is not pleasant, um, but the there are a few ways you can take that and it sort of depends on where you are in, in, in the relationship, right? So, you know, if this is something that's being exacted by, let's say your manager, right? Your manager is effectively doing this to you in an unknowing way. Um, you know, one of the things that I've always um, ascribed to and uh, very much believe in is um, this concept of crucial conversations. I don't know if you've ever had, Laurie, crucial conversations training, um, but I have had crucial conversations training. And one of, the, one of the most important elements of it, and I would highly advise everybody go read this book because it's probably one of the best ways to deal with people where you don't see eye to eye and you need to have a very hard conversation with them. And one of the things that assumes that it, it, it helps you, it helps you not make assumptions about why they're doing it. Right. Because more often than not, I think we tend to take offense because we think there's some motivation behind it that is in some ways like motivated by some kind of bad place when sometimes it has nothing to do with you. So you need to figure out how to have a conversation in a way that helps that allows that person to save face. Um, uh, but kind of gets you to where you need to go. Like, I feel like I'm under more scrutiny than someone else in the team. And I'm sure that's not what you're meaning to do. Um, but, you know, just be aware that this is my experience. And I just, just want you to know that. And I want this to be productive for both of us. But I don't want an innocent mess up by myself to be taken more negatively than it would otherwise be taken. I want to be a successful person and I want to be successful so that you look good too. You know, you can have those conversations in lots of ways that are disarming. Um, and, and, and more often than not, usually that's the power relationship that's happening when you feel that way. Um, when it's with this, with a colleague of your same level, um, it can be equally dicey, but going to your manager doesn't have to be sort of this super disarming relationship, but you still have to have the conversation with someone. And um, I, I, I would say that, that you know, the, the, there is a book, Crucial Conversations, and there are trainings, and they're probably one of the greatest things I've ever done in my life when I became a manager. And I think it's something that everyone should learn uh, in their career, which is how to have those conversations in a way that does not assume anything about what, why something is happening, but simply helps you get past that and get to a better outcome. There we go, I'm mute again. That's a great recommendation. Um, and so another question uh, asking for your recommendation, um, what are some best practices uh, for ways to stay connected and build relationships with uh, PE anchor investors or really sort of anyone that you're trying to build a relationship with in the virtual environment? It's so much, you know, building relationships is harder than maintaining relationships in a virtual environment because it's hard to meet someone virtually and then kind of grow that relationship because so much of it comes from, you know, the way that I've grown relationships historically is that we see each other at similar conferences, right? So they'll become, there's this circuit that you had to have to commit to and you do it every year and you see the same people every year and you grow and you learn, each, you, you become friends over the years or there's places where you know people will be. That has tended to be how I've maintained my industry relationships over the years. Um, when we went into the virtual environment, uh, you know, maintaining those relationships wasn't that hard. But to be fair, I probably didn't try as hard as I should have. But I had those opportunities to meet new people. But it was very challenging, you know, to 
networking in a virtual environment where everybody has to take turns talking, I mean, it's the worst, you know? So <laughs> I've just, I've not found it particularly helpful. Um, you know, it's not to say that you can't develop a relationship and inevitably you have to figure out how to find a, a coffee place to meet somewhere eventually. And I find that that, that is usually the pinnacle that takes you to the, yeah. to the next level in the relationship. It's true. There's no substitute for in-person interaction when you're building relationships. There's just, there's no substitute for eye contact. That's been the yeah. thing that nobody has ever been able to, to, to mimic, uh, in, in, you know, this kind of, uh, digital experience. Uh, so, you know, if somebody wants a great idea, figure out how to make eye contact and suddenly <laughs> we've got something. <laughs> so, um, there's another question we have. Uh, you, so, so you mentioned sort of trying to always help people both ahead of you and behind you, right? So how can you how can you do that well while also balancing the the work that you, that you need to do to to deliver without burning out? You know, time management is a challenge no matter how you do it. You just have to be committed to doing it. Um, I find that. Whatever we want to do, whatever we want to do, we will find time to do and it will rarely burn us out. Mm -hmm. We tend to be burned out by things we resent doing, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I think about, you know, in 2001, uh, I made portfolio manager. I worked hard to become a 28 year old portfolio manager. That same year, I was going to Stanford full time. I finished, that was my second year uh, of a two year master's program that I've been doing full time while working. Um, and I graduated that year um, with a, a solid A average. Um, mm -hmm. And that same year I made my first world team for, for Sprint Kayak. All of those things I very much wanted to do and I achieved them all. And I found time for them all. <laughs> but the point that I'm making is that we don't, that. We, <laughs> yeah, we, we, we always underestimate our capacity of what we can do because we fill our lives with things that we resent doing, right? Or we don't want to do, but we commit to doing them. And the, the, the best advice I can give you is figure out quickly when you are resenting what you are doing and try to figure out how to change that because that is a cancer and it will lead to burnout no matter how many hours you have in the day free. So last question um, from me. Uh, so in our audience, we have current students, we have prospective students and they are looking ahead to bright careers. Uh, so if you were in their seat, right? At, at this time, how would you advise them? How should they spend their time? Oh, so you just gave one really great piece of advice, which is to figure out what, what burns you, what you resent and sort of what energizes you and what burns you out. Um, but as they're, as they're identifying interests, um, building careers, taking those steps, how should they be spending their time? What, what experiences matter? What should be their, their targets sort of, how should they be looking at this right now? It's like, you know, Youth is a wonderful thing that we all tend to take for granted. Um, but I would say that more often than not, there, there are two things that I have observed that are qualities in people that tend to be successful over time. Um, the first is that they are very persistent. Mm -hmm. They don't, they're not easily kind of, you know, taken off their task by feeling dejected or, you know, you know, feeling like they're not getting anywhere. They're very persistent. But the second thing, and this is the thing that I would say, if you have time in your life right now to practice a skill, it's the skill of observation. They pay attention in their lives. They notice things. They notice people. They notice when people are having hard days. They notice when there's an opportunity for something to be done. Um, observation is something that we don't practice enough of, and it's never too early to start becoming a skillful observer of the world because skillful observers become change makers over time. Mm -hmm. Well, Gina, thank you. Thank you for, for all of this. I know we want to be respectful of your time and, and we're nearing the end here. So 
I want to say thank you to you. Uh, thank you to our audience. This was really just a delightful conversation. Um, and I especially want to thank you because you've you've accomplished two very important things for our, our community today. First, you are just a really engaging example of what is possible. There's just so, I think, so much power in, in seeing that because sometimes um, we have to see it to believe that we can actually become it. And I know that many, many of our audience members will leave this conversation feeling more empowered to, to proceed with whatever ambitions that they have imagined for themselves. And, and second, you've given us a lot of these concrete nuggets um, to help operationalize that path as, as we move forward. So thank you very, very much. Um, feel free to unmute everybody so that we could give Gina a, a, a nice, loud round of applause from, from all of us as though we were in the same room. Thank you. <laughs>
at the same time, I don't, I, I, I can honestly say I didn't fully understand the true need and power of inclusion and diversity until I got to college. Uh, so I'm from Southgate, probably Latino neighborhood in, in LA. And then I went to Yale for college. So when I talk about what that transition is like, often I'll use a movie analogy and say it was similar to going from the movie Born in East LA to Hogwarts for all of you Harry Potter fans out there. Literally show up and I felt like I was in Hogwarts. The welcoming session was in Latin. I had no idea what was going on. And I sat there and realized, okay, this is a little different from what I'm used to. And with that, I started to meet more and more people in just my freshman room alone. You had me from LA, one of my best friends to this day from France, right out, just right outside of Paris. Another one of my, cl my classmates, roommates was from uh, New York City, another one from Montana. So all over the place, right? Now, I'm sure for many of you had these similar moments of, oh, wow, this is how big the world is? Or, oh, wow, this is where different perspectives start coming together. And then you start to really feel what that difference is. And it wasn't just about being around other people from diverse backgrounds, uh, but one of the, the stories that will always stick out in my head from college of me sitting there and realizing, okay, even as a consumer, how we consume things is drastically different and diverse. Uh, one of my uh, uh, classmates decided that, hey, you know what, let's do a little potluck and we'll make a fruit salad. And we decided we wanted to have coconut in the fruit salad. And mind you, this is winter in New Haven, Connecticut. So I sat there and as we're kind of going through our menu, my first thought was, and a legit question to them was like, coconut, where are we gonna buy coconut? It's winter in New Haven. And they all looked at me, again, very serious conversation here as we're planning everything out. And they looked at me and they're like, well, where else would you buy it? The supermarket. I don't know if anyone knows where I'm going with this here. But for me, growing up where I grew up, I've never bought a coconut in the supermarket before. So they asked me, well, where do you buy coconuts? I'm like, buy the freeway. Where else do you buy them? Come off the freeway in LA and usually you have fruit stands. And this is something that, as I said this, they thought I was joking. Fast forward, I eventually came home, took a picture, sent it to them, and they finally understood what I was talking about. Now, why do I share my coconut story? In that moment, I looked at them with legit confusion. What do you mean? Where do you buy coconuts? And they looked at me like I was absolutely crazy. You mean by the freeway? Who buys fruit by the freeway? These were our differing experiences, but it's still one product, a coconut. So as we dive into this session, uh, uh, I want you to think about a couple different things. So number one, this is a safe space for us to all bring our own perspectives to the table. But at the same time, I want you to think about, wow, what other perspective might someone else have who wasn't born where I was born, raised where I was raised, buys coconut by the freeway or in the supermarket, all right? I can see a few people, can I get a thumbs up? Just to make sure we're all on the same page here. Great, awesome, see tons of thumbs up. Let's dive into it. So I'm gonna share my screen here and uh, let's see here, one second. Screen two. All right, there we go. Uh, so as we as we dive into you know how best to integrate DEI, we have a couple of, of goals I want you to think of right for today. So first of all, I'm going to dive into what is the current state of diversity, equity, and inclusion today. Uh, we're going to go into some examples, some real world examples, stuff that you can turn on the TV today and see. Uh, and then kind of the I, what I, I hope we take away from it all is well, what can we all do to be better about how we're integrating EDI into our day-to-day -day jobs, no matter what your function is? Okay, so let's start off. Don't worry, I'm not gonna throw tons and tons of stats at you, uh, but I do wanna point out that as I'm sure you've seen time and time again today, interest in diversity, equity, inclusion is at an all-time high. And when I say this, 
and I'm, and as I've said this over the last year and a half to people I've spoken with, they're, you know, they're like, oh yeah, of course, you know, diversity inclusion is super hot right now. Oh, it's, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a super huge trend. Oh yeah. The diversity inclusion fad is taking off. Well, first and foremost, this isn't a fad and Great news is this isn't just about what has occurred over the last, call it, year and some change in the world. Let's go back to August 2018. So in August 2018, we first saw inclusion and diversity. When you go into Google searches, the number of people searching for Google searches for inclusion and diversity surpass the number of people searching for airplane tickets. Now, if I told you that last year, people were like, well, yeah, no, duh, we're not even leaving our houses. We're not buying tickets for, you know, to travel on an airplane anywhere. No, no, no. This wasn't 2020. This wasn't COVID. This is 2018. Let that sink in. Okay. So even by 2018, more and more people have been searching for inclusion and diversity, and that gap continues to grow. All right. Now I have a question for all of you as you think about interest in diversity and inclusion. In order for you to answer this question, I'd like everyone to go to a web browser. It could be on your computer. It could be on your phone. I think I, maybe Apple phones have web browsers. I'm not even sure. Or Apple watches. I don't have one of those cool things. But anywhere you can get a web browser, go to this, and you're going to type in this code. All right. I'll give you a second. Give you a second. All right. I'll keep the code up. So the question, um, I'll open it up here for you for a second. The question is, you know, if I gave you these three items, Kim Kardashian, Hulu, and inclusion and diversity, okay? And say if we Google search Kim Kardashian, at the very bottom, it would say, oh, there are, you know, X million or bajillion number of, of search results for Kim Kardashian. Same thing for Hulu, there are X number of bajillion searches, inclusion, diversity, et cetera. Okay, so looking at these three, I want you to think about, you know, from order of highest to lowest, you know, which one of these items do you think has the highest number of Google search results? Okay, all right. So I'm going to switch us over here so you can see where we're going. So, okay, looks like Kim's coming in hot here in, in, in the lead. Inclusion and diversity, second, Hulu. Wow, yeah, I'm surprised. I'm like on Hulu like almost every day. Uh, but yes, and so in terms of the highest number of Google search results, so we got Kim, inclusion and diversity, Hulu. All right, let's head us back over to our slides. Well, here's the answer. For the number of search results, when you Type in inclusion and diversity. There are 924 million search results as of uh, this was a week ago. Might have changed since then. So when you look at Kim Kardashian, Kim has 197 million, Hulu, 113 million. Look at those numbers. Inclusion and diversity has four times the number of search results than even Kim Kardashian. When we start to really think about the interests in DEI, this isn't just something we're having a conversation about in DEI business conversations. These are topics that are on everyone's mind, no matter who you are, where you're from, even more so than Kim Kardashian. Okay, well, why? So if we start looking at there's tons of research out there. There are many different things that go into why interest in DEI is at an all-time high at this point. But uh, a couple of things I do want to point out are, first of all, the world is changing. The demographics across the world are changing. If we look at just the United States alone, and this might be a fact that you've heard, and in fact, as of the 2020, uh, the results we're getting from the 2020 census, this number is going to change. Um, but by at least 2044, if not sooner than that, there will be no one race or ethnicity that makes up more than 50% of the U.S. population. There are, to this day, when you think about majority, minority, or a majority, minority, whatever words you want to use, most of us tend to have an idea, split-second idea of what that looks like in the United States. 
when you look at us right here, right now, the U.S. Is not, has never been more racially and ethnically diverse than it has ever been today. Okay, so demographics are shifting. Now, why else is there is interest at an all-time high? Well, it's not all rainbows and unicorns and happiness and roses. We do live in a divided world. And when you look at the research and you, uh, of asking not just people in the United States, but even around the world, you know, is your country divided? So 74%-ish, 75, which say, because I'm forgetting my numbers in the top of my head, 75% of people around the United States and 27 other countries answered this question in the last, in the last year. And they all said, yes, my country is divided. That's three quarters of people across 28 countries. Ask those same people, okay, your countries are divided, but do you believe people can unite across racial and ethnic divides to solve problems? 75% the the, said that their uh, countries are divided. Well, two thirds, 67% said, but we still can unite. So even though we do see division, and this is something that, again, isn't just US specific, people still strongly believe we can unite. Okay, well, what about from a business perspective? Well, there's tons of information, tons of research out there, but you know, one key point that is really driving a lot of the interest is that we as consumers, when we look at consumer power, we as consumers have more choice. Before, if I wanted to buy this mug, I probably would go to Bed Bath & Beyond or somewhere. Now I could just like hop on Amazon and who knows where it's coming from. In some cases, I don't even check where it's being delivered from. So when we think about consumer choice, not only do we have choice of product, but we have choice of where our dollar goes. And we look at the research, more and more people, especially of younger and younger generations are starting to put their dollars where their values go. So they're aligning their dollar purchasing power with their value power. Okay. Enough of the stats. Let's dive into some examples. So let's take a look at, so, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion in marketing and product development. And I'm going to give you some examples, some stories, and I'll have a couple of you guys will be able to answer a few more uh, interactive questions along the way. Uh, we're going to keep this pretty high level. Okay. So what doesn't work? So here are a few examples. Uh, it is, you know, in the afternoon here in LA, it's wherever you are, it could be later in the evening. So we're gonna talk a little bit about, I don't know, maybe a little happy hour conversation. And even if you don't drink alcohol, no big deal. We're not actually going to you know, have a happy hour here. We're just gonna look at a specific industry. And in this case, beer. So this here is a Budweiser for anyone who has not seen one of these before. And when I was growing up, and again, Grammy Latino area in, in Los Angeles, Pretty much all of my aunts and uncles, all of the adults, if they were people who drank beer, they drank Budweiser. And it wasn't just my family, but it was our community. Our community drank Budweiser. And I never thought twice about it until earlier this year when I was sitting with my, my family members, my older family members now, and you know, my godfather, my, um, I call him my Nino, it's short for padrino in Spanish, but my godfather was like, oh, did you know your grandma used to drink Coors? And I was like, first of all, we don't even have a Coors anywhere around here. Where's this coming from? And you know, I was like, well, what do you mean? We all, we're a Budweiser family. Nobody drinks Coors. You know, what are you talking about? And he's like, yeah, Coors used to be the beer of choice, not just for our family, but for a lot of the Latino, uh, or especially Mexican American community in Los Angeles. And I never heard this before. I mean, I think they have really cool cans, but I myself have not really had them uh, or seen them around, especially within our community. And, you know, I asked him more about it. He's like, yeah, my, our family used to drink Coors, your grandma used to drink Coors until the boycotts. I never heard that word before boycott when it came to Coors. Looked into it. In 1966, there was a boycott started against Coors Brewing Company. And it wasn't just started within the Latino community, but it was with many different groups, diverse groups that were boycotting Coors for internal 
uh, company policies and practices, as well as representation and or lack thereof within, say, the marketing, the marketing space, for example. Uh, you can Google it. You can check it out on Wikipedia. There's a lot more to it. Uh, but what I really want to focus on here is look at those years there. When you look at how long did this boycott go on? So it officially started in 1966. It's the beginning of the boycott. It lasted to 1985, officially. There wasn't an agreement reached until 1985. Now, what does this, did this do for Coors? It wasn't just that boycott during that time. The impact, the actual impact on the brand remains even to this day. It has lasted generations. Not just because of you know, one thing they did or did not do, but when you look at the, the actual research behind it, Coors itself had such wonderful opportunity to really sort of focus on that power of diverse representation, and they chose not to. Okay, that's just one example. Let's give you another example. It's keeping with the happy hour theme, don't worry, this will be the last alcohol themed example, I promise. Uh, let's talk whiskey. So, you know, I would do a, you know, show of hands or if we were in person, I'd be like, give me a clap for it if you drink whiskey. Yay. I do. Uh, so I'll clap for myself. Um, but that said, you know, when you, when you, when you think whiskey, there's tons and tons and tons of brands out there. So Johnny Walker is a Scotch, you know, whiskey, a uh, very popular brand and is one of the oldest brands out there. Right now, in uh, you know, the early 2000s, Johnny Walker started to realize, hey, you know what, it, this you know, scotch conversation used to be a predominantly uh, uh, male-oriented conversation, or at least for those who identify as male. And then they started to realize that more and more women or non-male-identifying customers were starting to drink Johnny Walker or, or whiskey in general. So they decided, you know what, Let's get on this. And they started a brand called Jane Walker. Jane Walker is literally the exact same product. Nothing was different. They changed the colors. They changed the, the branding a little bit. Exact same product, yet it was more expensive. Now, at the top here, you see limited release because now anytime they do a Jane Walker, it's a limited release. Before, when they actually launched it, no, it wasn't a limited release. It was an entire brand launch focusing on female consumers. So here, March 2018, I think, yeah. Uh, this is just one of many headlines from, in this case, Entrepreneur Magazine. You know, they dive into, well, what went wrong here? And, you know, the problem with Jane Walker or with, uh, you know, Johnny Walker's Jane Walker was its perception. When you dive into it more though, it was Johnny Walker's perception of, an entire consumer group. When you think about your consumers, yay, Johnny Walker was trying to do something when it came to understanding why more and more, uh, why they're starting to see a, a greater representation of, of gender representation and those who drank their, their, in this case, whiskey, wonderful. But it's not just about let's change the color, let's slap, in this case, a, a female, uh, you know, appearing icon on the cut on the on the front of the bottle, but let's actually focus instead on what are the needs of a consumer. In many cases, the women necessarily or you know uh, uh, female identifying consumers, they want their entirely different whiskey that's more expensive. No, they just wanted to learn more about well, how can I drink Johnny Walker? Is it just on the rocks? That was the actual takeaway. That's really what they wanted to see. Okay. So what else doesn't work? So again, leaving the alcohol scene for a little bit, let's talk allergies. Uh, and there's tons of allergy medications out there. So this is actually a brand that just recently launched. It's called Genexa. And the company is, their, their positioning is that they are the first clean medicine company. They go into a lot of what clean medicine means, but it's really focusing on only the ingredients you need. And none, the, and, all, and none of the artificial ones that you, you don't need. Uh, so the, the positioning for the brand is wonderful and you know, was hitting all the marks when you check out everything they have, they have on their sites. 
in October, so just last month, uh, their sort of nationally televised commercials didn't necessarily hit all the points. Well, they thought they did because they kind of checked the boxes and they had a bunch of different representation. So this is, these are actual screenshots from Genexa's Is Genexa Right For Me uh, um, commercial. So again, launched just this past, this past year. So, uh, you know, and also, by the way, if you, if you can't see this slide, you can also, uh, I believe, just double click it. It's a little Zoom, Zoom reminder and should hopefully make it a little larger for you. But uh, so if you're looking at this, in the commercial, the question is, is Genexa right for me? And their takeaway is, yes, it's right for everyone. In their representation, this, this is their actual copy. And the way that they describe each of these, these you know, uh, uh, characters within their commercials, unfortunately, what they've mostly done is perpetuate stereotypes. Everything from, okay, if I had, to, if, if we kind of asked the majority of America to think about what a vegan gardener might look like, or a truck driver, or literally their words, hipsters against the suits, or a professor who believes in science. I mean, I wear bow ties, why couldn't they have me on there? Or my favorite, lesbians with gluten intolerances. And I saw this one and I literally, like I own an RV and I was chilling in my RV and I was sitting there, I was like, man, all they needed was like the flannel, to use their flannel and the Jeep that I also own and they would just like check almost every lesbian stereotype there was. So, you know, as you look at these, at these examples, is there representation? Yes. Is it authentic representation? No. And in fact, unfortunately, this commercial continued to perpetuate stereotypes. Now, at the very end of it, it kind of seemed like they knew what they were doing and they were just kind of like using this as a little bit of slapstick, but it wasn't very clear. And I was trying to give them the benefit of the doubt. Like, oh, maybe they're just using this for the, no. Mm -mm. When we think about stereotypes, one of the most important things to ask yourself is, well, can I, sh can I actually get this message across without using a stereotype? And guess what? The answer is always yes. All right, I guess, usually. So what doesn't work? Now, this is just, again, a couple of, of high level points here, but what doesn't work? Not walking the walk within your company, right? People are using their dollars to make sure that they're, they're, you're purchasing items that really align with their own values. So not walking the walk within your company means exactly that really, right? With Coors, they weren't walking the walk that actually impacted their top line growth, in this case for generations. All right, what about copy paste with the exact same product features, but different branding? Well, ultimately focus on your product and consumer needs. Copy pasting from Johnny Walker to Jane Walker, that wasn't the consumer need. Better understanding of how to, in this case, use the product, that's what female identifying consumers really wanted. Stereotypes, never. Always do a double check at the very end, like, huh, are there any stereotypes here? And if so, you know, can I show this same message without a stereotype? Literally, if they had just taken all of those for Genexa, all of those representation and just like flop them around, guess what? It's still the exact same, exact same message without having to perpetuate a stereotype. Okay, I've been talking to you guys a lot. So let's get to some more questions for you. Uh, so everyone kind of, it's gonna be on the exact same website as we were on before. I'm gonna switch it over to the next, the next question, but let's talk a little bit about what does work, okay? So everyone can go back to, it's the same thing, menti.com, the same code. So if you're already on it, you could just stay there. And the question you're gonna answer is, I want you guys to think about McDonald's here. So let's talk nuggets and fries because I'm hungry and I'm sure many of you also are because it's almost dinner time. Uh, so nuggets and fries, McDonald's, whatever you eat at McDonald's, if you eat at McDonald's, but I want you to type in the very first thing you think of when you hear McDonald's, okay? So let me switch us to our next slide here. Type away. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are people entering? Is there issues with it? Oh, burger, okay. Whew, for a second there, I was like, maybe the question was too hard. <laughs> uh, right, okay. 
yellow fries, fast, unhealthy, not real meat. Ooh, happy meal, McFlurry. Okay. Nice. McRib is back. Yeah. Okay. Tons and tons and tons and tons of stuff here, right? <laughs> I have stomach ache. I'll have a with that one. Now, when you, when you think about McDonald's or sort of any of, you know, these, you know, very well-known brands, the most important part here wasn't necessarily what words were written. It's how quickly the association came to mind. McDonald's is a stellar global brand when it comes to brand recognition. Again, whatever the recognition is, most of us, when we hear McDonald's, we have an immediate response. Now, with that, does McDonald's necessarily need to focus on driving brand recognition? Not necessarily, but does McDonald's still need to focus on telling their story? Absolutely. There, you've seen many McDonald's commercials over, your, over the years, I'm sure, but let's look at what's working and what McDonald's is currently doing to make sure that it's working when it comes to integrating EDI into, into what they're doing. So McDonald's, especially over the last year and some change, has really been trying to focus on authentic storytelling. This is a phrase you'll hear often in business, authentic storytelling. What have they done for, for McDonald's? Instead of only focusing on, ooh, here's a juicy burger or you know, with, with that might, may or may not be real meat, or here's juicy fries, or here's just the focus on like our brand recognition. Instead, they've been telling stories of their own consumers and how their own consumers are experiencing McDonald's. So this is just one snippet from um, a commercial. Uh, and in this snippet, these two women are actually speaking in American Sign Language, in ASL. And they're just one of many stories that uh, um, McDonald's is focused on. And the, the best part about it is they're just eating at McDonald's. It's not about, we see some fries there. You see the cup a little bit, but it's not just juicy burger. It's what is your experience at McDonald's? In this case, they're telling a story and laughing about it. In some cases, it's at the end of a long day, what am I gonna go do? In some cases, people go to McDonald's and grab a burger or they're bringing fries to their grandmother because you know, they haven't seen her in so long and McDonald's fries are the, are the most important thing for her, um, you know, or, her or her favorite. So that idea of authentic storytelling, when you think about representation, sure, do you have uh, two women here of potentially differing uh, 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 demographics maybe, but ultimately what's most important is it's not forced. They're telling, McDonald's is telling their story by showing their consumer stories. Yes, these are most likely actresses, but ultimately the delivery of the story is not about let's check the boxes what we saw with Genexa. Whew, okay, how are we on time here? All right, doing, doing well. So a couple more examples, uh, and then uh, you know I'm gonna sort of take off the slides. So we can have a little bit more of a chat and, and answer some questions, okay? And really talk about how we can make things, uh, how, what we can do on a day-to-day -day basis to really kind of bring this to life. All right, let's talk sunblock. Now, for those of you who use sunblock, this is often kind of a very banana boat is a very popular uh, uh, a brand. But if you notice, I said for those of you who use sunblock. Now, the question, the answer to that should be, we all use sunblock because everyone needs protection from the sun to protect ourselves from, uh, from um, UV rays and protect us from having skin cancer. Uh, that said, if you've ever used Banana Boat and other very similar you know, cream-like uh, sunblocks, they often leave a white sheen. So they're very thick, often leave a white sheen on your skin. Now, Oh, I was gonna bring it in here. But ultimately I use a lot of sunblock because I love to be out, outside and swim. Whenever I use this one, I end up with a very, very, very white sheen that does not actually blend as well into my skin tone. This happens for a lot of people. And as a result of that, brands are now starting to realize, oh, interesting. What can we do to try to make sure people, no matter your skin tone, don't have to really worry about having that white sheen after you use sunblock. So this is an example of a, of a brand that recently launched called Black Girl Sunscreen. Uh, it's exactly that, sunscreen for, in this case, they're, they're really focusing and targeting Black women. 
But their main focus and, and, and purpose really is to think about, well, what can we do to make sure that for people who have darker skin tones, they can use sun sunscreen without having that white sheen that's, that's left over. Now, great, here we have a brand that's trying to solve a problem. I wanna challenge you to think about something a little bit larger. How do you take the two and combine them? Well, more and more, when you think about product development, one of the key questions we always ask ourselves, you know, no matter what your, uh, your background is in product development is, well, what are my customer needs? And in this case, we gotta protect ourselves from the sun. We wanna be able to use it every day. And a customer need, not just for people with darker skin tones, but really for most people, all people, is nobody really wants to have that white sheen after work. You want to put it on, it protects you, great. You can't even tell it's there, no matter what the color of your skin. So yes, we're seeing this, this, this uh, you know, uh, progress when it comes to more and more products that, that really do meet the needs of a much larger, much more diverse population. Taken to the next level though, you can take that step up and say, look, it's not just for black girls, it's for everyone. Neutrogena has spent a lot of time focusing on exactly that point. And most recently they launched Invisible Daily Defense. It's a face mist and it's focused on, and they literally talk about this, it's invisible for all skin tones. That is their positioning. It's not just about, oh, okay, this, there's a problem out there. You know what, 80% of our customers don't have that issue. They're okay with it, leaving a white, a white, you know, sheen. No, all people can benefit, no matter the color of your skin, from a well-working uh, um, sunscreen that's in invisible, no matter your skin tone. Keep that in mind, because here we're talking about sunblock, right? It's not, well, I was gonna say it's not life or death, but in many cases it can be, right? As, as you kind of move forward. But keep that in mind. How do we start thinking about products, not just, okay, this is working for 80% of the people. Now we got to focus on how we can make it work for 20% of people. But how do we kind of take that next level up so that we can think about needs of all of our consumers, anyone who uses our product? Okay. The last example here, promise, getting, getting there. Webcams. Guess what? All of us are on a webcam today. Yay. Or I would assume most of us are on webcams here today. In 2009, so hop, skip, and a jump ago, if I were on my webcam, I might have some issues with it. Here's a headline. There's one of many, and feel free to Google this later. But in 2009, when before webcams were literally absolutely necessary for, for most of the work to be done, uh, HP Hewlett Packard had an issue in which a few consumers realized Hewlett Packard webcams could not see people with darker skin. Couldn't see them. What did that mean? The webcams would actually be able to follow your, 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 your face as you're moving. Problem is, if you put somebody with darker skin next to somebody with lighter skin, they'll see the lighter skin person, but not see the darker skin person. This started a huge conversation around why? How could a company like HP launch a webcam product that was racist. Okay, often it comes down to product testing, right? How many people of a wide range of you know, diverse representation are products being tested on? Okay, that's a webcam. If the webcam doesn't see me here, that's not the end of the world. It's not life or death. But just as we were kind of talking about sunblock, what if it were a matter of life and death? So this is from August, 2021, a couple, couple months ago. You know, we have so many companies now that are really focusing on autom autonomous cars, right? And this conversation started in 2019 where a large study in the UK was done that started to look at, okay, autonomous cars are starting to become all the rage you know, can autonomous cars see people with darker skin tones? In 2019, they realized, no, they can't. So it's now two years later, and now we have autonomous cars that have been tested outside all the time. To this day, there's, you know, a recent study also just showed 
autonomous cars still have problems recognizing pedestrians with darker skin tones. If my webcam can't see me, I'm okay. If I'm walking down the street and a car that's driving itself can't see me, ah, that's not okay. So well, as we're thinking about these, you know, these products and we think about you know, product development and we think about you know, representation within marketing, it's not just, oh, all right, we're gonna check the boxes so we can get more consumers of a diverse background. No, one, how do we do it authentically? And then two, how do we make sure that we're understanding the needs of all of our consumers, especially when it comes to product development? All of your consumers are not the same. I, it's, it's, it's silly because once you've studied product development, you're gonna be like, yeah, yeah, just of course. We learned this like, you know, this is like day one product development conversation here. Uh-huh. Start to integrate this into the, you know, your, your not just the upfront conversations, but as you're going along the product development cycle, constantly asking yourselves, well, does this product really, does this product really work for all of our consumers? Does the sunscreen work for all our consumers? Not necessarily. The, the you know, autonomous, the, the, the HP webcam work for all of our consumers? No. Autonomous cars driving themselves, is everyone safe around it? Mm. And authenticity, last little bit here. So, you know, I, I started this conversation talking about, uh, you know, my experience with coconut and how I was legit serious when I said, that's where I buy my coconut. My roommates were legit serious and they say they buy their coconut in a supermarket. Both experiences are valid. Both are actual consumer, consumer uh, you know, preference conversations and consumer place conversations. When you're telling your story, just like we saw with you know, McDonald's who at this point has such huge global brand recognition, when you're telling your story, authenticity matters. We see right through that if it's not real. When you tell your story, do so by also thinking about the authentic stories of your real customers. Whether we buy your coconut from the side of the freeway or in a supermarket, both stories can and really should be told. Okay, Whew, that was a lot. Threw a lot at you and great. We still have 15 minutes left, perfectly on time. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and we're now gonna go into what I think is the most fun part of this. Question and answer, comments, any and all things that popped up when you're, you know, as I was sharing all this information, this is what really brings it to life. Not just me talking to you, but hearing how all of you as professionals are actually working on these topics on an everyday basis. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. What? And uh, we're going to hop into some Q&A. All right, you guys ready? We have a raised hand, we have a couple raised hands. Are we going to actually, uh, question, Vicky, are we gonna, should I just, uh, are people, can people unmute themselves or we have to go with? Okay, great, you can unmute yourself. So I'm going to call your raised hands and then you can unmute yourself. So uh, Liza K, can you go ahead and unmute yourself and let's go with your questions. Hi Jess. Um, Hi. Um, so you talked a lot about like CPG products and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, my clients are very deeply non C like, mm -hmm. like, so it's like their clients and then their clients and their clients are like, not even necessarily CPG. So, um, sometimes it's harder to have the conversation about how their, you know, customer product, like their customers aren't diverse and their customers, customers aren't necessarily diverse. So mm -hmm. I'm curious how you kind of reconcile and think about that when it's a, when, when there is no like diverse consumer really to think about at least not in any kind of proximate level. Mm -hmm. Okay, Th thanks Liza. We're talking more, you know, business to business, uh, sort of yeah. on the service side. Okay. Business to business to business. To business to business to yeah. business to business, right? Great point. So I guess uh, first things first, for those who don't know the difference between a business to business or a business to consumer, uh, you know, uh, we think business to consumer, it's like, great, I'm selling this and you're going to buy it, right? I'm selling it directly to you. Yeah, there's a lot of steps in between, but there's also behind the, the oops, I should, probably shouldn't should show the brand, but behind the development of this product, there's a company that might be working with another company, working with another company. It's all that stuff, right? If you're, you know, say, for example, you're selling HR software to another company. Well, uh, good point, uh, good question, Eliza. One of the most important things we look at when it comes to business to business inclusion 
is, well, who is the real consumer? In many cases, if you're selling a, a, um, a B2B product to another company, it's not just thinking about their end consumer, it's often also their employees. It's often how they themselves do business and it's how um, you can help them do business in a way that's gonna increase their target market, right? Even if it is just other companies or eventually that end consumer, right? So uh, a, a higher level answer to your question, Liza, is very similar how we were just talking about, you know, sunblock of how do you take it up a notch and say, all right, well, what are their real needs as another business that I'm selling to? So say from selling, I'm gonna say HR software to a company, exciting, right? Well, they need not just to have this thing work super well, they wanna save money, they wanna be able to make sure that the people can use it well. And at the same time, they wanna make sure that they're, uh, you know, they're really thinking about, are there any issues with the product itself that's gonna keep someone from being able to use it? Um, I say that because uh, I have an HR background and we've actually had issues uh, where with certain, you know, business to business products where like, oh yeah, this is super easy for somebody to understand but they might not realize if somebody's coming from a, if you're in a global corporation, it's so US centric, for example, that, you know, 40% of your team, if they're off, if they're off, off site or you know, not in the US, they actually couldn't use the product. So there's a lot more to it. I know it's a very high level question, but taking that step up, looking at, well, what are all my consumer needs? And usually there's, there's some good nugget nuggets there to help you show your next step and your next step, your next step, your, uh, you know, your B2B chain there, why you actually need to focus on this more. But yeah, that's a good question. All right, so hope that answered the question there. Good, awesome. Uh, next person, next hand up, uh, let's see, uh, Arun M or Arun M. Sorry if I mispronounced your name. Uh, hi, Jessica, yes. Uh, can you hear me? I can, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you for this session. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm looking a little dull. It's, it's pretty early in India, so. Well, thanks for joining, uh, thanks for joining. <laughs> Yeah, now I work in the automotive industry. I can totally relate to the example of autonomous vehicles that uh, that you just quoted. Uh, there's so much discussion happening around the company. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, mm -hmm. uh, when you say integrating DEI into different mm -hmm. functions, uh, often the change in the leadership uh, really gives a different tone uh, to the people working downstreams. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to know, uh, in your experience, how did you... Uh, uh, make that constant voice of DEI progress despite the change in the leadership having a difference in opinions. And, and the second broader question is how do how can the companies uh, can make that positive DEI progress uh, mm -hmm. uh, despite the change in the CEO level mm -hmm. of uh, leadership? If you can touch upon that, that would be really great. Ooh, I'm so glad you asked that question. Uh, because for those of us who um, do work in the, you know, the inclusion diversity space, as our primary jobs, we have to focus on this every single day. But what if you're, especially if you're not in that space, what if this is something that you're trying to do as, you know, somebody that's working on, you know, B2B sales or product development or whatever it might be, how can you make sure that this is sustainable and longstanding, right? Now, one thing I didn't really get into here because we could do this on a whole nother session on this is how do we really integrate into the way we develop products into the way we develop marketing campaigns, marketing assets, et cetera. So me, along with many other you know, diversity inclusion heads or chief diversity officers around the world, we work with the C-suite usually, right? Um, and what's most important, uh, and I'd love to, I wish Devin and then the rest who were speaking earlier this morning could hear this, but I'd love to get their thoughts on that. But what I find often is most important, it's not just the C-suite conversation, it's that next level of your vice presidents, your directors, your senior managers, the ones who are really in the thick of it, you know, leading the teams that are making the actual, you know, developing the strategies, you know, driving the, or you know, driving the marketing campaigns, the product development, et cetera. Uh, because often they're the ones who own your SOPs, your standard operating procedures, right? So if we're going to make this item, there's usually a standard operating procedure that we follow this is how we develop it, right? Or here's our product develop, development strategy. We use it over and over again, a template, whatever it might be. Real systemic, systemic change within an organization comes in. Let's work with the leaders who handle that SOP, those standard operating procedures, 
and let's integrate it into that. So for example, at Ancestry, so Ancestry.com, for those of you who don't know, is, uh, you know, a launches that the firm was doing on a day-to-day -day basis. It wasn't just about how do we do this every single time, every single day. It was, okay, let me work with the head of product development. Let's look at what is the actual process the organization uses. And hey, where are those quick levers we can integrate this into? What ended up happening was we realized, geez, there are just a couple of touch points. All we had to do was integrate a 20 minute conversation here and there, or a couple of, you know, did you, did you actually look into this? Did you talk to these people? Did you do this? Just having that in the, the way you make a product and now scales across the entire organization. And it's not just leader dependent. It doesn't, if there is a, a change, if the CEO leaves the company, which has happened multiple times at companies I've led DEI at, uh, you're actually, that's going to sustain. And guess what? It's going to get tweaked over time, especially as you know, uh, you make more and more products using that process. And so that, is that a good answer to the question? Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, and if anyone is, wants to learn more about that, feel free to reach out to me directly on it because uh, when, you, when you look at not just the product development process or, you know, your marketing campaigns, developing marketing assets, not just that side of the house, but even as you're looking at Okay, if I'm the supply chain side and we're looking at the you know diverse supply chain, or as I'm thinking about you know uh, who I'm reaching out to internally, you know there there are lots of things you can do in your own internal group, um, you know sort of department uh, processes that can help integrate those inclusion levers across the way. Okay, uh, let's see. Are there other uh, hands up or questions? Let's see, Vicky, can you help me out here? Yeah, I don't see any hands up at the moment, but okay. this is uh, for all of you participants. This is the, the just the perfect time for you to, you know, take advantage of the wealth of experience that Jessica has in the space. Um, so while we do have a couple of minutes left, if anyone does have any questions, feel free to go ahead and raise your hand or type it into the chat box, and we'll go ahead and have Jess respond. Let's see. Doesn't look. I don't see any other hands popping up. Um, uh, I guess just, you know, last thing as you're, as we sort of wrap up here, uh, this is a very high level conversation, right? About how we can integrate in inclusion, diversity, and equity, equity, diversity, inclusion, however you say it, you know, into what we do from a business perspective. Uh, I challenge everyone on the call to not just think about this from, well, an HR perspective or a product development perspective, right? Of like how our businesses are thinking about inclusion. What does that really mean in the world we live in? When we leave work, when we step outside of that building, does inclusion end there? Or, you know, what, now that we've been, especially this past year as we've had, or year and some change as we've been working in, in a very different environment, you know, does inclusion end when we shut off our Zoom call? No, as we think about the larger, true, more authentic implications of diversity, equity, and inclusion, it's part of our everyday lives, no matter the color of your skin, no matter your gender identification, no matter where you grew up, this is something that impacts everyone. Obviously I'm speaking to the, the choir here, but the more we can do within our roles, the more people can see that, not just within the four walls of our company, not just in the marketing messages we're putting out there, but really in the impact that our products and you know, our companies have to really change the way that the world and society is, is, is thinking about inclusion. But that's my last little like, I love this stuff, comment. Um, okay, I think we're pretty much, uh, you know, at, at time here. Uh, so I will hand it over to Jesse. I just want to thank everyone for, for, for joining us. I know it's been a long, long day. Uh, I, I hope we've had a great time so far at Embracing Diversity Week and, you know, look forward to seeing you in the future. Thanks, Jessica. Case studies are fun. Appreciate it. <laughs>
Thanks. Oh, I love it. Thank you, Jessica. I just have a few words before everybody decides to jump off and go have fun with their Friday. Um, just a few minutes. I promise I'll be done soon. Uh, to start off with, uh, thank you so much, Jessica. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Thank you for coming back. And honestly, thank you for creating the legacy of EDI at Anderson. Every ASA, every ASA VP of EDI who's come after you, including myself, stands on your shoulders as you've opened the door for us to support our classmates through EDI. Thank you. So over the last year, I've met most of the individuals who served as VPs of EDI, and each one of them had their own flavor and flair. I learned from them, and I also approached this role in my own unique way at this unique point in time. As the VP of, as the VP of EDI for Anderson's class of 2022, I stepped into this role in the shadow of George Floyd over a year of COVID, a year of class outside the classroom, and I still didn't know how much this role would fully need for me. I did know I wouldn't be able to carry the weight of it alone. My EDI committee is just as responsible as I am for executing this EDI vision. Well, the legacy I'll be leaving behind when I step away from this role is one of clarity, creation, and collaboration. By clarifying my goals and those of our EDI committee, we're able to start creating the processes that would enable collaboration to ensure we're effectively moving forward together. For example, our team worked with the Anderson administration to build out an EDW application process. We also added a FEMBA classmate as a consultant to our Embracing Diversity Week planning committee. And we're now looking to create a mentorship program between full-time MBAs and executive MBAs. We know the future is not only full-time MBA, not just second years, but cross-program and cross-class collaboration to ensure we're all striving towards creating the most inclusive MBA at UCLA Anderson School of Management. Yes, I'm the VP of EDI for the class of 2022, but my greatest pride is to see our first-year students grow into their own EDI roles, including my own. Our first-year students and our prospective students are the future of our community, our community shares success, leads across difference, and embraces, diverse, embraces diversity as we uplift one another. So it may have started with you, Jessica, but the impact of this role will far outlast the both of us. Thank you all for joining us on the first day of Embracing Diversity Conference, and we look forward to having you join us tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>